Welcome um, to the Douglas County Constitutional Officers and Elected Officials Retreat this morning. Wow, how time flies. Seems like we were just here a week ago, but it was a year ago. So uh, certainly I would like to um, start off by saying uh, thank you for being here this morning. Board of Commissioners, I see Commissioner Carthen just walked in. And certainly I will recognize and acknowledge all of our Board of Commissioners. Uh, we have um, with us and I certainly uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, Kelly Robinson of District 2 is here. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner uh, Jeremy Carthen of District 3 here. You just wave a hand. Uh, District uh, 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III is here. District 4, Commissioner Ann jones Guider is here. And then myself, Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones. We're delighted that you all are here to join us. Certainly want to um, acknowledge our executive cabinet this morning and, and we certainly commend them for the body of work they've done to get us here thus far. I'll start with our Deputy County Administrator, Fred Perry, our uh, Deputy Assistant County Administrator, Tiffany Stewart Stanley. We have our CFO, our Chief Financial Officer, Ramona Bivens. We have uh, Rosalind Miller, who's our Acting Interim uh, Finance Director. And I see our Attorney Coleman in the corner of his mask. Certainly, I wanted to be respectful and, and make sure that I introduce all of our members that are sitting at the table. They are elected officials and constitutional officers. I see we do have um, Chief Deputy Chief, our Chief Deputy Connor here this morning, representing Sheriff Pounds. We have Judge um, McLean, O. McLean here this morning. Thank you for being here. Judge Barker, Eddie Barker, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Dr. Judge Harrison, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miles, our um, Chief Public Defend uh, Defendant, uh, our Magistrate Court, uh, Susan, uh, Camp. Thank you this morning for being here, Judge. And I believe I, I want to make sure I've acknowledged all our members. Oh, our Solicitor General, some of the company. So you get your breakfast. Thank you. And want to acknowledge our administrative team as well. Thank you so much, Lisa Chair, uh, for being here this morning. And all our um, legislative aides, our legislative aides, and everyone is here. I don't want to start calling names because I. Judge, I didn't see you in the corner. Judge Warren, Be Warren. thank you for being here as well. All right, well, we will get started. Certainly, I don't want to just go on and on. It is now 9.04, and would like to start our presentations. And we're starting a little early because we have Judge Bo McLean, our Superior Court uh, Judge, who is our Chief Judge. He's scheduled from uh, 9.10 to 9.30. So you have 20 minutes, Judge. If you want to get started, I can give you that. That gives you about two more additional minutes in case you want to go on and on. I don't want to know what to do with two more minutes. <laughs> but, but before I bring you up, I wanted to certainly allow our, our um, Deputy County Administrator just to provide a, a few remarks and just some housekeeping rules this morning. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you all. Uh, I just wanted to give some housekeeping items. Uh, our uh, Justine Hayward in the back, our uh, Wait your hand there, just you should be holding up time cards for everybody. We want to try to stay on schedule. Everybody is pretty much scheduled for a 20 minute presentation. She'll be uh, showing a, a flash card at 10, and then another at 5, and then another at 1, and then another at stop. And we want to just have a few minutes uh, at the end of each presentation for some question and answer. And uh, I'm not sure if everybody has, uh, has speed, seen the schedule for today. We are going to try to stick to the schedule. So I see some faces in here that uh, are not uh, scheduled to present till two. So uh, if you want to stay, you are very welcome to stay. Uh, but if there are some other items you want to take care of that come back maybe 10 or 15 minutes prior to uh, your scheduled time, that would be great. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy County Administrator. And also I wanted to acknowledge our clerk of court this morning. Netta Stenbridge, y'all are hiding from me, so I didn't see you, so I wanted to acknowledge your presence as well. All right, with no further ado, Judge, you, you could come up and you. The floor is yours. Is there a clicker where I can move the yes. slides? Yes. Yeah. Is it this item right here? Yes, sir. And do I push the right one to move it forward? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I think I project pretty good. <laughs> Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Bo McLean. I'm the Chief Judge of the Superior Court, the Douglas Judicial Circuit. I'm appreciative and honored to be able to be here. 
Uh, this is supposed to be a retreat for the elected officials and constitutional officers. I think a lot of what we have been doing over the years at this meeting is kind of talking about our budget asks as much as anything else. I'm not really going to focus on that uh, very much because candidly the Superior Court is not asking for a whole lot. Uh, generally all we ask for is what's necessary to do the job that we're called to do. We don't really ask for, for I've never asked for a raise for example. I wouldn't turn one down if you gave me one uh, but never asked for one in 42 years in government. Uh, we just ask for what we need to do our jobs and that's just how we've always done it. So I'm going to kind of talk about my perspective on where we're at and the challenges that we're facing in the court system. And I'm also going to apologize to you because I prepared this presentation from 6.30 this morning to 8.30 uh, today. So it's not up to my usual standards of how I do things, but you have to understand something. The Superior Court judges are in the courtroom every single day. We have no time to do anything other than what we have to do right now. And I'm going to kind of tell you what some of the, re and some of the other judges I'm sure have the same challenges and, and our solicitor, and our DA, and public defender, and clerk understand where I'm coming from when I make that statement. So uh, let's move to the next slide, which that did not work. All right, you sure this works? Yes, sir. Okay, it's the arrow button. Do I point it at you or <laughs> nothing's happening? Okay, so I should I just say next slide and do it for me? Okay. So uh, why is there a picture of Judge Cynthia Adams on there? Because it's always my duty to platform Judge Adams every chance I get. So there she is. Let's give her a round of applause. So uh, just some quick points. Um, the Superior Court is, is an old court. It's the highest court of general trial jurisdiction in the state of Georgia. It's been around since the 1700s. Uh, most of the operation of the court is funded by the state, uh, but the county does supplement salaries and it provides office expenses. And expenses to operate the court, you have to provide them. Now we can have debate about well, is that really something you need to operate in court or not? But it's a statutory requirement that the county take care of our expenses. Now, the Superior Court only hears felony criminal cases. Those are some examples of them up there. Uh, a lot of people don't even know what a felony is. But it's the most serious criminal cases. We also uh, do divorces, adoptions, disputes over the ownership of land, tax appeals, appeals from lower courts, cases in equity. We spend most of our time in the courtroom. When you see us in the courtroom, the odds are very high that we're either hearing a divorce or child custody case or a criminal case. That's what occupies the vast majority of our courtroom time. Uh, we also do some things we don't have to do. It's not a statutory requirement to have accountability courts in our county. It's an ask. It's a request from the state. It's an encouragement. And a few years ago, we decided to do it. And right now, we have a felony drug court, an opiate court, a mental health court, a parental accountability court. And like I said, I did this at 6.30 in the morning. We also have a veterans court. Next slide, please. All right, so when you give a talk, after a few minutes, people start eating, they start daydreaming, they start sleeping, te sleeping texting, doing all sorts of things. So I, I wanted to start with this image. 
this is the bottom line right here. Um, we got a big rock. We're in a lot of ways overwhelmed with what we're having to deal with right now. Uh, next slide. Why? Why are we in a very difficult situation in the judicial system? Well, let's see. We've had a worldwide pandemic in which over a million people died uh, in the United States. We've had to change everything about everything we do on the fly. Like, in real time. Uh, everything. Even something as the clerk handing me a piece of paper had to be changed because we're afraid of how transmitting the, the virus. Uh, we shut down jury trials for over a year. The Supreme Court shut it down. We uh, uh, adapted to the use of technology. We started doing video conference court. We started, instead of transporting inmates from the jail, uh, the inmates typically appear uh, by video from the jail. We have a court where one lawyer could be in their office in Alpharetta, another lawyer could be in the courtroom, an inmate could be in the jail, and we've really been helped very much by the Information Services Department, by the Board of Commissioners, to just keep the courts open during a time of worldwide crisis. Uh, and can I just say, if you don't have a court system, you do not have civilization. Literally, you have no civilization uh, if you don't have a court system. So that has had a huge effect. Uh, we've had significant changes in leadership in the judicial system just in the last two years. We've got a new district attorney. We've got a significant uh, staff change in the DA's office. We've got a new clerk of Superior Court. We've had a significant staff change in the clerk's office. When new leaders come in, they have new vision, new things they want to do, changes they want to make, and people come and go. So we've had massive change just in the last, since January 2021, I believe, when <coughs> Madam Clerk came into office and when uh, Ms. Racine came into office. Huge change in everything. And Ms. Compton also came into office. Uh, massive change because we have new leadership, new vision, new ideas, and new people doing things in our court system that we had to adapt to. We have massive staffing issues. Uh, the last time I checked with the Sheriff's Department, they had 59 open positions. I don't know if you... Down to 52. Down to 50. Congratulations. <laughs> Very good. And it's a 400... Uh, officer department, 450, something like that? Uh, I mean, four, 401 full of staff. 401. Okay, that, that's a huge amount of lack of staff to do the job they're tasked to do. And the staffing issues aren't limited to the sheriff's office. The staffing issues are all over the court system. Um, a year ago, um, Judge Adams came before the board and said, we need help, we need judicial case managers. I think he gave us, was it one or two? One. And should I show another picture of Judge Adams? <laughs> Judge Adams got a judicial case manager and she couldn't fill the position because it just doesn't pay enough money. So uh, there, the staffing issues are real. They create constant issues for the judicial system. Add to it the opiate crisis. Douglas County has consistently been number three in the state in opiate overdoses. Number three. I'm even beating out the cab from time to time. And last year, for the first time in American history, the number one cause of accidental death in the United States of America is not a car wreck. It is an opiate overdose. 100,000 deaths. Uh, last year. It, it's, it's, I, I gave a presentation, I think, to the board when I asked the board to approve 
our grant for our opiate court that we started were one of, I think, two opiate courts in the state of Georgia because we saw this crisis coming. We wanted to do something about it. And I, I pointed out some of this in that uh, presentation as this is the other pandemic that we're facing. In addition, uh, Douglas County is seeing a significant increase in violent crime. Uh, I'm not going to get into debate, well, this is in the city or this is in the county. I'm just telling you what I see in the courtroom. Uh, we have 25 pending murder cases right now. We have 111 pending serious violent felonies. Murder, rape, armed robbery, aggravated child molestation, offenses for which the mandatory minimum punishment is 10 years, no parole. Those cases require a lot of work, and frequently they require a trial because the defendant looks at the situation and says, no, I don't think I'm pleading guilty to 10 years without parole. I think I want to take my chances in front of the jury. So all of these factors have created a, a massive <coughs> a crisis is not too big a word, I think, for the Douglas County judicial system that we're doing the best we can to deal with. Next slide, please. So just to give you some numbers, even though we face all these challenges in the last year or two, if you look at those numbers, you'll see in 2021, we disposed of almost, the Superior Court disposed of almost as many civil cases as it did criminal cases. If you look at the criminal filings, you'll see we disposed of more criminal cases that were actually filed. If you look at 2022, we're a little bit behind on civil cases, but once again, the criminal cases, we've disposed more criminal cases than were actually filed. Why is that? Because we have a great public defender uh, in our circuit who's, uh, who the lawyers in, in Ms. Miles' office do an amazing job of representing their clients, taking care of their rights, but also getting the cases resolved in the courtroom. Uh, another reason for that is that once we kind of settle down with our new DA's office, uh, things are a lot smoother, we're working better together, we're getting things done, and uh, without the cooperation of the clerk, the sheriff, the police department, the public defender, it's a multifaceted thing for us to get this work done. No one person can do it. I cannot move a case without Ms. Stembridge's help. I can't move a case without Ken Connor's help. I can't move it without Monica's help. Uh, I can't move it without Ms. Racine and her assistant's help. So we, I think, the judicial system in this circuit, when you look at all the challenges we're facing, I think we're doing a very, very good job. Next slide. All right, so I thought I would bring up the subject of money. I thought about putting some dollar bills up there, but I thought, well, that's kind of, you know, cheesy. So I decided to put the word taxes up there. And where's the tax commissioner? Where is he? Is, is he here? <coughs> I wanted to tell him thank you very much for your little Christmas gift I got in the mail this week. I, I want to appreciate him for that. Uh, you know, when the, when the different entities of the government come before the board and say, give me money, Mr. Carson, give me money, uh, Madam Chair, give me money, Vice Chair, I just thought, and other commissioners, I and Guyer Jones and Andy Mitchell, I just thought it might be a good idea just to kind of point out, we're just not constantly asking you for money, we're giving you money, okay? Um, so the clerk's office uh, helped me with some of these figures. I'll just point out that I personally secured an ARPA grant for the Douglas County Judicial System this year at just under $1 million to provide resources to all elements of the judicial system uh, that were eligible to receive funds, including Ms. Compton's office. They each named Ms. Miles, but 
I think she got some money through other sources, maybe, hopefully, not yet. Like a penny. A penny? <laughs> well, I'm going to chip in a little bit more than that if you need. But uh, really, not very much of it actually went to Judge Adams or myself or Judge Warren's work, a very tiny amount, just the way they structured it. But it's my job as, as chief judge to look out for all of you guys and not just me. So that's what we tried to do. Uh, the felony drug court that we started uh, in 20, I guess, 17, I think maybe our initial grant funding was around a quarter of a million. Look at that. 1.6 million that we've uh, gotten from the federal government for our opiate court, state government for our drug court, and a quarter of a million dollars that we've collected from participants in fees, and I charge them rent. You know, when, when, uh, when I went to the board for the first time and asked for the house out there at the uh, landfill, um, and they graciously gave it to me, and I went to the board again and said, can I build Sanctuary Village? And uh, they kept saying yes to me. We charge our participants rent. They don't get a free ride. And so that revenue is turned over to the county. Uh, that's date fund revenue. That's basically fines on drug, sur surcharges on drug fines when someone is sentenced to the Superior Court. So we do bring in some money. We're not just somebody standing with a tin cup. Uh, next slide, please. Let me quickly tell you about the drug court. I don't have time. This lady keeps holding up this time card. So uh, uh, just let me tell you what it is. You need those two minutes. Uh, <laughs> can, can I raise it, Tim? Uh, this is faster than I normally talk. So um, basically in drug court, you're, you're arrested, you're in jail, you, you, you have a bad record. Your bad record is because of substance abuse. That's the driving factor. So if the district attorney, defense counsel, and defendant agree, then we do an assessment of that person, of their needs, and of their substance abuse problems and their mental health problems. And if they match all the criteria, we, we don't take serious violent offenders, we don't take child abusers, we don't take gang members. There are a lot of people that are excluded because of the nature of their offense. Uh, we take them in and they participate in an 18 month to 36 month treatment program supervised by the judge and my staff. They meet me every other week. The opiate people meet me several times a week. They get drug tested. They do community service. They have a curriculum. They have classes they have to go to. They have therapy they have to go to. As you can see, we have just under 100 participants in our felony programs. We've graduated 102. Uh, we have sentenced 58 who didn't make it. Uh, that statistic is one of the things I'm most proudest of. We own our participants' problems. We don't tell them, good luck. I know you got a bad record. I know you're addicted to heroin. I know you don't have a job. I know you don't have any money. I know you don't have a driver's license. I know you don't have a car. Go figure it out. I read a lot about people who say, if I was homeless, I'd just pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'd like to see you. I'm gonna put one of you in the woods with a heroin addiction and no friends, no money, no clothes, no driver's license, no job, no transportation. I'm gonna watch you pull yourself up by your rich hands. You can't do it. You need help. So as you can see from there, we have taken a lot of people who are homeless and we've moved them into shelters, then into supportive housing, and then into their own housing. Next slide, please. That's just a lot of information there. I'm gonna quickly run through it. Um, it's mostly grant funded. We serve the people that are the most risk to reoffend. 44% um, of our participants are homeless. It's because we're, we're addressing the needs of the highest risk offender because of that. Uh, we provide GED. We are one of the few programs in the state of Georgia 
that gives people Vivitrol. So you take your monthly Vivitrol shot and all of a sudden you can take all the heroin and opiates or alcohol you want, you don't feel a thing, and you can't overdose. And it reduces your cravings. It's a lifesaver. Uh, a lot of people have become taxpayers. A lot of people have been reunited with their families. A lot of people have acquired their own housing. We've had a few participants that bought their own house after they graduated from our program. Next slide, please. Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I just thought I would end with a pretty picture. Um, so, uh, I go on vacation a lot. I, I went on vacation in April, and what I decided to do was lay in bed for a week with COVID. That's, I, you know, I said, well, I want to take a vacation, so let me just lay in bed for a week with COVID. <laughs> it was a lot, and I've had three shots. It was a lot of fun, guys. It was a gas. So then, um, a few months ago, I said, you know, I haven't had a vacation since April. So I think I'm going to take another one. And, and you know what I want to do? I want to lay in bed for a week with COVID. <laughs> I mean, if I get to pick. <laughs> so I got it again, and I was in bed for a week with COVID and quarantine and all that good stuff. So after all that, I said, you know, I think I'm going to see if I can take a real vacation. And I just got back from uh, northern Idaho. That is Lake Louise in uh, uh, Banff, Canada. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. That's a glacial lake. And believe it or not, your Superior Court judge got way up there. That's, that's like a four or five mile hike straight up. You get to drink tea at a tea house and eat chocolate cake and then you gotta do the hike down. It takes all day. Those are glaciers right there. And we got to stand next to the glaciers and hear them talk. They make a sound as the ice moves. It's really cool. But I wanted to leave you with that pretty picture rather than just all of this crisis and doom and gloom because I promise you we're going to get the job done in the Douglas Judicial Circuit and we couldn't do it without y'all's help. And this board of commissioners has been supportive of me and my fellow judges at pretty much every turn and we're very appreciative of it. Um, Judge Adams, Judge Warren may mention a couple of little tiny things that we're asking for, I, but I wanted to kind of give you the state of play, kind of where things are right now, and maybe give you some rationale for why we may be asking for a couple of things. Um, and the only thing I'll leave you with is I'm going to bring this up later. I just want to plant a seed with the commissioners. Uh, I'm very close to done with Sanctuary Village. Uh, I'm going to probably need to draw some money from the public welfare line item that we have access to to do that. There's plenty of money in there to do it. I'm just telling y'all, I may need to do that. Uh, right, we're about to do HVAC, we're about to do flooring, and that will use up all the date money I have. And then the rest is just stuff like sinks and faucets and uh, minor things. So. I may need to come to you and just ask if that's okay. And the second thing is I've heard you're going to build a new building for the corner where we have the, uh, I got two extra minutes. So I've heard you're going to build a new building for the corner where we have our homeless encampment called Shania Haven uh, near the courthouse. We, when we got that email from Mr. Worthington, um, we immediately started looking at that proposed site and we may come on our hands and knees and say could you help us a little bit maybe knocking some trees down putting some gravel down see we have we got a water tap in at, at, at donation money expense for that old that's three thousand dollars so we're gonna have to do that all over again um, we have to have a gravel road of some, a little bit, just to get in there, get volunteers in there, and get the porta potty in and out. 
So we may need a little help with a little grading and maybe a little gravel, maybe a little money for the porta potty and the, well not for the porta potty, but to a new water connection. But we're looking at it to see if it can be done. And if it can be done, we'll do it and we'll just continue to communicate on that issue. But that's all I got, any questions? And I think I came under that too. All right, thank you so much, Judge. Any questions, Board? I heard you, Vice Chair. Oh, no, I'll just tell you. No, okay, I'll go. All right, fine. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chief Judge, and, and <coughs> I, I thank all of you guys for meeting with me on the, these past few years because the, this is important. <coughs> Sorry, public defender Miles. I'm here to clean that up. My, blame me, I, I, I skipped the name. But um, it, we, we do work together, we're all elected. One of the things I've always appreciated about what administration is was is this meeting is important. We do have some common interests um, in, in trying to do well in certain public. Our job is just a facilitator, we provide oversight. We don't get involved in guys' statutory or constitutional responsibilities day to day. But we do have limited dollars. You know, Fifteen dollars worth of need and ten dollars. And I appreciate the narrative that, that is being put forth. And I, I, I guess uh, again, I won't get into the word spend and all that because we're all elected. We get the game, we know what's happening, we understand the narrative. You know, Chief, I had a couple questions, so for, for the record, so divorces are up, right, in Douglas. Are they post-pandemic, during pandemic, have divorces going up in Douglas proper, or no? Like, what are you seeing, and are they consuming your time? I've been to a couple courses, you know, Judge James did mine. How does that work? Well, uh, I, I don't have data on all numbers. <laughs> I can just give you experience and anecdote. For example, I spent half a day yesterday. A doctor and his wife, a local doctor and his wife, were getting divorced yep. and didn't finish the case. So I would, my observation, and other judges can chime in, is they're getting more contested, more ugly, more difficult. And I personally think it's because people in America are under huge stress and have been for a long time. And I think that's playing out in the courtroom. Uh, it has become more of an issue than it was pre pandemic. That's good enough. We'll just just have to keep us going. Divorces. Because, again, that's when I talk to citizens, you know, I try to get information, not necessarily through the system, but I, I, I represent both the system and the people. I've got a male role. And what I'm seeing is that people just you know, walk away. Uh, there's a change in mindset. So it's like they're, they're very cold, very like, okay, that's you know, your ideal of what you thought life was has shifted. And the values are not what they're being proposed. You can talk to the citizens like, no, they, it's not true anymore. They've shifted. So that was the first question. My second one is, okay, you talked about your opiate um, program, which is obviously that court. How did you know they evolved to a court about three years ago? Now, you, you made a comment. You were going to focus on young white males on meth. Are you, were you stating that for real, or was that something, because that, that always struck me. I, I, didn't, I don't think I, I may have said that meth is typically uh, demographically a white male drug. That's shifted. We're seeing a lot more African Americans using meth that used to be, you just didn't see it at all. But now you're seeing it quite a bit. Uh, but uh, if you have an opiate abuse issue, it doesn't matter to me what your race is. Uh, we're going to get you in the program. So, so the focus is, do you have an opiate abuse issue? If that answers your question. Okay, that's perfect. And, and my last question is, I've always you know, had this thought. I appreciate the mindset of that. So keep, it, keep it small. You know, it's, it's this humility that we're just going to do one at a time. You know, you've got a short because what, about 100 people that you graduated, 50 failed. We spend less than two percent of our entire budget on DFACs and CSB Community Service Board, and I'm like, okay, how are you going to scale? I, I appreciate the the church model. I think that, like, okay, that's not going to serve the whole population. So, when do we get beyond that? I appreciate the work that you do um, as a you know, the ministry approach, and we're helping this. It's a small group that you're helping. It's who you have control over. That right there. But I'm like, well, what about everybody else? And I'm always going to keep asking these chief, you guys, the Supreme Court judges, are, are doing these programs. How are y'all going to scale? How do you how do you take advantage of, of, of the structure? Because really, 
you should be judging, not doing what you're doing. You're doing it out of your heart. That's, that's, that's above and beyond. That's like, I, I respect that. But you can't scale that across the county at this big. And so I'm just like, okay, now how am I going to appropriate against this? So my question is, how will, are we going to keep scaling and growing, growing your course? Because let's talk about the space. I mean, these courts are not necessarily requiring space. They're requiring what? Just facilitation of resources. I mean, what do you need structurally to scale to be able to do this? That's all my last question. So I would say uh, if, if you want us to move more cases faster, which I think everybody wants to do, we can't do it any quicker than we're doing it with the space we have, literally. And the reason I say that is because when the courthouse was built, not to throw mud on the previous board or judges, but they did something that was not very smart. They didn't plan for expansion. When the Cobb County Courthouse was built, they had several empty floors up top that were completely undeveloped that were created just for the purpose of expansion. So we could actually tap state funding to bring in retired judges and hear more cases and move more cases and conduct more trials. But we have nowhere to put that senior judge. When the Superior Court judges and the State Court judges and the juvenile judges are all holding court all the time, there's not a room to put them in. And when we went through COVID, we went through a period once we could do court again, we did trials just in my large courtroom. All the judges had to either try a case in my large courtroom or Citizens Hall because no other room was big enough to accommodate social distancing. So space is, we've run out. Um, I have got my drug court people in one of my units at Sanctuary Village instead of homeless person because I have nowhere to go. We're gonna start operating our own laboratory um, to test drugs because the people that we can get it done quicker and cheaper and they're giving us a free lab. We just have to pay for what's called the reagents. And that office and that lab is going to be housed in one unit of Sanctuary Village because I have nowhere to put it. Uh, so space is, and, and it's not a problem you're going to solve overnight. We talked about, could we set up an alternative courthouse somewhere else? And I just decided I don't want to put that burden on the sheriff to run two courthouses at the same time. Okay. He's already got enough burdens. I, no, and I appreciate, I mean, to the point to all of y'all, think about it, when you the space, give them space, but then you gotta have a person, like, for example, so there's some guy out there, he gets a contract, you gotta put a car in him, you gotta give him insurance. So there's still, there's the soft services, the soft cost of a loan, the physical, and I'm put the staff, I'm talking to these guys here. We, as you're listening to this, we have to plan for this. As you hear the vision, where they're trying to take it, it's like, okay, but our are going deliver this? The judge can't see release it. You can't go and just do the widgets yourself. I appreciate the volunteer, but this thing is too big for that else. It will only go so far, it'll be cosmetic. Like, we're only making a difference because there's only as so much as you can do as a human being. Who's the judge in court all day long? So at some point, we're gonna have to scale. So a deputy, you guys, make sure you make a note on my tab, make sure we plan for this, and please. Sir, Thank you so much. Judge, I just had one question that's Commissioner Robinson said 150 for Judge McLean, 150 yeah. for uh, Judge Adams. That's what I'm talking oh, about. Okay. Oh, we have not spent a huge amount of that money. Yeah. Okay. okay. That, we just, I just want to clarify. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, that was part of your BIR. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was the annual funding that we did it with. Yes, we did. Yes. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you got it, she got it. That's my comments <laughs> were, so I know what I said. Yeah. Any other questions? Commissioner Diamond? Uh, Judge, we are establishing a lab down at the transportation building when we have wrecks. You know, we have to send them to a lab to test to make sure they're not taking drugs or alcohol. Why can't y'all use our lab? I, 
I can't answer that question. This this lab issue has developed in the last two weeks. I mean, we're responding in real time. Why can't you use ours? Well, we've already built an extension onto the transportation. I don't know what yours does. I don't know what yours does. Does but it we test might urine? Work together and not have a redundancy. As well. well, I'll tell you, the lab's already sitting in my unit right now. You want me to give it back? I, I didn't know you did either. And you didn't know we were. No, sure did. <laughs> what we lack here is communication. <laughs> I don't have any way. I wonder if the county has a drug lab. That just is not a thought that really occurred. They test for drugs in the lab. Well, we have an independent company that we use that meets our folks at the jail. Uh, and any any accident involving the county vehicle. Or Random protest. There's lots and lots of issues that you have to address. You have to address timeliness. You have to address what drugs are tested, what kind of sample is used, chain of custody. There's a lot of issues that you have to. Address. I don't know what your lab does or how it does it. So I, we'd have to know a lot before I could just say off the top of my head that'll work. We'd have to have a detailed discussion because the results from our lab put you in jail do the results from your lab put people in jail do you know what kind of test it is is it a mass spec gas chromatograph test or is it just a screening test there's just a lot of issues we have to discuss is all i'm saying I'm not saying no out of hand but i don't know have we signed a contract with these people already or we're stuck I, there's just a lot of hoops we have to jump through to get Judge, Thank great you job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker this morning is Judge Adams. And Judge Adams, I apologize. I didn't see you this morning. Bye. Come on up. Um, you're next. Good. Good. <laughs> Good. 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 Make sure I recognize you by the night. Human Resources Director, Tisha Carter. I want to recognize you as well. Thanks. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I, I, I'll be very quick, really. Good morning to all the commissioners. Thank you so much again for this opportunity to be able to speak and to present to you all. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure because you guys have always been so supportive of us, and we appreciate that. Um, so Judge McLean went over a lot of stuff. So uh, I'm really going to focus on two areas uh, of these, I think. Uh, for uh, for our one of our accountability courts, our mental health court, which you have uh, graciously provided. Judge McLean touched on that, uh, the amounts that y'all have provided in the past. Uh, it's been a huge help to us. Uh, as you have heard, of course, we continue to have issues uh, uh, with our community and mental health issues, and especially after the uh, pandemic, we've been seeing just more and more issues popping up with folks. I think we have more individuals applying to our accountability court now more than ever i'm sure we're seeing the same thing with the drug courts but when you think about it um, when you have families and children who have been out of work and trying to get reacclimated to life and so forth uh, it's just been really difficult we've seen right now i have someone in my mental health court who is a graduate from georgia tech with her master's and so that just gives you an idea of what we are seeing um, because traditionally these are the types of people that we would think would be in using our programs. Um, but that's just what's going on uh, and that just kind of gives you an idea of, of what we are seeing. Um, and so for uh, what you've provided, traditionally we talked about it, uh, the money that, that uh, the, the counties provided, we've used it for housing. Now, Judge McClain talked about the grants and so forth that we've gotten, and that's great that we have gotten these grants. But one thing we know about grants is that they're not, they may not keep coming. And so uh, we have, uh, we've been able to secure a lot of housing for our participants. Uh, we actually got a housing case manager uh, this year, and uh, it's been uh, a huge benefit to the program because this individual Mr. Bridges actually goes through the county, talks to uh, different vendors, homeowners, 
and see if they'll partner with us. And so we're able to put our participants, drug court participants, home court participants, in the housing where they're not at the shelter. Uh, they're in a space where they feel comfortable. Um, and again, they're also paying towards that, but we're subsidizing and helping them to help them get on their feet so they can learn how to uh, eventually support themselves as they are getting all the other therapeutic treatment that they need. Um, and so once again, uh, you know, we don't know what will happen with the grants. We do, like Judge McClain said, you know, we try to be very careful with the money that we get uh, from the county. You'll see that we don't go and just say, hey, we have this money, we're overspending. We really are trying to be uh, very fiscally responsible uh, with the money that you give us, but we do continue uh, need that and ask that you continue to provide that uh, for, our, uh, for our Hope Court programs. Currently, we have 19 participants in our Hope Court program. We graduated 20. Um, we have uh, graduates who have gone on to do amazing things. Uh, I'm talking about folks who are coming back and telling us that they purchased houses, um, that they are back with their family, they've reunited with their families. Um, and, you know, uh, just hearing these stories, these, are, these stories will have ripple effects. I tell my participants all the time, you know, you are not just getting better for yourself. But by you getting better and you being able to have a relationship with your children, uh, with your significant other, it has a ripple effect because then uh, Judge Harrison's not seeing those children in her form, uh, for example. We're not seeing uh, other parents uh, coming across our courts on, on other charges because they're, they're making those sorts of decisions. So as far as our mental health court, and just to, to give uh, folks an idea, uh, just briefly, again, it's one of the accountability courts. Uh, last time I provided numbers to show uh, the board how we are saving not just lives, but we're also saving the county in terms of funding. Uh, the difference that it makes for the jail um, when they don't have to house someone at the jail, when they are have an opportunity to participate in the accountability court program and how it saves uh, the county money that way. Um, just the different things in terms of uh, you know, uh, them committing crimes, how it helps the businesses and so forth. Uh, and so these accountability courts, we, uh, we I, I think that I don't have to stand here and give this pitch for the accountability courts and for mental health court or drug court or opioid court, because I think everyone in this room would agree uh, that those courts are, are helping. So I, I won't go into that uh, uh, anymore. I won't say any more about that. So what I did was Judge McClain talked about just the number of cases that we have. And last year we did make an ask for an independent case manager. And thank you all, you did grant, you did, uh, grant us uh, some money for, uh, for one case manager. Um, I got a little, you know, a little bit of shade from the other judges at the time, Judge Emerson and Judge McClain, because they wanted to know why was it that the board was just giving Judge Adams money for, uh, for a case manager. Um, but the reality is that we, uh, we all need an independent case manager. Uh, those numbers that Judge McClain went over, you don't really under, perhaps cannot really understand them until you kind of see what, and I'll, I printed out my calendars. And I, I printed out my calendars from January. I, I made two copies. I'll start with Commissioner Carson. I'll, I'll give you a copy and you guys can kind of pass them down. So this is, this is what my calendar looks like just for the year. And if you flip through it, you'll see that it's color coded. So it has my court dates in there. It has my criminal trials. It has my civil cases. And you'll see that just about every day is shaded. So when Judge McClain says we are working, we're in court and we're working every day, and the thing is, we make our calendars like six months to a year in advance. So already I know that this is what my 2023 is going to look like. In court, just about every day, handling cases. And on each of those calendars, we're talking about anywhere from 30 to 60 cases on these calendars. Now we need someone who can simply manage and keep track. Because when I put out a calendar like that, and the attorneys know that this calendar is already out there and this is what they expect, 
then they are going to start sending in notices or rule nine size to say, I want my case on this calendar. And I need someone who can say, well, I can put this case on the calendar, but I need to know whether or not this case is going to take 30 minutes or two hours. And there's a lot of juggling and a lot of moving around to determine where's the best place to put that case. Because no matter how much we'd like to have more time in the day, no matter how much we'd like to have more days in the week, the reality is we have what we have. And if I have six cases and they're all asking for two hour hearings, and I, I don't have a dedicated case manager who knows all the cases and can put the right cases on the right days as I go through that calendar, it's a mess. It's not just a mess for us as judges who are doing this work that's already demanding, it's a mess for the community. Because one of the things I don't like to do, and I'm sure Judge Warren doesn't like to do, Judge McClain doesn't like to do, is to have people sit. You don't want to waste the community's time. You don't want to tell them to come in for a nine o'clock hearing and two o'clock they're still sitting there and nothing's been done. So why a dedicated case manager again? Why are we talking about this again? Because the reality is, if someone doesn't work for me directly, if my case manager doesn't work for me, then I can't control that person's schedule. Think if your assistant, your administrative assistant, doesn't work for you and doesn't report to you directly. When you need to sit down and have a meeting and say, okay, we need to do this, and that person's not there to talk about it, to try to figure out what the calendar is going to look like. You have no real control. And that dedicated case manager can know and be consistent, can be permanent, cannot be moving, and that's just my calendar. Judge Warren has one of those calendars, Judge McClain has one of those calendars, and year after year, month after month, we do the same thing over and over again. And so, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Robinson for talking to us uh, you know, prior to this meeting and uh, having a discussion about kind of the numbers. Judge Warren's there, um, you know, she's, she's good with the numbers. She was gonna have a PowerPoint presentation for us today, um, but if, if you all need uh, direct numbers in terms of what the ask is um, for what would be a reasonable number, to think about it again, the reason why we have all of the the, uh, the back and forth with our different offices that all of you all are experiencing, folks who aren't staying um, in certain positions, is because they're not getting paid enough. They're finding places that are paying them more. That's the reality. So if we are going to offer someone a certain number and they're like, I can make this doing a job that's probably a lot easier than what you're asking us to do, what you're asking us to manage they're not going to accept that job. So we just ask that all three of the judges be funded. Um, we recently asked for a fourth judge. And so all of this comes into play, okay? We recently went to the state, we made a presentation, we asked for a fourth judge, and I think out of, out of eight, they ranked it one through eight, and then out of eight, they said, you know what, no, y'all will fall at number eight, even though the three judges, we have three judges, and among the three judges, we have about 2,000 cases. We have the second highest number in the state in terms of numbers of cases per judge. And so we need a fourth judge, and we hope to get one. But in the meantime, we've got three, three judges is what we have. Three judges is, is, is going to do the work because we're not going to slack. I see Judge McClain took up some of my time, so let me see. Let me put on my glasses so I can see what that green should say. Did that say an extra 20 minutes? <laughs> no, but the three judges are going to get the work done. We're going to do it. Even if we have to stay sometimes late. You know, there have been days I've been here 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock. My car is the only one there. I know Judge McClain said it. I know Judge Warren said it. So we will get the job done. We just ask for some assistance so that we can have the right people to help us to be able to do it and to do it properly and to be efficient. Okay. That's all I got. Any questions? All right. Thank you so much.
How much by by numbers, Judge 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 Warren? I know you have the numbers already over there. What are our numbers? With a, we're asking for a salary of fifty thousand each, and so with the uh, benefits added in, that would be seventy two thousand five hundred. So times three, that would be a total ask of two hundred seventeen thousand five hundred. So two additional from the one from last year. So to keep the one that was granted last year, and so two additional. And that money's unspent. From right. Yeah. The money's unspent. We were we were not able to find anyone. Nobody wanted at that salary. But to me, fifty thousand is low compared to some of our salaries. Well, we would certainly, you know, if. I agree with you. However, as has been said, we come humbly and, and, and have not traditionally asked for a lot, but I agree with you. 60 is probably more on they don't par. They do not be an attorney or anything. They do not. And so, if I may just have one second to crunch that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I don't it. Again, mental health is something important. I remember. Two sixty one. Okay. No, two sixty one. You guys good? Yeah. All right. Um, so this has got to be back in 0910. It was at that time Chief Judge James, Judge Emerson, and Judge McLean was the real chief. Um, they had some jury duty at that time. And I, I remember I asked the question is that why was people always being sentenced to these harsh, um, these, these tough sentences? And I was educated since that we don't have any alternative sentencing options. This is important. And so in, in expanding that, um, obviously in 2015, the accountability courts came online and they began to become what they were. Even though we know Savannah had one as the benchmark, got it. We, we now got it. So these, these various um, alternative courts are important, and um, they, they should be adequately funded. There is um, some benefit to that. Um, the backlog that we meet with the sheriff's office is that, well, you think about the Sixth Amendment and the Eighth Amendment, speedy trial, so well, we got people that's in there, guys, that's backed up. So we got the citizens. I appreciate us as elected, but it's also person on the other side of that, the families that are being impacted, not just the person who broke the, the, the law. Is how do you balance that? This is okay, guys. We gotta get, we gotta, we gotta go. You gotta go. You mean the judges can only do so much when people just language. We have a, a responsibility to say, okay, how fast do we want this to go? Like, okay, they just don't go along, we go along, we need a little money. But guys, you know how big this system is? Not we got. Are you not listening to this data? And so to talk about a case management. Now I get it. Calendars. Now, I don't think the board, we don't get into it, but when we gave y'all your money, we're appropriate. Now, how they got to Miss Adams over the chief judge, that's, that's y'all. It ain't got nothing to do with that. We don't get involved in that type of that level. But I appreciate the joke. Uh, but uh, I can support all my tasks and yeah, continue to focus on, on the mental health. But again, one more time, but you got the community service board. And one of the things I am advocating is like, okay, guys, y'all gotta look at this. We're too siloed. Whether it's drugs or whether it's support, you got all these power. All you guys are elected, y'all got y'all little fiefdoms. And I'm sitting here like, I'm like now how are we gonna make this up? We got a lot of redundant costs. I agree with Madam Dyke, like, look at this. Come up with a standard that cuts across all of them. It's not a problem, just gotta vote something. Um, so I wanna put that on my tab and look at um, how do we get them what they need. I don't have a problem with um, the case management. Because I get counted. No, if I'm sitting there with Henry Mitchell at the front desk and, and, and he worked with Sherry, I'm getting mad. I gotta go. I ain't got time for him to, well, I gotta wait on him to serve Sherry. That's why we had to split and get our own aides. I don't have time for that. I got 35,000 people I got to serve. I don't have time to queue. So I have no problem. You don't have to show me on the argument. It's just the will of the board. And I think you guys likewise should have what you need. We did it for ourselves. So I, I, on this issue right here, I get it, judges. On that right there, I get it. I don't have time. I got to get stuff going. I got to share. At some point, you break. Sherry can't support four people. 
not what we need to get done. So I do get it. So I just want to make that note that y'all put that on my tab. I can, I can support that. And, I and, I'll, and I'll just end with this too, if no one has any other questions. Um, one of the good things that we do, and I'll say that's, you know, the different accountability courts, we share SAC. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're saving a lot of money there. Um, the state courts, uh, they're all, we're all partnered together. We all work well together. And I think that's something different that we do uh, from other counties. Um, and so I think that uh, also provides an incentive and, and the savings to the county as well. Every year we get four uh, interns from ACCG. They're paid too. I gave mine to the DA because she did hers got cut out of the budget. Could y'all use interns? We can. We can always use interns, especially if they're already paid and they're not coming out of our budget. I mean, I have an intern in my office every summer. Um, that's who the Atlanta Bar Association office. But I mean, you know, depending on what type of work they might do. My interns a lot of times will help with our case managers. Um, for example, now because I don't have an independent case manager, my intern from the summer helped a lot. My staff attorney has taken on a lot of the load of doing that, but certainly that's always trying to help the young people. Okay. Any other questions? Just one to ask. You spoke of three, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Are you working with the Superior Court clerk to help to manage your county? Like, how is that going with the symbiote? Right. So right now what we have is we have an individual who works in the clerk's office, and traditionally that's the way it's been. So the person works in the clerk's office, but so they come up to our office, and they're the ones, so they're the, the clerk from downstairs, they're the case manager, um, and, you know, the Simbridge and the clerk before has worked very well with us in terms of always making sure that we have a clerk in the courtroom. Um, the case manager, again, is someone independent, so we'll still have a clerk that's in the courtroom who's from the clerk's office, who would be managing the clerk duties, but the case manager would be the person who is, for example, will take the cases and kind of organize and move it around and put it on the right dates, as I previously, previously mentioned. And this will get court to start on time, get cases moved. Right, it's more- What's the efficiency? It's more for it's more for case management because when you look at my calendar, like I said, if I have a if I have a civil calendar uh, and I have uh, 20 cases on that calendar, uh, those can be all kinds of cases. They can be divorce cases, they can be property cases, they can be family violence cases, and so if you have someone who is independent to know, okay. This case will typically take about two hours. I can't put this case on a calendar that has 20 other cases that's going to take two hours. And so all year, they're having to do that. And not just all year, like you can't just do it. You can't just decide today what it's going to look like for next week. Our cases normally, the notice go out th about 30 days in advance. So for example, my staff attorney, who's helping with managing the cases right now, she's looking at, February, March, April of 2023. And she's doing most of the work because again, sometimes it's just it's just too much because my clerk, she has other duties that she has to do as well. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? All right. Okay. So, 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 so I was gonna ask, so, so I get the numbers that, that you guys were talking about three, that you already have one, is that for just only and, and under the auspice, or that's for all the judges that you're speaking of, so I can understand what, what was that ask? Right, so let me so let me be a little bit more clear. So last time I think it was 50000 that was awarded, um, and that would have included, the benefits would have been in there. So the salary itself, I guess, would have been somewhere around 30 maybe. Um, and so um, there was no one that was coming in for that. Got it. So we didn't spend that. That's still there. I think it's still in our, in, in our budget. We never touched it. So let's say that's a wash. Let's say we, you know, we're not considering that. The number that Judge Warren just gave would be for three independent case managers. Now, I don't know how you guys see the numbers. If you say, well, we already need 50, so we subtract 50 from that number that she's stated to get three independent. 
I went to law school because, man, I'm terrible at math. But I can tell you what you gave us. I can tell you what we need for three. Um, and so that, that's where we are. And the three is strictly for your, for your, for you or for all? One for each. One for each. One for each. Okay, that's, that's one. And the number that you killed was two, six years, something like that? Yeah, two, six, two, four. Two, six, two, four. Including that Including that Right. 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 Split this penny four or five different ways. Uh, with with Anetta and and that side of things, that kind of she's kind of sort of doing some of the similar things of which you guys are needing as that case manager, correct? Or the separation independently is where you want to go based on the mere fact of being efficient. Right. Yeah. And I'll tell you this. Okay. We are probably one of I don't know any county that don't have independent case managers. Okay. And when I came on, that was one of the first things I said as, as a judge. I said, why would I not have someone who is in control of my case manager? Why is my, the person who manages my calendar not under my control, essentially, to be able to say, okay, we need to do this. And like I said, Ms. Stembridge has provided clerks. But the reality is, if, my, if my current clerk wants to take a day off, she does not have to discuss it with me. If she wants to take a week off. Most recently, uh, Judge McClain was on vacation, as he mentioned, and my assistant was having surgery, and I thought, well, great, at least my case manager will be here. And it was only after I was having a discussion, she was like, oh, Judge, I'll be on vacation. And so I realized I had a full calendar with folks coming in, with my assistant having surgery, my clerk being gone for a week on vacation, and I had no clue. I mean, if your assistants, the people who help you manage your day to day, if they could just- Were controlled by me. How would that work? How would yeah. that, how would that work? If and I could say, no, I, I need you to do something else. It's not a criticism of Ms. Tenbridge, but they're her employees, they're responsible to her, they work for her, and there's other things that Ms. Stemridge and her office need to do besides what we're trying to do. But that's not the only duty they have. And so sometimes they simply need other things done. And so it is awkward for, I'm trying to get my stuff done. It would be awkward for you guys if your assistants all work for me. No, I, I get the, I, I get it. I just want to clarify. I just want to kind of get some clarity as to why and how and who does what. And I get the efficiency side of it, and it, and it does make sense, you know. But we just got to figure out how to uh, where where the funding sources are, and you know, cause as you guys all know, it's it's all about can we fund? Not that we don't want to fund it. It's you know we only have that penny that we're trying to you know slice it up and dice it up all kind of different ways. Your request is no lesser or more important than the finance director's request. So, but at the end of the day, I, I, I've heard what I need to hear. Thank you again, Judge Adams, and I appreciate it. And, uh, I appreciate oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Well, my first question, I wanted to ask, um, what is the criteria um, that you're asking for who uh, you look at for the judicial we actually have a job description. I think that's Commissioner. I think Commissioner Carvin also had uh, the same question. We do have. We did have provide a, uh, a job description, the duties, and so forth, explaining the responsibility. So it's not someone again who's completed law school. We would, of course, I think, like someone who has a college degree. Um, just that would be the preference. Um, not saying that we would be open to someone perhaps who doesn't have a college degree if they interview and they. Uh, they can handle the job responsibilities that would be required of them. Of course, it would be great to have someone who's uh, 
who's knowledgeable about the legal system, uh, who knows something about uh, criminal law or civil law. Um, again, I think justice, anyone who is uh, putting an ask out there um, for the need that you have, you want to make sure whoever you hire can do the job. Would someone from the separatist office who already knows the, the cases and so forth and the flow and the movement, um, would they be an ideal candidate? Of course they would, because they're already familiar with the system. They already know the files. Um, and so, you know, we're not asking for someone with, you know, with a, a high degree or anything like that. We're not, it's not a high ask. We're asking for somebody not only who would be acceptable to receiving the salary, but who would be long term, who would say, because it's important, like I said, these cases, you know, go on for some time, and you want someone who is going to be consistently in that position and, and stay, because as the cases move and they change, they're going to have to keep moving with it. They're going to have to be able to move quickly. But, but the hiring you require on the educational side, the hiring your requirements are even up on that side. In this state, you don't have to have a, you have, don't have to have passed the bar. Right. But if you're asking for a degree of some sort, then that's going to probably increase that type of a salary side of things. Not that someone, not say fresh out of high school or even in some form of a, a two-year institution of some sort, could do the could do the job, but probably wouldn't require as much as, as, as for someone who has a four-year degree, you know. Which is why we ask for an amount as opposed to say, listen, we're going to post this. We're not letting them drive the ship. Mm -hmm. we've, got a, we've got a position open. This is what it pays. Correct. We'll put out the, the ask, the ad, mm -hmm. see who responds, interviews, right. and hire accordingly. But I say that because this is why we said this is what we think case managers make in other jurisdictions, in our sister jurisdictions. And so if they have case managers that have been accepting these salaries, it sounds like they've been long-term case managers, that's what we're basing those numbers on. Understood. Well, what we don't want is we don't want her clerks to now come to you all, right? And now she's scrambling because mm -hmm. she's gonna come back and ask us, can you pay my clerks this amount? So it's all, I mean, we're all here together, right? So when you look at what one is doing, you look at the other, when one elected official got a raise, all the elected officials weren't raised, we're trying to make sure that we keep some type of consistency so that we don't have all this department hopping because at the end of the day, we're all trying to work to make sure that the citizens are taken care of and we just don't want to silo other departments and then you just, you know, there, there's a, what it does, Judge Adams, is it makes morale bad and it makes the Board of Commissioners look like we are picking one over the other, which we have no clue what anybody really makes. We just give a pot of money. So I, I kind of want you to think about that. And I understand Cobb, Doug, um, Paul, then the cab. We just can't match those. I mean, the sheriff will tell you, we, they, <laughs> we would love to, but we just can't match it. So I want you to please get with HR and see how we can, you know, I guess critique that ask so that people who are looking at this at 50 and 60, because I know the, the Solicitor General just probably hired somebody at about 65, 70,000, and they got a law degree, you know? <laughs> and so we, we have to look at these things. Oh, it was you. It was somebody I remember. It was, it was all of us. So we just have to look at these things. But I, I understand your ask. I understand your ask, Judge Bo McLean, and I guess this board will just have to take a look at this. salaries are fair compared to other counties 
Um, so I think we're good, but that was just the biggest difference. Somebody was asking, you know, why can't the current calendar courts do it? Because we're in court every day. When they're in court, we're in court. So, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to, to sit there and run the, the numbers when we're standing next to you and handing you sentence order. So, anything else? Yes. By statute, by the law, it says that the calendar courts should be a part of the clerk's office. There is that provision that we should always be a part of our office. And I think, and I know it's difficult because, like you say, you don't have that kind of control, but they are a part of the clerk's office. And the judicial case manager and the calendar clerks are totally different. And, you know, I understand what you're saying, but. There are reasons that the county clerk is under us. So. Right, and, and the, so yeah, so again, that's why we're talking about a case manager. Right. Um, right. And the calendar clerk, again, that person would still be in the courtroom, um, but we would have our case manager in the So thank you so much for uh, clarifying that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is just, just real quick. Um, the reason I invited Tisha Card to our HR director because it was important for her to hear, being new to here, some of these, I knew it was going to get the money. I knew it was going to get the people. And one thing the board recognizes is that we're looking at, um, since we passed the minimum wage last year, we gave it 10 and a 5. Yeah, yeah, it's about to kick in. But we know this, some salary compression in the middle. And we, as opposed to this, to see what happened, it gets politicized for us when we one off. All the niggling down us, because everybody gets I'm like, okay, we're down in the region. So I'm like, look, we got to pack up. And I see everything said, okay, so Ms. HR Director, help us solve this more systemic. How do we now know that all these titles, all these classifications, Mr. Deputy, y'all, we need to solve this broadly. When we need it today, that's going to take a minute, but we recognize it. Um, and we just have to make rationalization for it. At the end of the day, it is the world of the board, what we think is authority and stuff. So it's not our plus. The job is just to prioritize in light of everything. What's our focus going to be this year? But I do get it. Um, but I want HR to make sure they acknowledge the fact that we are looking at it. I want you to hear this. That's why I invited you here. Hear how all these are touching together. They got different types of classes and help us solve this. So that was all I'm I thank you. Thank you, all Thank you so much. And you're running. That's a little behind us. But certainly, I believe we did uh, make a note of the $261,000 ask. I believe it's fifty thousand dollars salary, eighty-four thousand including ben benefits is eighty-three, eighty-four. So sixty thousand have a midpoint is fifty-nine. Okay. So we are talking about it. Yes, okay. Well anyway, but you all do have yeah, no, baby no. nice. Yes. Judge Park, you have the floor. Come on down. works now, so we'll see. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, yeah. commissioners. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll do my best to get us back on schedule, but I can't make any promises. Um, so uh, I'm Eddie Barker. I'm the chief judge of the state court. And again, thank you. A lot of you uh, I've met, know most of you. Some of you maybe are new, don't know me. Uh, just as a brief background, I grew up here in Lithia Springs. Not, my house was about eight miles from here. I went to Lithia Springs High School back in the 70s. Uh, so yes, I'm old man now. Um, but, so, Douglas County State Court. I've been a state court judge uh, since 2010. The other state court judge, and I'll show a smiling face here in a minute, is uh, Judge Brian Fortner. Uh, he wanted me to make sure I apologize for him this morning. He is in court. Judge McClain, Judge Adams, and Judge Warren noted, we are in court a lot. Uh, when Ms. Watson sent out the um, information about dates to have this meeting, uh, I had one day out of the eight or ten that were suggested where I didn't have court, and it happened to be today. Lucky. The rest of us canceled it. <laughs> yeah. With our committee. <laughs> Because it's important to be here with you at least once a year. Yeah. And, and of course, last year I was in court and Judge Fortner had to do this presentation. So, um, just a little bit about state court. Uh, there are some slight differences with Superior Court. We do a lot of the same stuff. 
The differences in jurisdiction are the Superior Court judges handle the felonies. We handle misdemeanor cases on the criminal side, which typically turn out to be um, domestic violence type cases uh, and DUIs. Those are uh, traffic and DUIs tend to be a lot of what we handle along with. We used to do a lot of marijuana cases. We don't do near as many of those anymore. Um, and other type of uh, small thefts and financial transaction fraud, those kinds of things. Um, Ms. Cobden is the uh, prosecutor for our uh, court, has been since 2019. She started January 1, 2019. Uh, and her office provides the prosecutors. Ms. Miles has public defenders in our court as well that serves both Superior Court and State Court. As far as the civil side, we do a lot of the same thing that Superior Court does, uh, except we don't have to do all those divorces and child custody hearings and those type of things that we're glad not to have to do them. We know how busy they keep them. And, and as Judge Emerson used to tell me when he would do those hearings, I'd ask him how his day was or what kind of court he was having and he was having uncivil court is what he referred to it as. <laughs> Apparently that's what most of the people turned out to be. So that's just a little bit about the kinds of cases that we handle and what we do. And I'll talk about some numbers in a little bit. But first off, um, our staff, our office is not, our department is not that big. And literally it's two judges, our judicial assistants, and a staff attorney. We do have a court reporter but in each courtroom, but they're independent contractors. They don't actually work for our office. Uh, and so these are just some, some photographs of the folks, including the bailiffs and uh, members of the clerk's office. Because they, while they work in our court, they don't work for our department. They obviously support the courts uh, from these other departments, and we certainly appreciate the work that they do. I'm going to start out by talking as you've heard a lot about accountability courts already. Uh, and I want to, because we're very proud of the work that, that is done in was mentioned that all of our accountability courts uh, work together and cooperate. Uh, Judge Harrison actually has we had a meeting about six or eight months ago where all the judges and people involved in the coordinators and such got together and had dinner at Sam and Roscoe's so we could talk about how we could serve the community better and maybe pull our resources and that sort of thing. But this is uh, the staff. We uh, recently hired a new coordinator for our program. Uh, Judge Fortner and I both each have a treatment track of what's now known as the Douglas County DUI Drug Court Misdemeanor Accountability Court. Um, Mr. Bass came to us from uh, Fulton County. He was a, a case manager in their felony drug court program. Ms. Granger retired uh, back at the end of last year and we for were fortunate enough to be able to let her spend a couple of months training Mr. Bass um, Dr. Jackson Jones uh, helped us in getting that taken care of and that, that time she spent with him was very uh, valuable. Um, this is the, the direct staff, Mr. Bass, along with uh, our case manager, Nils Martin, and Mr. Gonzalez is our probation officer. Um, and Ms. Martin has been with us since the inception of our program back in 2013. So last year, our court was recognized as a, uh, what's called a model court. It's a designation for three years. The Council of Accountability Court judges have a set of criteria that they use to judge all the courts are based on uh, their peer reviews and other information. <coughs> Every court, ours, Judge McLean, Judge Harris, all accountability courts are reviewed once every three years. Uh, by a group that includes another judge, treatment provider, and coordinator from some other accountability court that are trained to do those. I actually am a, a peer reviewer, and I think I've done about eight or nine of those in the last three years going out and having the opportunity to go to other courts, which is real beneficial. I enjoy it because I like to try to learn what other people are doing and see if they have any good ideas that we can steal. I mean, borrow. Uh, and that was Ms. Granger, who last year, before she retired, was actually recognized as the coordinator of the year for all accountability courts uh, in the state of Georgia. 
So currently, um, as I said, we, we our participants in our program, which, uh, as I said, we, we work together because some of the people in my track actually started in the felony world. They actually had felony charges and were potential candidates in the felony drug court. But because of through their assessment and that process, they were deemed maybe not to be quite as high risk. Judge McLean deals with some really high risk individuals. You talked about the opiate epidemic and, and uh, that sort of thing, but there's some folks that are uh, have a lot of things going on in their lives and they need some really, really intensive work. And then there's some other folks that have just as bad of a drug problem. Maybe they're look, doing managing a little better, whatever, but the assessment, um, we, we learned over ex years of experience that People do better in these programs if they're getting the level of treatment that's appropriate for their needs. Some people need more, some people need less. And so in working together, we've been able to develop this system. Uh, we're actually, myself and our treatment provider, Josh Nation and Mr. Pruitt, Judge McLean's, uh, is the executive director now, is that his title? I don't know, president. President, what, <laughs> this one. Yeah, whatever it is this week. Anyway, we're doing a presentation at the CACJ conference here in a couple of weeks about the work that we do here in Douglas County and how we share resources and how we share participants uh, to, to fit what their treatment needs are. Um, and hopefully that'll go well. But these are currently our numbers. Obviously, COVID put a dent in. We were running uh, about at about 75 or 80 pre-COVID. We've gotten it back up to around 50 now, and we have, I think, 15 or 20 more that are in the pipeline that should be coming into the program over the next several weeks. Uh, so hopefully we'll get those numbers going back here very soon. Uh, to date, we've had a total number of graduates of 256. We actually have a graduation next Thursday. I hope some of y'all have received the invitations for that. If you can join us, it will be at Chapel Hill High School um, when we have it next week. In the past, we, we usually have, have been able to acquire speakers. These are just uh, some of the folks. Sheriff Pounds, do you remember coming to speak at the graduation? No, you do. We've had uh, judges from both the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, a uh, number of uh, members of our General Assembly have spoken to our graduates over the years, uh, as well as some of our county uh, local officials. And so we, they, they, it's always, I believe, been beneficial to the folks to see that there is involvement from the different levels of government uh, to show the support and give those words of encouragement to the graduates. I've heard many comments over the years uh, about the, the, uh, the enjoyment that the folks got from hearing the uh, words of encouragement from the speakers. One of the requirements of our program is that our participants have to do what we call social events. Uh, they have to do a couple every quarter. Uh, and these are just examples of some of the things. There's other things they do. They, In the past, we have movie night. We've gone to Braves games. They've gone whitewater rafting. There's just all kinds of events. But we try to teach them that it's okay to get together and have fun in a sober environment. So again, some I'm not going to go through the numbers. Those are there for, for y'all to look at. But basically, uh, these people, as Judge McClain alluded to, they do pay uh, fees to participate. This is our fee schedule. Uh, we also are supported by grants since we began the program. Uh, Back in 2012-2013, our program has been awarded a little over $1.1 million to support the program. So that, combined with the fees as well as the support from the commissioners that we get, has been a, 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 what supports and sustains the program. This was, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, maybe Judge Adams talked about it, but we keep track of the dollars that we are able to save the county in that when folks are being considered safer, they've got a DUI and they're being considered for DUI court, the solicitor will make two recommendations to the, to the lawyer, the participant. If you don't do DUI court, you're gonna do this much jail time, but if you do DUI court, we're gonna reduce it to this. And that we keep track of that, and that's, you know, by them being having that option, those are the dollars that have saved the county over the years 
uh, based on what the jail cost would have been had they had to house those people during their term of incarceration. So I'm going to move from um, accountability court to talk about budget issues. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a small office. We don't really have a lot of budget asks and requests. Um, the one thing that is very vital, as was mentioned also, is the ability to have senior judges that are able to assist us and help us work, continue to work towards reducing our backlog. We've really uh, been able to, to get a lot done in the last six months. As Judge McLean mentioned, there was an ARPA grant that he obtained that was, almost, as he said, almost a million dollars. Uh, we, part, we were part of that. He was able to get us some money that uh, provided days of uh, paying for senior judges. We've had uh, one trial week of the judge that helped us move cases earlier this year. Next week, we have another senior judge coming to try cases. Um, we're going to run two courtrooms. We're going to put him in one courtroom. Ms. Compton knows it. I'm going to be in a courtroom trying cases in the senior judge because we're trying to dig into the uh, backlog that accumulated over COVID. Thank you again, Judge McClain, for doing that. Hopefully, we're going to be able to renew that next year. I think that they're working on that right now, if I'm not mistaken. With all that being said, uh, Judge Fortner and I uh, and, and, um, have had an opportunity to talk to, and Ms. Compton as well, talk to all the commissioners about the need for a third judge. Now, as we, we talked about in our meetings, this today is going to be just a brief presentation because we know there is no space, as Judge McClain mentioned, for a third judge. But we understand there's a building plan in process, and so we want to start the groundwork for, for y'all to be looking at this, considering this, and what it's going to take when we get the plan laid out and we actually start doing some construction so that we'll have the ability to have a place for a third judge to hold court. Because the county's still growing, and there's a lot of reasons why we need senior judges now and then the third judge, and I'll talk about those at the end, about the need to try to do that. Uh, as Judge McClain mentioned, we've been using a lot of technology to help us do that. Uh, Sheriff Pounds and, and Chief Deputy Connor have, have been great working with us as far as uh, making rooms available and having guards be able to move and schedule the inmates and stuff and I, I think it's been a real successful venture and it's helped us move our cases a lot more um, as, as Judge McClain noted during COVID our ability to try cases which is that's the engine that moves all the cases without the fear of looking at a jury a lot of people won't ever do anything with their case and uh, sometimes it takes them sitting in a courtroom looking at the folks sitting in the box before they say, okay, yeah, I want to work it out. Um, and so we, weren't, we didn't have that ability for a while. Once we were given the green light by the Supreme Court to do that, uh, as Madam Chair knows, we were trying cases in Citizens Hall. We appreciate y'all letting us be able to do that and use that room because we needed it. That was, the, as Judge McClain noted, other than his courtroom, that was the only other space large enough to accommodate a 12 person jury. So we've been working towards uh, making a, a, a dent in the backlog that accumulated during that time. I'm not gonna run through these uh, numbers, but they're, they're there for y'all to review. This is just in the last uh, few years and there was obviously a dip in some of the numbers because of COVID. Uh, there was a time where the chair's part wasn't taking people in, right? Because they couldn't. They, they couldn't bring them in. And they weren't writing near as many traffic citations and that sort of thing. And the other reason is they're down deputies on the road. As they get those positions filled, and now that we're hopefully on the back side of this COVID issue, uh, those numbers I think will, will greatly increase, especially in the traffic world. But as our, our county, as Judge McLean noted, it's, it, it's not getting any better. It's gonna only get more dangerous over the years which means that the, the, the crime will probably uh, continue to increase, unfortunately, despite all of the best efforts of everybody in this room. Um, right now, this is our, what our current backlog is, and one of the issues that we face, and the reason it's so vital that we reduce the backlog is because 
the longer it takes cases to get to some resolution that it's not good for the community because it, problems develop in the and Ms. Compton and I've had a number of conversations about this and some of the frustrations that her office faces because if it, if it starts taking a while then they have problems because the witnesses start disappearing or witnesses memories kind of fade on them about what specifically happened they've run into the situation where officers have been retiring here recently and a lot of them when they retire they move away and it's hard to you, you might can track them down if you can track them down they might not want to come back uh, so that cut poses a problem for them as well sometimes unfortunately things happen to evidence uh, over time and the defendants themselves move away and even leave the state and in our case if a defendant leaves the state and they don't ever come back even though we might have a bench warrant for them they're not coming back because because generally we don't extradite somebody from another state on a misdemeanor they uh, when I was in the district attorney's office, we brought them back on felonies all the time, but it, it's just not really cost effective. We could bring them back if we needed to, but it's just not cost effective for the sheriff to have to send somebody to, you know, Ohio to bring, drive somebody back that's facing a traffic citation warrant or something. So we just don't do that. So uh, again, uh, as noted there is the state court does generate revenue uh, it's based on uh, fines that are paid in their criminal cases as well as fines on the traffic uh, and the traffic citations and again those are just some of the numbers that uh, have occurred over the last couple of years the civil side as well there's revenue that's generated when lawyers file their lawsuits there's case filing fees and such and part of that revenue goes to the uh, county so as I mentioned in our meeting with, with each of the commissioners that it does by adding a third judge it doesn't just affect that you're just not adding a judge and, and a judicial assistant maybe a staff attorney it affects everybody that handles and has business in the courthouse um, and so there are a number of other positions as well but i've made an estimate of each one of our office and then in cooperation with all the other department heads that are affected um, i've got a number for you just a minute but this is just for y'all to have something in mind when we get to the point where we need to do this but for a third court judge just under half a million dollars for the judge the personnel and the other items that are needed for that uh, the effect on the sheriff's office uh, from them would be for personnel equipment about two hundred thirty thousand dollars they would anticipate in, su in the support of the third judge public defender's office of course adding uh, more assistance um, or more assistant public defenders to uh, place in the courtroom uh, as well as an investigator and then uh, other equipment such that's their their, their number thank you miss miles for getting that for me uh, as far as the state court clerk's office um, additional personnel because they're in our courts supporting the work that we do um, Ms. miller thank you appreciate that and finally the solicitor's office uh, obviously if there's a judge it's going to have to be prosecutors investigators victim witness personnel support staff as well and uh, that would be the the need for Ms. Uh, Compton's office uh, to support that and the total of all of those is, is just over 1.8 million would be the total effect and then I would point out that that's pretty close to the amount of revenue that's that's generated depending on what happens with the, in the future with with the number of other cases that are actually moved and when you add that third judgeship that's that many more cases that are going to get moved which would help uh, in, in doing that as well so this is just a summary of, of what we're why we think this third judgeship would be important uh, because it's coming it's needed and i will also tell you there was a recent case count study that was done which which says and i can get y'all 
this information at the appropriate time as well, which says we need a third judge as well uh, through the case count study that was just done. They haven't officially released the report yet, but I was at a meeting last week where I got to see the numbers and it said we should have a third judge now, not two or three years now, but understanding the situation, it's only going to get, the numbers are only going to even support it even more over the next year or two. Um, thank you. Uh, we appreciate uh, everything and all the support that we get. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, does the state subsidize the state judges? No. The state court is 100% funded by the county. Okay. That's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Yes. Sure. No, I, I appreciate this dialogue. Again, we have a lot of new directors over here, and they, they're invited to, you know, head of finance, um, um, the head of HR, they're ready to make sure she's here, our deputies. Pay attention to this. You're talking about two courts, doubt shall do. It's you no know, unfunded mandate that may come down. Now, how do I anticipate a million eight times two courts? All things being relative. And I'm sure there's some other judges here that complain that they they need to multiply. We've outgrown our infrastructure. And why sometimes I, I can't get into the, the nickel and dime on this world where that lot. I don't see the magnitude of where we are right now. We have not seen the density that this county already has. So then it comes down to work. Some things get dictated. And so it's like, okay, so um, for my tab doctor, um, for our CFO, and you got two courts you need to set aside some degree of money of that 2.8, whatever that money is, set it aside. Just you, you got to anticipate this. This is going to hit guys eventually. It might be about two years, three months, and you know, five days. But I'm at least laid out a plan that if the future is, y'all, y'all, yeah, but this is going to catch y'all off guard if we don't plan for this. This is going to be a mess. And in light of everything, these, these are these are real courts. Now my question becomes, can we set up? Like in, in Fulton, you have magistrates who actually do different types of uh, cases. Can we, at, at the local level, have junior Superior Court judges? And do we have the authority of junior state court judges, which means we can replicate now to, to soften a little. How does that work? Judge, Chief Judge. Well, we, there's not really junior judges. I, that, uh, so, I mean, I understand. We, well, that's what we we do that in a way a little bit with the senior judges that Judge McLean referenced. They use senior judges mainly when there's conflicts, but you can also, if you got the money, you can pay them like we're doing with the ARPA money to actually help with additional cases, uh, holding additional jury trial weeks. Um, that's you know to me that's about the only thing that can be done. Um, Many jurisdictions, the superior courts will designate a magistrate as a superior court judge for a limited period to handle all, any case a superior court judge would right. handle. The catch is they have money to pay for it. Right. And people to do it. And space. And space to do it in. Right. So, you know, some of these, some of these, Judge Adams mentioned, well, there's several jurisdictions ahead of Douglas County on the new judge. Well, the, the dirty truth is that most of those jurisdictions use magistrates to do superior court work by designation. Yes, sir. We do all of ours ourselves, unlike them. And so they still it's a, get the count. Though, and they still get the, ca the count. They still get the numbers, even though they're not doing the work. Can we do both, though, man? I'm just trying to think about If there the was guys. money and the right people in space, sure, it's legally possible. Temporarily, until you get, you know, thus must do this, you get this mandate behind it. You are going to have a fourth, a superior, and a third state at the same time. Judge McClain could designate either myself or Judge Fortner. I think Judge Fortner has done a, a couple of things sitting for state court, our superior court. Uh, he has the ability to give us that authority. 
We, we do it. We I've designated uh, Judge Cam and the other judges. The catch is the space. I mean, you can't use them if they're in court every day in their courtroom. You can't have them come do your case in your courtroom if you're in it. The space again is always a problem. Bill, I thank you all for that. Again, just we get it. Um, I'm fine with you. Yes. Any other questions for Judge Parker? Now we're going to move on. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Very good job. Thank you. Certainly, um, do we need a break, like a five-minute break? Are y'all okay? Sometimes we need a break and we're a little lost in the sauce. But we have, it is now, what time is it close? It's 10.29. Okay, so if we can just take a 10-minute break, and then we'll get started. And uh, Judge Peterson, I don't see her here. She's not here. She's okay. Not here. So we're going to move. Uh, next would be our solicitor general. Uh, Next. But take a 10 minute break and uh, you time us. Just see, can you make sure you time us because we can start exactly 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. I know 10 minutes is just like 10 seconds, but we need to move forward and so we can continue throughout the day. We have our Solicitor General coming up next. Um, Sonia Compton, our Solicitor General, you have the floor. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Very good. You need a mic? I don't know. I keep it. You just in case. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Board of Commissioners. Thank you all for this opportunity. Role of the Douglas County Solicitor General's Office. You said left or right? Yes, sir. Oh, how do I go back? Okay, we'll start over. Okay. Our office prosecutes misdemeanor and traffic cases, which includes traffic. DUIs, traffic accidents, vehicular homicide cases, theft under $1,500, prostitution and pipping, we don't have a lot of those, but we do prosecute them when we get them, uh, criminal trespass and damage, civil assault, battery, sexual battery, um, DV, domestic violence cases, child abandonment, and uh, court ordinances and drug related type offenses. Uh, marijuana. These are the numbers for the past few years. So far, um, as of 9-22-22, we've had uh, 7,725 traffic cases and 647 criminal cases. The total fines that we received as of September 22nd is $1,835,149.98. That's what we brought in so far, my traffic and criminal cases. Right now, with all the cases that we have open, we have 14,134 open cases. Um, and a lot of those came from prior years, but these are open cases. This year so far, we have, and this includes traffic, not disposed of 9,143 cases. Now, a lot of these cases are, of course, traffic cases, so people go on and they pay their tickets. We take credit for that, too. <laughs> but uh, a lot of them is due to, the reason we're moving so many is due to our traffic division. And I want to thank the Board of Commissioners for funding our traffic division because we were able to <coughs> dispose of quite a few cases because of this traffic division. Traffic uh, division con unit consists of a, an assistant solicitor. This person manages the traffic unit. Uh, we have a legal staff assistant that assists the ASG by providing documentation cords, put together spreadsheets, and getting the files ready when we have court, which we have three times a month in Citizens Hall. We have all our traffic cases come in. We have a traffic investigator who pulls the driver's histories research and print copies of accident reports, incident reports, and download videos for traffic cases. And we have a traffic victim advocate because a lot of traffic cases involve accidents and there are multiple victims. And we're to provide them with information and resources 
uh, and advise them on the status of their case. This traffic division, they get together uh, once a week and they do a very, very good job. So we really thank you because we can move so many cases now. During the week, if somebody wants to resolve their case, they call in or email, we have a, a separate email for them and they can resolve their case and oftentimes they don't have to come in. So we thank you all for that because that has been very, very helpful. Our trial team appreciates it because they don't have to worry about those traffic tickets unless of course they can end the trial. Uh, our victim services department, we provide services to victims of crimes, uh, misdemeanors and uh, traffic cases, car accident, vehicle homicide cases here, um, theft, criminal trespass cases, domestic violence cases. Um, um, as of this year, I think we have 705 case victim cases. And so far, we've provided this year 16,262 different services. And that means providing them with information, making contact with them, answering their questions. That's how many contacts we've had with victims this year on these cases. And of course, we were recognized for our internship program. They do an excellent job of bringing in interns from Georgia State. Um, and it's good because we're training people and we get workers for free. <laughs> So we were recognized by um, Georgia State for our internship program, and that's um, uh, Christina McDermott. She is our internship director. She does an excellent job of organizing and getting these kids in, young people in, and training them. One of the things we're really proud of is our solicitors outreach program, which we call SOP. This program was created in 2019 to assist citizens who are in need of our community. Through this program, we provided Christmas gifts to adults uh, who are in transition from the Share House and JC Freedom House to their own home. And we focus a lot of times on adults because everybody focuses on children. But this program not only focuses on children, it focuses on adults. So when we reach out to the Share House, we're like, what do you all need for Christmas? What would you like to have? And we have things, they request things like um, silverware. We need sheets. They need household goods things like that to get started. So we provide that for them for Christmas. Um, adults and children in the Kinship Program. The Kinship Program is a program, and I know Judge Harrison is aware of this, where grandparents are taking in children as opposed to these children being in foster care. So we go with them and we ask them, what do you all want? So we try to help them uh, provide gifts for their grandkids and we also provide them for the uh, grandparents as well. I had grand, one grandmother, in fact, she was a great-grandmother. She was 70-something years old, had great-grandkids. And I asked her, I said, well, we want something for you. And as most grandparents say, oh, don't worry about me. Get the grandkids. I said, well, no, we want to get something for you. So what do you want? She laughed. She said, I want a thong. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was asking who else. And she said, just some jeans and sweatshirts. So we got her the jeans and sweatshirt. Now they're cute gift we did get her a thong. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, provide for the Angel Tree. Uh, every year we provide gift cards to the Kiwanis Club and put the annual shop with the COP program. Um, we give, give to the kids in the juvenile treatment, uh, the adults in the juvenile treatment, family court program, toys for tots, and the homeless school children here in Douglas County. You'll be surprised how many kids are homeless in Douglas County. So we get those names from the school and we provide gifts for them as well. And these are some of the gifts. Uh, this is the hallway where we had some of our gifts where we have them wrapped, things that we buy for them. Um, that's with the Kiwanis Club where we give them $1,000 every year, uh, 10 $100 gift cards for them. And these are just some of the people that gave me permission to, to show their face where we gave gifts um, to different folks. We also gave um, to the school program. We bought a lot of things that we can donate to schools through this program so they could give the kids a lot of school supplies. The mission of our office strictly is to obtain justice for victims, hold offenders accountable, and keep the community safe by providing effective, by effectively prosecuting cases with expediency and integrity. And, and that's what we try to do in our office. Um, I know y'all want to know some of the things we were asking for. Of course, I'm asking that you all continue for, uh, providing funds for the traffic court division. It's doing to make that permanent. 
Uh, we tried it for a year, it worked very well, and we'd like to keep that going. Um, because of the number of victims we're having, uh, our victim director, not only is she directing the department, taking care of the department and getting our grants and things, she also manages a courtroom. So she has double duty, and that's a lot. So one of the things I asked for in our request was money for a victim advocate as well, to, so that she can focus on being the director and being a victim advocate for the courtroom. But um, that's it. That's what we have. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, for a chief vice chair, about some questions. Yeah, just real one quick question. Uh, it's linked to the judges if they're still here related to, uh, to our, our HR director. Now, here we are. We have our peers that are asking for an annual appropriation. So how do we um, evaluate our decision? Right? Unlike normal employees, these are not our employees. So we gotta make a decision. And you got five people that will determine how they will be in and we'll look up what a Corey is. But one of the things I, I think is important for us, you can take up this challenge, so how do we need to think about this? You know, what type of performance metrics can we use consistently that's before the public? That's nothing to do with us. Our performance every week is on judgment. Every week. But here we are and it's like, you know, how are we going to do this? How do we be fair in our appropriation? Um, and it's just about a criteria. I know that I think it was a juvenile judge, they'll talk probably a little bit later about their study they did regarding disparity. You know, is there something that we should be given beyond just I appreciate your presentations. But at the same point, how do I do this really, really fair? Or else, it's like we do all the time. We just wake up in the morning, it's how we want to vote. It's sort of disingenuous, but it's reality. It is what it is. And I'm saying this for the record to say that we can do better. You're sitting there like, okay, now how are we going to do this? How are we really going to do this? And, and look our peers in the face like, now you know it's just going to come down to how we feel, right? It's true, our discretion, right? And I just, I, I just think we can do better. Well, I had to say that. All right, so my question becomes, why is your traffic unit, which the board approved last year, you asking for us to redo it again? Shouldn't that already be baked in? Why? Mark, why, this is the, why, why is that a BIR? If, if, she, if we gave money to support you to do this traffic unit, why should we be asking for it? I mean, we already expanded that function of her. Can't go backward, or are we saying, the board, we're gonna dismantle this? Because it should be a question of considering yes or no. If we gave it to her and she's providing services to the public, it's effective, so that shouldn't be part of her, her ask. That's part of her budget already automatically. That was just a question. I'm, I'm gonna let y'all, we'll settle this later. Put that on my tab to solve. I don't think that should be an ask of her. So her, her ask would be less than something that's already been baked in the budget. If we don't do our, our peers like that, we get a share of his money, we can't, we can't, you can't play like that. You may not have known, but I just picked that up during my, my hearing. It's like, okay, now why is she asking for this and we already put it in there? It makes it seem like she's asking for more than what she really asked for. So that, that distorts perhaps what her, her, her simple ask was, I think it happened. But you get this whole traffic union here, this decision-making point, it's like it, it distorts it. Anyway, that's just my point. That's all, that's all I did. I'm good enough, Jerry. She's easy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Certainly, uh, thank you so much. Any other questions? Board? Oh, Board, thank you so much. CFO, are you doing the traffic unit? We still have yes, it. It's, it's, still it's, it's, still, it's still baked in there. So we didn't, we didn't move it. Okay, all right. Just move it. Okay, I just I, I would like to say one thing on the um, STOP program. Those funds come because of the people who are in the pre-trial diversion program. In lieu of them actually doing the community service, they can give gift cards from Walmart or Kroger, Publix, or Target for us to get these gifts. So that's what they give in, in lieu of doing community service. They get the gift cards. And what I find is most of them is like, oh, it's healthy people? Yeah, we'd rather do that. So we give them that option. Any other questions for Thank you. Thank you. Question? Yeah, no, this is related to, when I hear, do we have a lot of DUIs or DWIs in, in the community? I, I've been all my life, I've, I've been a stop sign, but I've never, um, actually been pulled over, but I'm questioning, how do we really handle those situations? DWI and DUI in Dems County, is it going up in light of the COVID? Is it more normal? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's us. You asked the wrong one, that question. 
<laughs> okay, the priest did it, but, but she mentioned it because she's prosecuting. So I'm gonna steal my prosecution. You can turn in a minute. <laughs> Back to this, I, I, I want to, um, can you answer, because you brought it up, and you're prosecuting this, how, how does that work? Is there degrees, if I get pulled over, um, is your, your discretion on how you prosecute, is it point over? I'm just curious, what, what is your position as the person that's prosecuting these things? Is there a range of being under the influence? How, talk to me. Okay, well, the DUI is, there's a per se, and there's a less safe. Yes. So let's just say you you leave Applebee's and you've been drinking um, and you admit it and, and you fail to maintain lane. And maybe you had a little accident. And the officer comes up, he's speaking with you and he may smell some alcohol in your breath. Um, he may charge you, may charge you with driving under the influence. Uh, he can take you in. Um, they get warrants, the sheriff's allows them to get warrants to draw your blood, you can, you can agree to it or they can contact the judges and they'll sign a warrant to take your blood and then of course they send it off for testing to find out what the, the limit is. If it's point over point oh 0.08, uh, that is per se DUI and of course you'll be charged on that. Is it DUI? And if it's less safe it's because you were driving and you were, you were not, maybe not a point oh eight, but in fact, the alcohol or whatever you need influenced your driving, which made you less safe on the road, which caused the accident, or you were not driving properly. So we do prosecute those. So you, there is some type of way to There's some guidance in which you have to stay with the basically. You clarify. Yeah, we apply, we apply, we apply the rules. Thank you. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't know what I'd be telling you. I don't do what you guys do. But thank you for being kind and answering my question. Commissioner Barker. Um, I heard, I think it was from Judge Barker, that marijuana cases are down. Is that due to, what is that due to? Is it due to? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, I don't know why they're down. We get them and now that they're in the ordinance, most people I was just go ahead and pay the fine. Okay. So most people don't, they just pay the fine and go on. We don't have too many people want to go to trial on marijuana cases. Okay, so the ordinance that we passed in, was 2019 or 2020 actually mm -hmm. helped? Oh, it helped a lot. They just go pay the money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it helped to fund the courts a little bit. Oh, really? Serious. It does. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Yes. I'm just, you know. yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 All right. Um, Executive team for the record. I, I think we did you get the victim ad, advocate that, you, that the uh, solicitor general is requesting, and then also I believe the traffic unit is already still baked in her budgets. We do have a question. Yes. She added it back. She added it back, but we already have it. Okay. It's already there. We can't have stuff. Don't be disregarded. Okay. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing it to life. Right. It's already in there. We just uh, showed it. You know, and again, we've got to provide support for those who go through this every day. Yes. Thank God. That's all we have. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Gentlemen. We're going to move on now next to our Judge Judge Harrison and Judge Nurse. Thank you. I'm hoping y'all just let me know if you can't hear. I'd rather not have to use the microphone. Um, Judge Nurse was not able to be here today. She had an emergency hearing. Um, and so I let her off the hook and said I'd handle everything without her today. So I appreciate everyone's time. Um, and I won't be long because I will say I worked very hard last year to get the things that we needed for this year and with um, Commissioner Guyer backing us um, and Commissioner Robinson always taking his time out every year to come and find out what our needs are we have been able to this has been a relaxing year administratively for me thank you um, when I first got into this position um, the thought 
of having to take on the administrative role in addition to trying to keep our families together and safe um, in the community was really overwhelming. Um, and it's something you can't pre prepare for um, in the judicial role. So it's been a tough two years with COVID to try to learn to balance it. And I definitely could not have probably made it through this year had y'all not um, taking care of us last year. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, we are right now, right this minute, fully staffed. We're about to lose one person, but um, it's been the first time in a while that we've been fully staffed. Um, and we have been able to really focus our attention this year to trying to be trauma-informed and, um, and utilizing what we know about trauma to move the juvenile system along. Um, we know that trauma affects just about 99% of everyone that comes through the court system. Um, and usually that is one of the main reasons why families end up with substance abuse issues, with mental health issues, um, our youth not getting supervised and raised properly, that they end up down um, the slippery slope of the um, pipeline to prison. And juvenile court has really focused on trying to get everybody trauma informed. Um, in fact, one of our employees has become um, a TBRI um, facilitator, which is uh, stands for, and you know, I know this, but when I'm in front of a group of folks, then I totally forget um, what acronyms are, but it's trauma based um, recognition intervention. And so um, she plans on taking her knowledge out to the community free of charge to law enforcement, to court personnel, to uh, the community at large to help educate about all of us being trauma-informed before we deal with people. We should all know that instead of asking why did you do this, we should be saying what has happened to you that caused you to, to make that decision. Um, and it's really a refocusing of how we think. Um, so we have spent the year concentrating on, on that effort and I think that um, we have some um, national folks coming in from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges to do an assessment of our court system to determine how trauma-informed we truly are in, in all facets of our shareholders. Um, and they're coming in because we're part of um, an implementation site from the National Council. Um, and that will be later on this year, so hopefully next year we'll have some good information to share with everyone about our court system. Um, unfortunately, we don't get any ARPA money. It doesn't come down to us. Um, but we have managed, we don't really have a backlog, we don't have jury trials, so as soon as COVID hit, we were able to, you know, once we all figured out how to use electronics, we were able to pick up um, our cases and move them along. So we were very fortunate um, and again made me happy that we don't have to deal with juries in juvenile court because I know it's got to be very detrimental to the higher courts. Um, we also, what is new and exciting, I guess, for us is we had approval from um, the chief uh, superior court judge as well as the IT department. We are going to switch from ICON database to a juvenile court-based data system. It's called JCATS. Um, and it is specifically designed for uh, juvenile court work. It is funded by the Council of Juvenile Court Judges, um, so it's no cost to um, the county or to our court to switch to this database. Um, and um, the transfer of data is actually grant funded. So there's no cost to the county to switch to that programming. Um, we are very excited because we will be able to manipulate all kinds of data um, specifically and more accurately than what we've been able to do with ICON. Um, so, and I know that Commissioner Robinson mentioned the, um, the uh, data collection that we had done from the State um, Criminal Justice Committee uh, in regard to the, the, the disparity in our county um, in terms of arrests that come through juvenile court. 
Um, I wasn't going to spend much time on that. I'm certainly happy to talk. I know that we've briefly all talked about those uh, that information, but when we get into the JCAT system, we will be able to pull out much more in-depth and accurate information regarding um, what is going on in juvenile court. And that is connected also to our efforts at the trauma-informed system because that's what we need to be dealing with in order to try to fix the disparities that are happening across the country, as we all know. It's not just Douglas County. Um, we are not asking for anything additional this year. Um, again, you know, we, we really worked hard last year to get the things that we needed, and y'all really helped me be able to concentrate on what we needed to um, in terms of my caseload. Um, and just to mention, we do have now two accountability courts. We have the Family um, um, Accountability Court, which deals with the parents who have substance abuse and mental health issues and are at risk or have had their children removed to foster care. Um, we had a, just last week a big celebration, um, graduation, to recognize all of our graduates over COVID uh, because they didn't really get much of a graduation. So we had um, an opportunity in Citizens Hall to provide them with a real graduation um, and an opportunity to recognize those graduates. But I did just want to mention a couple of numbers um, in, res in respect to that. We've had um, a total since 2008 of 66 graduates. We've had over 180 participants. But what is the best part about it we have had today 22 drug-free babies born that have come through our system. So um, that was that's an exciting thing. We just had a newborn baby the other day. So, um, but what we started this year is a juvenile mental health court, um, which we call Chance Court to give a kid a chance. Um, and we just started in May, and we currently have eight participants, so we haven't had any graduates yet because it's a 12 to 18 month program. But it is, of course, based on the whole premise of accountability court um, process, a youth who has um, a qualifying diagnosis as well as a qualifying charge that brought them in juvenile court to begin with if they are appropriate and accepting to come into the court, uh, to the chance court, and if they meet the criteria, then they have an opportunity to um, complete the program, address them at their mental health needs, have the family intervention that needs to happen. You know, it's not just fix the kid and throw them right back into the environment where they came from. It's usually a family issue that needs repairing um, and so we try to use a holistic approach um, with evidence-based programming and make the changes that need to be made. Um, and once the youth graduates from that program, then their charges are, are dismissed. Um, so it's, um, and just to also mention that both of our accountability courts are totally grant funded. They are, we have state grants and federal grants for both of our um, accountability court. So um, we are very excited about starting our new uh, chance court. Hopefully when we have a graduation, which I anticipate sometime next calendar year, we will um, certainly invite everyone to come to that graduation. Um, the other significant thing um, is that we are, are asking, and I believe we have approval to move out of the court budget <laughs> the oversight over um, our conflicts and contract lawyers to the public, the juvenile public defender's office um, in an effort to try to set ourselves up similar to how the adult system operates. Um, there's no additional monies that are, are going between and Ms. Gordon, who is our juvenile public defender, she's got an opportunity later on to talk and she may have some issues with that. Um, but that will also take a large administrative burden off of juvenile court to have to regulate um, our attorneys. Uh, the only big thing that may uh, that we may have to ask for at some point in time to just sort of put y'all, I guess, on notice is right now juvenile court is not required to do e-filing. 
defiling is a superior court um, requirement and um, under rule superior court rule 36.16 um, they have to provide that opportunity to the public they collect fees from doing that um, and juvenile court is not set up well first there's not a mandate on us yet to do that um, and juvenile court is not set up to collect fees and generally our population is all indigent um, the jcats program does have a component to it that is applicable for e -filing. Um, we have sort of, since COVID hit, our court system has kind of figured out a way to uh, superficially provide e-filing by through email, um, which I think a lot of courts have done that don't have actual e-filing. But I sit on the uh, rules committee for our council of juvenile court judges, and one thing we will be talking about this year is a rule requiring juvenile courts to provide e-filing. Um, we have talked to JCATS about having that um, ability to, to um, add that to the JCATS database system down the road, and um, they have provided us with information that it is a $100,000 one-time fee that covers everything. They create the system um, and provide it to the court, and um, there are no additional costs ever. So it, it may be at some point in time that if juvenile court does get under the mandate of e-filing that we will have to be asking specifically for that. But right now the current um, cost for that component of JCATS is 100000 We did put that in as a BIR, um, but it's not something that we have to have this particular year because we're not under a mandate yet. Um, and that's really all that juvenile court has to present. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Again, though, we are very thankful for the assistance that we have um, received in the past and look forward to going forward. Okay. Thank you so much, Judge Harrison. Any questions? Commissioner uh, Geider, you have a poll? Yes, Judge Harrison, uh, the $100,000, if they're going to write that module, or that software for that module, Everybody's going to be able to use it, so it's going to be a hundred thousand per account. For yeah, it, if you have, if you use JCAS, there are other. Um, I think Odyssey is what Superior Court uses. Am I right? You I don't e-file anything, so I don't know. So you don't know, but there's different companies. It's just that the JCAS provides that component for access to e-filing that has that one charge. I don't, I would assume that it is comparable to other. I guess that maybe I didn't express it right. Okay. Uh, maybe I every county that's, uh, that has the JCAT, is it JCAT or J JCATS. Cat. okay. The JCAT program. Once they write that module, that software for that module, then it's accessible to all the counties that have it. So maybe it's a $100,000 for anybody that's owned it, a one-time fee. That could be. I just know that the information yeah. that we gathered directly from Canon Solutions was that it was $100 for them to create the system specifically for your county. Okay. But you might just check a little further. And sometimes it's just the terminology they use and right. they use. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I yield back. Yeah, no, I want to piggyback on that. And, but again, no different than we as elected officials. Uh, you know, yeah, our financial supports out there. Somebody, like, yeah, got that contract. And just like with this, that double IC, you know, I'm looking at this like, yeah, I'm going to design things. Ooh, different, one time Plus, I'm going to make this. What we part? Somebody to stay with that it's occurring. I know I'm looking at it, so I'm okay if that's where you want to go. My point being is this. We, we started with this technological solution or, or ideology that we need to have one flavor, icon. Now we're recognizing that these judges that have their own discretion believe the way they want to move their courts. We need to have our own add-ons. 
we need to have a little independence, a little, you know, it's like a fixed income versus equity. And so what I'm looking at, like, okay, now, uh -huh. uh -huh. and I support this. Um, the need for you to have your unique way to capture the data to run your work. There needs to be a commonality to all of them. And I don't think we're necessarily trying to get into how you rule your world, but um, from a board perspective, it's important that as we are providing support for five, six, seven boards, we got to give them a little, a little wiggle room. As long as we can get access to the data, as long as we can be consistent from a platform perspective. But I'm watching how this evolved, and I'm looking at some debate is more intense to not to expand versus others. I don't see consistency, but I'm glad to hear that hopefully there'll be some, 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 some understanding on this one. And I'd like they should be all that these guys who are judicial, statutory, and constitutional have some degree of autonomy. It's our job to back up and see the whole picture and synchronize everything. So I, just, I had to make that for the record. Um, um, I, I really did. Right now, I think that's what, at least from my perspective, that treatment of all y'all are equal. Can't be personal. That gets in the way of doing what's right for the greater good. And I just, I, again, I'm trying to leave this, I'm gonna leave on the right, right tone, like, no, God, y'all do better than this. We retreat and consistently across. These guys are trying to deliver services to the public. Uh -huh. right, and so I, I appreciate her bringing this forth. And so I'll yield to my colleagues that are you know, driving the technology committees and so forth. But I look forward to seeing this on the other side. That's all I got to say, Mr. Sure Chair. I yield. Thanks. Thank you so much, Judge Carson. Very good job. Next, we have um, Sheriff Pounds and then Kim Thomas. Sheriff, you're going to start with the open remarks and then go in. If you come up as well, that you can come. I know you have a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Jeff, you need a mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the board for me for the stuff. Some of the things that my department need. And uh, I, I can tell you everything that my department needs. Because I know what we need. <laughs> but Chief can break it down on this little board here where y'all can understand it because you ain't gonna understand what I'm gonna tell you in the way I'm gonna tell you. So I'm gonna let Chief break it down slowly so y'all can understand it. And then when he finished, and I feel. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning Chief. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is go over some uh, crime stats, the 10 year crime stats, uh, homicides, so you can see that. I'm going to stand over here. So that you can see, um, you know, there's a, there's a gradual increase. 20, the, the last line is projected 23. The second to the last is projected 2022 in here. Um, you can add one to to that, to 22. We just had one, and uh, thankfully to a great investigative team, we solved it and had very little evidence, and three people did dust it this time. Happened last week. <clears throat> Rates, they're up and down. Um, as you can tell, there's nothing really big about that robbery. But it's pretty significant. You can see the difference from going in from 2019 to 2020. Uh, and I, I related to COVID. You had a dramatic drop for whatever reason, uh, and then it started to gradually come back out of, the, of COVID. Aggravated assaults have stayed pretty well the same, consistent for a while. Larcenies. There again, 2018-2019, uh, it dropped dramatically. Uh, uh, sometime around in there, there was a changeover with the state reporting system, and that may be some some crimes may have went on one UCR and and, and kind of just it, it's having to work itself out now over the last few years. <clears throat> Auto thefts, uh, you can see a pretty significant increase starting in about 2018. There again, that could be, you know, it's pretty because it's pretty consistent across the last few years. Back to that that change in the reporting status of some of the stuff. Internados, we like to throw that one in. Fairly consistent, 
since 2019. Arsons, they're they're kind of like hit or miss. You know, it's just those are those are an odd crime. Burglaries, there again, you notice 2019 to 2020, significant drop. I relate it to people's at home. Their the house is not getting burglarized as much. The numbers dropped. Uh, some workload indicators, traffic enforcement. Um, you can see it's consistently going up. Um, we have one thing we have noticed is with during COVID that uh, and then the lack of manpower on the street, the, the traffic violations have increased. I'm sure everybody's probably seen a lot more crazy driving here lately. And uh, and that, that's something we'd like to, all, a lot of our traffic enforcement the units have been moved to patrol just to cover and answer calls and be able to, uh, to, to continue to provide services to the county. Um, traffic exits slowly increased but one significant thing is the Georgia State Patrol is, is doing as, as bad as we are with with employees and so guess what back in the 2000s when I was on patrol and uh, right when Bill Miller taken over office and during when I worked on Tommy Waldrop the Georgia State Patrol handled all the wrecks in Douglas County now they they didn't do the ones in the city but now that burden is cast upon us um, I, I say we work 95% of the wrecks now. They're, they're not available to answer uh, in a timely manner. So we go ahead and have started working. So that's, a, that's an increase. It, it don't show it really in the numbers because we didn't, we wasn't keeping up with them because we wasn't working. But that's a, that's a burden we've been put upon. You kind of see back in 2020 with the court cases, how it dropped and then 2021 it picked back up. Uh, court services, it's kind of average daily population, uh, 2020 drop down, we clean the jail out, let as many uh, non-violent offenders out as we could, try to lower the, the risk for the county for the COVID cases inside the jail, and uh, it's starting to creep it back up. It's, uh, I think, uh, it was 700 or something yesterday, I think, Sherry. 712. Uh, but consistently, uh, 650 average for the year. Uh, warrants and civils, uh, you can see the, you know, during 2021-22, it's pretty low. We wasn't doing them because we wasn't putting folks out and doing a lot of legal uh, civil cases. Now it's uh, picking back up and we expect it to continue. Transport, same again, it's heading back north. Uh, Prisoner transports. Law enforcement calls for service. Uh, we're estimating 59,000 calls for service, and out of those, 8,000 were complaint reports, and 6,000 roughly were incidents that have to be investigated. So you see, there's a, a, a lot amount of time answering other calls other than things that generate a report, unlocking cars, and you know, maybe a suspicious car, that sort of thing that is not really reported. Uh, inmate worker program, uh, y'all know it's down. Uh, we hadn't been able to provide those. The, um, the officers that were worked those details are now working in the jail to help, help uh, cover the shortfall. Uh, going back to the five year strategic plan, I love this, glad y'all had it done because the citizen said number one is public safety. Um, and 55% and of that said for, uh, for public safety and 71% said to increase the budget for first responders, more personnel and equipment. That's what the county wants. That's what the citizens want. That's what they voted. And I like to remind that. All right. Judge McLean, I'm going to need your uh, nice pretty picture at the end <laughs> after this hiring and retention. 52 vacant open positions. We got up to 68 this year. Uh, we had a hiring uh, weekend hiring um, fair and uh, we had almost roughly 100 people apply, um, but uh, we got a few, but we're still 52. Now, those ones we've gotten is not the folks that we've gotten in the past. I sent out y'all all an article uh, that was just in the, the uh, newspaper this morning about uh, the quality of applicants you're getting. Not say that standards are lower, but they are lower. 
All right, so, uh, you know, we went to Allen Beers just to help try to retain people. Um, we've, uh, uh, trying to think of some other things. Uh, we did the, the hire bonus at one time, um, but, you know, the, the applicants that you get today, and all y'all know, aren't the ones you got then, and they don't have the same work ethic. Uh, but, so, six in patrol, five investigators, 25 jailers. Now, this jail was built to have at least four people on each floor. We only have enough for two on each floor, and that's when we're full. And then now we're 25 short of that, so we're struggling. At one point, the sheriff had, to, the people were getting burnt out, the sheriff had to implement double time. We, for a month, we paid double time just for people to work the jail. And it worked for about three weeks, and then they got burnt out from that, and we couldn't pay people double time to come work in the jail. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, court services, which all pertains to y'all security, uh, 12 positions down. Now, have we still been running court the way we used to and having to transport inmates and and uh, do all that when it wasn't, wasn't virtual, I don't know what we do. But, uh, uh, so that's, that's there. Um, showing you this time last year versus now. Last year we was 48, we're at 52 now. So even though we got up to 68, 68, we've gotten back down to 52. We're really only, what, three, four positions? More than what we had this time last year. Um, we've already kind of went over all those numbers. All right, so the things that we've asked for Department 280, 280 is the law enforcement side. Um, last year, y'all um, voted in a 5% increase. Uh, well, the sheriff's going to ask for an additional 5%, and I'll show you why. Uh, asking for 15 Tahoes, those will be allocated to patrol. We need three training vehicles, five investigator vehicles, at 1.9. Now, Department 281 is basically the constitutional duties of the sheriff, which is the uh, warrants and the jail and all, and, and, our, and everything that kind of encompasses that. That's uh, additional 5% on top of 5%. Um, we talked about a chiller refurbish. Uh, I believe Commissioner Robinson said y'all are working on something that on the county level that we may be able to piggyback off of. Uh, two maintenance vehicles, two civilian, uh, civil division Tahoes, two warrant vehicles, the, uh, the building cleaning. I don't know that our building and the windows have been cleaned in about, in, well, at least five years. Um, and now it's to a point where the anchors on the roof have to be tested by weight loads before they'll even allow anybody to repel over to, to wash them. So, uh, the building has to be maintained and it's starting to get run down on the outside. There's white stuff seeping out of the bricks and, and it, it's, it looks, it, and then you try to hire somebody, you know, they come up to the front of the building and it looks, you know, we're doing the best we can do. Uh, we talked about the main power room. So we've got a, a, a room in the jail that houses where the, the main power comes in and where all our servers are stored. One, one, basically one room. Well, when they designed this building, they put water suppression. So water, electricity, and servers do not match. They don't, they don't even mingle. So um, what they did is they cut the water off and put in a valve so that water wasn't always um, charged in those lines inside this room. Well, we've had a lot of power um, surges and, and it's messed up that, that switch they put in there and several times it's it's charged that line over this electric electricity and everything and it's very dangerous so right now it's cut off uh, so we're looking to have the proper fire suppression system installed in there at roughly eighty thousand um, uh, dollars this other little stuff we need you know we cook for inmates cook every day two meals a day so things start to tear up ten years in the building so they need a new kitchen fryer. All right, so the vehicle replacement, I'll go over it real quick. 
Currently, this is the entire fleet. 51% or 131 of the vehicles are over 100,000 miles. And that is including the, the Tahoe's that we've got the year before last. So 21% or 54 or 50 to 100, 28% or 70 or less than 50,000. We've got 255 vehicles in the fleet. Uh, just to show you the difference between 21 and 22, we've gained some on the low end, but the high end is getting wider. So the cars over 100,000 miles are getting more, even though we've, we're, we're narrowing this yellow gap, but uh, the fleet's starting to age. Uh, so that was the entire fleet. Now we're just gonna specifically talk about the patrol fleet. So 39% or 39 of the vehicles are over 100,000 miles. 20%, 20 of the vehicles, 50 to 100 and 41% or 41 or less than 50. And those, those numbers also include the new Tahoes. So when we get new cars in, I, I put some pictures up last year, and we'll do it again this year, of how we have to strip the cars down to bare enough and then we crush the shell. Uh, we're stealing parts to make cars work. So um, the ones, if we get replacement vehicles, then the ones that now it's got over 100,000 miles are gonna be handed down. So. It's just kind of a, a recycling process, but we're not gonna have, it's not like you're gonna get a bunch of cars off the road because they're gonna replace ones that have got even more mileage in other divisions like the jail uh, super, supervisor staff. So there's just a graphic of the patrol so you can kind of see. In 22, we got the Tahoe, we've had the Tahoe, so the, the, the large section of green is, is the good vehicles and then yellow and then red is of course where we need it to be replaced. If we got the vehicles we asked for in the proposed action of uh, improvements core, uh, the BRs, this is what we plan to change. Um, so listed in order by age of the vehicle and by mileage. And um, so a 24, so this vehicle's on patrol is 2014 with 150,000 miles. Uh, those are a rough 150,000 miles. Um, so it kind of goes down, the training vehicles you see, I put this in because I know that y'all are viewing it before, you can kind of go over the data, but that's what we would be looking to replace with the ones that we've asked for this year. Uh, that's the 281 vehicles, um, the maintenance vehicles. All right, on the salary increases. We've got 266 total sworn deputies and jailers and 52 vacancies, that's almost 19 and a half percent of, of the staff in those areas that are that are not available to us um, there's 111 total jail officers 25 acres 22 percent of our force we don't have and in patrol um, the six vacancies plus the other 12 that's assigned to other areas is 20 percent so you know when you look at the numbers what what is the the, the people that are, you know, the jailers and the officers on the road, you're basically looking at a 20% deficit in, in the workforce. Last 12 months, we've gained 57, but we've lost 49. We're not making a whole lot of traction in this mud. We're, we're spinning our wheels. Um, that's just a graphic showing kind of a, how it's up and down with the with the, with the uh, people leaving and, and the hiring, but the one before it kind of really plays out. This is where I really want to get to the nuts and bolts. The ACCG says these are the metro counties. Like it or not, we are Cobb, we are Douglas, we are Cherokee, we are Forsyth. We're Metro Atlanta. And if you look at the numbers, I believe we're third from the bottom in Sally. One, two, three. Right now, we're third from the bottom of all those counties in salaries. So we got a rough looking building, we've got low salaries compared to other agencies, and nobody wants to be in law enforcement. I heard something mentioned that uh, y'all had an office job in the air condition making $50,000 a year that you couldn't get nobody to apply for it. It's set vacant. Well, strap on a gun, put on a badge and a, and a vest, and go out, go deal with the weather. We've got hurricane winds coming. 
We got the flood we dealt with in 09. It's not comparable. And nobody wants to do it anymore. So out of all this, highs and lows, the average salary for those areas in Metro Atlanta is 52,644. Those are the breakdowns of the numbers that I provided for the particular counties and the cities. Uh, we're at 48,352. 53. The average was 52. Now in 2023, with the 5% that was already approved, brings us up to 5771. We're already behind what they're at now. They're going into their budget going for higher numbers and we're still trying to catch up with where they're at today so the, the when i asked rosin for the numbers it was a five percent that was already approved and i said go ahead and put another five percent on top of that so it was compounded i took and so she gave me the uh, 1.33 three for the whole department so if you take that 1.3 what i did is just said forget the stacking took 10 percent out the gate and it'll actually be less money, but it'll be less than the 1.3. But it'll bring up the starting debt to the 53,189, which is only $544 a year above the average that the counties are making right now. So um, I think that's pretty reasonable, especially with what we're experiencing um, and given the other Metro Atlanta counties. Now, with the jailer right now, they're at 43. So one thing I noticed in doing my research was a lot of these other jurisdictions, usually a deputy's up here, they got a gun, they're on the street, they're fighting, you know, the, 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 the street. The, the, the jailers were down here. They weren't, they weren't considered. What you're noticing now is they're closing that gap. And so, I've noticed that if if a if an agency is at fifty, then it's usually about a three to five thousand dollar difference to the jailers. So ours is a little bit more gap. Um, and just like I said before, we couldn't get deputy. They you know the jail's a rough area, you know, rough job to do. You're locked in, you're dealing with, with inmates and they've got needs and, and uh, you know you don't get fresh air and so uh, it's a harder job. And I bet if we pay the jailers the same as we pay the deputies, that you're still gonna have trouble getting folks. But so I, I think the gap needs to be closed. We need to look at doing a, a great jump between the, uh, a jailer to a deputy. Uh, but that's, uh, we gotta get things right. So we talked about Metro Atlanta. I just wanna show you some numbers from around the state of Georgia that I found. LaGrange way outside is 55. Banks County, North Georgia, 52. Glenn County, 49.9, which is more than we're making now. Flower Branch at 50. Winder at 52. So outside of Metro Area Counties, you've got other ones that are starting to, to, to get in on the, on the hype because they, they've got to get people and they're having to, they're having to. One thing I've noticed, I do a lot of Facebook, we, I'm seeing a lot of sponsored ads from Texas. Um, there's one from California, South Carolina, Florida. They're really, they're targeting the whole nation right now. Um, it's not like what we used to do, your hometown. They're bringing people in, they're reaching out real far trying to get people to come uh, to work for them. Uh, we lost a guy to Brookhaven he was an investigator, came here from Colorado, he used to work here. He left and went to Brookhaven. We've got another one in the application process going to Brookhaven. Um, but these, these, you know, I know we can't compete $68,000, but you know, if there's, if we close a little bit, I think we may be able to retain some of them that we got more. Uh, this is the same slide from last year, some things that were, they were offered in different areas. Um, and the article this morning, if you look at it, they, there's one agency was paying $40,000 hiring bonus. Now, that wasn't around here, but what they, what they were saying was, 
If I paid that forty thousand dollars and I get a certified officer that's already trained and he come come in and just about from day one hit the streets and going, versus me having to get somebody that's new off the street, send them through mandate, send them through FTO program, and then start letting them get a little bit of experience, it takes a good year. That's even just getting the green officer after all the training. So they're willing to pay up front to get those certified officers in and then uh, build up their force real quick. But the problem I find with that is your current employees are like, well, what about us? You know, I mean, what you gonna do for us? And so the hiring bonuses, in my opinion, cause a, a problem unless you're gonna do a retention bonus as well. Um, to, to, to make them feel like they're valued and gonna, you know, gonna, gonna be around for a while. Uh, that black cloud in the room, black three. Uh, it's not on our VR. It's three, three and a half million dollars. Y'all know it's a problem. Um, we're hoping towards the SPLOS. But once again, um, running Windows 7, and it's got to the point now, you know, there's a whole fourth floor that we're not even using yet, which, you know, we talked about earlier, which is great for expansion, and we build for expansion, but they're having to take the cameras off this floor and replace the ones down here because you can't get them fixed no more. So we're robbing from the fourth floor to make these work, and eventually we're going to run out of cameras, and it's just a matter of time for there's an uh, update that's sent out that Windows 7 can't handle and the system's gonna be, this, we're gonna crash one day. Uh, just wanna you know, bring that up, keep it on the forefront because it's a major problem at the jail. Sure. Uh, yes, ma'am. We got 10% right? last year and 5% this year. Well, when you say last year, you're talking about this year. It's just this yes. year. 2022, those are 10%, and 2023 is approved for 5%. Uh, I thought you kept saying 5%. Right. We're asking for another 10, not 5 and 5, but that's a straight 10. You're asking for a 10% for next year. Next 2023, year. yes. Okay, instead of the 5. The 5 is approved. There's a you want 10% five. on top of the 5? 10% total. I just thought it would be easier and a little more cost effective. So additional 5? Five. 5, right. Okay. But you don't, you know, if you stack it, it's going to be more. We're fine with the straight 10 because it gets too involved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Um, to staff, things like you got operational safety um, and that sprinkler system in. I, I had a chance to visit that. That's, that's unacceptable. Uh, we need to address that accordingly. Uh, we do have it, uh, so put that down. The HVAC, uh, we could get, I only want to get into it because of what it stands for. I talked to the chief about the matter to the deputy. Um, and as always, to cameras, yes, deal with that, but other funding sources. Um, Obviously, when I, when I hear about the salary, and again, this is why I have um, our HR director that says, like, yeah, guys, we know what, you know, public safety is first, the board, you know, I was willing to advocate for us to be like military, you got a separate budget on top of one mill, get out the way. Strictly for public safety. We didn't want to take it up like that. But we did entertain it, at least. I mean, I, I got no support, didn't want to talk about it. But, but please, we, we're supportive of this, but this, this ain't gonna go away. You know, I appreciate the data points. I mean, you're a man after my own heart with that data. That, that, that's what I'm talking about. <coughs> right. We use data to support our arguments. We use metrics when we want to. But I get it. And again, it's, it's yeah, you can't keep up, but you, you, you got to do something. Now, have we had a tier and a structure along the way? Here we are on deck, like, okay, now I got to wake up for a duration that didn't plan for the fact that people would age out. The, the succession. And so, um, and I'm teaching when you get, get this HR study, we're talking about make sure these are these are these are serious things. Like, okay, what are we gonna do? Now, again, one time you ask for ten percent into my board. This is ARPA money. This ain't reoccurring against 
recurring expenses. And I appreciate the 52 open positions. And I heard him say what he said. 5749 sounds like a net difference. In other words, but then we get into the quality of the person. Well, life is changing, guys. Until you get the robocops, it is what it is. And people who want to take up these jobs, I'm going to make it more honorable. And what it is, I mean, I get it. And I support whatever it takes uh, to try to you know, deal with that. I mean, it's a tough job. I got to keep real with every environment. I get it. It is easy. It's water hoses. I mean, it's just as dangerous. But this young generation ain't playing. They ain't scared. And for that, I appreciate it. I will always support the sheriff. Like, okay, guys, whatever y'all want to do. But the board has to be willing to take it serious. I get it. What about everybody else? It's a balancing act. But it's easy for me because it's what the public said. That's why I was willing to go one meal for all public safety, period. That's what y'all said. Okay, fine. Yeah, I know it's going to cost you, right? But if that's what you asked for, since you're not fine, I did what you asked me for. So I, I, I don't feel bad about that decision for one meal. Because again, this ain't going to go away, guys. You think about what we're saying here. This is, this is, this is going to be key to our budget right now. We're going to feel this. And I have no problem with it. But let's take that up uh, according to respect. We do have that list of, um, of what we're going to um, advocate for, or at least part of the, the legislative package. That is back on the table. We're going to see what the board's going to do about it. It's a political decision, up or down, yes or no. Uh, it ain't that you got to step. You already know the data. They've been talking about this. Last thing is relates to the cars. And we don't ask flaws. Because, all right, so for, the, for, the, for my, my um, finance director, in about 45 days, we'll know yes or no whether or not uh, we have a different funding source. If we do, the goal as a number one commitment by this board is to replace the sheriff's entire weight. 16 million. It's in the record, please. We'll tell you where to go look at the record. That's one path. So I'd like to have the budget prepared that says, okay, if this happens, then everything that he just talked about as far as that tip back now, move that because now it's going to get taken care of over here. Right? So you got to have two paths when it comes to the sheriff regarding that. But that's a big, big chunk. And if it in fact lost that path, Ooh. Welcome to the party. All right, we're going to be funding capital expenditures on top of salary that needs to be reoccurring. So anyway, I just wanted to, for my staff who are new here, you guys here, we put that on the tab, we take up the finance um, committee. And that's all I did. Thanks, guys. I'm, I, I got what you I'm good. Well, I'm going to kind of implement a little bit on what uh, Commissioner Brooks was talking about. Yes, sir. Salary-wise, and I know my little boom tree, and I understand this board has been really comfortable with asking for things. You don't get it, but you can tell you, you can at least go ask for it. And since time I've been 40, 50 thousand now these kids ain't studying that books. They ain't studying that kind of money. Now you go to McDonald's and make fifty thousand dollars starting off. And here you expect my folks to risk their life for fifty thousand dollars. They ain't gonna do that no more. You gonna have to pay for real, live, true debit. Now you get them dirt road debt to come out here and just after a paycheck, you get them kind, but you're likely end up putting them in jail. Well, yeah. they're gonna do something they have no business doing to turn you back. I want a guy that's dedicated. Everybody can't be a police officer. You can't. It's, it's, it's kind of like a calling. Right. And then and them that ain't called ain't got a business in it. I'd be surprised how I many I arrested because it ain't like it used to be. We keep trying to give them this $40,000 to get them out here to go to work. And they come to get this little $40,000, but they're going to try to figure out a way to add to that 40000 which is illegal. But we know money don't grow on trees. I understand that there. And like I said before I started the conversation, y'all have been fair with us. But now it's going to come a time where we got to quit bullshit. You got to quit. And so they got the hat because it's, I was elected for a job. I can't do that job. It's kind of like having enough tools in a toolbox. You can't take an engine out of a car if you got no tools to take it out with. And they, this shortage I got is 52 short. They ain't got a lot to do with COVID. That's got to do with they ain't gonna come out here for the pennies that we offering them. You're gonna have to just do like Commissioner Keller said. If we got to get out of it, we ain't got the money. You're going to have to find it from somewhere. Because police ain't going away. 
Social media helped us look bad if they could make us look. And now nobody want to do it, and they definitely don't want to do it for the penalty that we offer them to do this job. So as a commissioner board, I know. And I feel like y'all gonna come together as a whole and we're gonna help us fix our problem with this salary in Douglas County. And one more thing what Kelly said about the cars, I agree with that, Kelly. We always hope the spots to pass on the car car wise thing that you talked about. But Kevin, you said something a little early. And I got to straighten this out and I'm gonna sit down and anybody got some questions for me. And I don't know where it's coming from. It's more African African American being arrested than any of the others. I don't know where they come from, but I'm gonna prove it's a lie. But I don't know where it originated out of. Do anybody in this room know where it originated from? Judge Harris's report, the juvenile. You didn't order that report. No, it's nationwide. No, it ain't nationwide. We applied for a grant that was to pay people to come in and take our data and run a report on juvenile court. Okay, so it is just Douglas County. Yes. Get the report, get some report. We'll stop. I, I, I'll let you go. That I prove y'all that that ain't what happened by no means. I, I did that. I thought y'all pulled it. Information pulled out of icon. Yeah. You can, make, you can make anything out of that kind of information. You can make what you want to make out of them numbers. But needless to say, I'm here for any kind of question anybody got. Okay. okay. Do you have any kind of a sign up on this? We, we, we tried that because we tried what the same thing as other officers tried with 40,000. We tried a sign on bonus that was equal to them going to mandate school, getting out of mandate school, riding this extra 12 weeks, and what it would be for paying them doing all that time and paying for the mandate. I think we offered 5,000. It was 7,500. 7,500 bonus. So that's about what it takes for you to get them in back on the street with the actual film vehicle by themselves. So we offered that, but I think we had one. One person applied for it. I don't think we had any that, that actually got the... I didn't say get, I said apply. Okay, so that, that didn't work. That didn't work. Okay, because it, it seems to be working in the fire department. With a clawback. If they quit, uh, you know, they guarantee they're going to work for us for three years. The other day you, was te you were telling me that they get to a certain stage and they say, this works too hard. I'm leaving. <laughs> it, somebody mentioned earlier, it just ain't the same no more. It just not the same. And I catch myself doing this, and I also instruct my folks to do the same thing. When I first started police, they could come in and tell you what they wanted you to do and expect you to do. Now you got to ask them. You get just the least little bit side, they leave. They leave. Did you have any response from the fair, job there? Did you actually sign on any? Now that job was went well. That went well. I asked Sam about that about two days ago. She says really about 26 that she actually believes going to become employee of the Davis County Sheriff's Department out of that job there. Okay. That's good. Good news. That's all. Yeah. So I know you talked about the, you know, you having to lax some requirements. The sheriff talked about, you know, they get a little sideways and, and it's just not the same workforce. Then what will it take? Because we get those seventy thousand dollars out there, but if you're not going to retain the people, or people going to get sideways, and they going to do stuff that's not right, what what will it take? Because the only way we can fund you is by what they raise in the military. Otherwise, we have to start every other department in here. Give y'all what y'all need. I understand that. I understand that. So you gotta help us help you. Dan, I, I think I think boils down to quality of people. Y'all were talking about earlier about uh, we're going to you know, discuss and pay in more. Somebody's got a college education. Um, so if you if you pay forty eight thousand, you're going to get a forty eight thousand dollar employee. You know, if you pay sixty seven, you're going to get a sixty or seventy thousand dollar employee. And I think that the, you know, it's, it's not looking at it as a, you know, a retention, but more of a, you know, 
I'm gonna be honest, we scraped from the bottom of the barrel. Out of all those 26 people, I was there both days, and I saw one that come in talking about, he's gonna make a good law enforcement officer. The other ones, we have potential, we're hoping, but it's not the same. Used to, the, you know, all 26, when we vet them, we knew that they're gonna be good, and they're gonna be long time employees. And most of us started out when, when I was 20, Chair Mel, 21. But pretty much the command staff there all started when they were 20 years old. Uh, and it's been there that entire time. Um, you know, with any job now, you've got a lot of people who's just kind of jumping ship, looking for the most money. Um, That's it, following the dog. But, following the dog. And then we've had some do that. So I don't know if you can completely stop that, but if you're, if you're more in the ball game, instead of sitting on the sidelines, then you got a better chance of retaining those better, you know. And, and a lot of the departments in their ads, I'll tell you, we're looking for the best. We're paying sixty-eight thousand dollars because we want the best, and and that's kind of where I think you're late. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Again, it does get into culture, right? So we get you in the game. If I get you in the house, can I keep you in the house? I got you the job. You in here. But now, what about the stair steps that my career over time? As culture is structural, back to. Not make HR. We need to think through those things. Hey, we're just about just getting in the game. But then how do you maintain them? This attitude just like lead to people because of lack of leadership. Like I don't like my boss. That's okay, but are y'all speaking like them? Are y'all already nurturing them? Not yeah, I don't know what it means to, to run what y'all doing. I know like I couldn't do it, so I respect like whatever y'all take is what y'all have to do. I respect that. But it has to be more structured in long term. You just again to point, I spot you in, I get you in there. But, but are you going to be able to keep it? Is it the right atmosphere in which I feel supported? Right? It's the right growth opportunity. It's just, as I'm, am I being treated one way because I wasn't born here versus I, I migrated here? Is everybody created in such a way that after those, I have advancement, that I have opportunities to go on, that I can one time become a lieutenant or a colonel or wherever in fact, no disrespect to the or order beyond just being the first man in. Uh, but if there is, Again, the, thing, the system is aged out 30 years. You've been 40 years, right? It's aged out, guys, done. We're talking about two generations done. Now we gotta go to the, we're gonna last this for the next 40 years. So we're at a tipping point. It's an inflection point. We've inherited this problem. Everybody's retiring. A lot of you guys are retiring. We're at the end of the system. Now it's time to restructure and talk about going forward. And it's gonna be a redevelopment, like right? a house or a community. We're going to, have to redevelop this thing. This is not just going to be a one time. It's got to be thoughtful. And I think that study that we're going to do is going to help us. But I just want to acknowledge the fact that yeah, we want to make a hard decision. Everybody should get a plate, but, but you want to deal with this because everybody wants safety, and it's going to cost what it's going to cost. And if that's what the citizens ask for, I have no problem with making that decision. You know, I love them. I can be like, we appreciate it, man. You know, they they may pull us over, but we we want it safe. So your reputation is still such that, okay, the only thing I think we got is the reputation of Douglas County. Like, yeah, but we didn't have a reputation, guy. They can feed on you. We're vulnerable, so I appreciate it. Like, I ain't playing with this. I'm not playing with y'all on this topic. So I appreciate you, Sheriff. And again, it'll be up to the board to tell me what they're going to do. Yes. How are you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Very good presentation. And also, next, we have lunch. Oh. Yes, sir. But no. I'll just go ahead and say, whether you run now, but I go. No, no, no. <laughs> they be hungry. No, but what I did here is, uh, you said instead of a 5% increase, 10%, correct? Oh, yeah, total. Total, total. Did y'all? Yeah, it's a five that the board's already yeah, approved. And, now and you asked for additional five. Yes, yeah. you can make a note of that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, I, I, I'm done. If anybody got any questions for me, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask. You just told me what you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Your seats, as soon as possible, please. Judge Kim, are you ready? Okay, you have it. You have the floor when you come up there. Commissioners? Thank you.
ads for some of the new finance ladies. Uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about magistrate court so you'll know something about it. It was started in, back in 1983 statewide. Um, we do civil and criminal court. Uh, we have a lot of civil cases. We have, um, back in 2019, we had 10,700 civil cases that we do, you know, in a year. And uh, we have criminal cases. Most criminal cases start in the magistrate court. We issue the warrants, we issue the search warrants, we do the bond hearings, and we do the preliminary hearings. So the beginning of all of the criminal cases, just about all of them starts in a magistrate court. Now, Dean Warren, uh, I usually issue most of the search warrants, and of course, those Superior Court judges do too. But I think they've really been coming to me a lot. <laughs> For, the city has for a lot of those search words. You feel like the happiest? Well, the weekend, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do handle so many search words. The search words have gone up tremendously because they're you know, a good method now to try to solve you know, crime. So we are doing a lot more search words. Um, on our civil cases, uh, some of the cases that we handle the most are small claims and dispossessories. As all of y'all know, the dispossessories, you know, they're high, they're, they're keep going up and up. And we're expecting a lot more next year. Um, most, as you know, the dispossessories were, in a way, they were stopped. We weren't putting people out of the house there for a while, but we were still having the hearings on it. So a lot of cases settled and things like that. Um, there's been some federal money that's being paid in, in those, uh, those dispossessories, which is good and it's starting to come in, but it's taken a long, long time. The, um, some people that qualify, like say they've lost their job, they can get some federal you know, care money but it's taken so long for the for the government to pay that, and and you know sometimes people will apply, and it may take six, seven, eight months for them to get their money. Well, a lot of these big apartments, they've actually figured out if they'll let the people stay, they'll probably get their money in the long run. So the big apartments are sometimes able to do things that the small homeowners are not able to do. The landlords, if they just have a house, a lot of those landlords have sold their houses now. So there's not as many places for people to live that get dispossessed because, you know, the market was up, they could get a good bit of money, and to tell you the truth, the landlords, they got pretty mad because there were people living in their houses for a year or two <laughs> and, and, and they weren't getting their, their rent. They just couldn't afford it. And so now what's happened is rent has gone up literally just even for a mobile home. Rent's gone up everywhere at least three to four hundred dollars a month, you know, and people just can't afford that. So well, the sad part is when people do have to move out, where are they going to go, you know? Uh, because a lot of the houses that they were in are gone, they can't get that anymore. And then the, uh, the apartments have gone up in price. <coughs> so um, I'm expecting, you know, with this economy and all, I'm expecting that next year the dispossessors are really going to skyrocket. That's just, that's what we're all thinking, is they're really going to go way up, you know. And then, uh, on the civil cases, I think they're going to go way up next year in our court because a lot of the cases that we do are, like say, credit card cases or loans where people have gotten credit cards or loans and they're not able to pay them and they don't pay them. And so those, those are filed in our court. And uh, we, have, we, file, we have cases in our court for $15,000 or less. Now, our dispossessory cases, that's unlimited jurisdiction. So it could be really high. Like you could, like when the mall first opened, they used to file their dispossessories in our court, you know. Uh, one thing about it, though, is I think they quit doing that because they can actually be appealed a lot easier from our court to Superior State Court. So I think, like, say the mall, I think they realize that they might as well just go up to Superior Court to begin with so that the appeals won't be going up. But anyway, so every year I pretty much ask for the same thing. And I know we all do. Yeah, we all do. So since 1995, I've been up here asking for these things. Um, our 
just, just like everybody else, our clerks need some more money, and that's just the bottom line. And um, right now, y'all gave us a, a good bit of money last year, and I appreciate that because that got our ladies up for making like 29, 30,000. So now the beginning magistrate court clerk pay is 35,000. That's not much. And so we're losing people. You know, people don't like to work for 35,000. It's hard as they're working in magistrate court because they have that huge caseload. And, um, and like I said, we have courts every single day. So we're trying to get some money. I think it was 42,000 there to be divided out among our clerks. So we have 10 clerks. And we're having a little bit of a hard time. We have two leave because they can find a job working for a lot more money, you know, somewhere else. And so they leave. We get them trained, you know, they're there for a few years and they leave. And I know that's everybody. That's the whole courthouse. So uh, we are asking for some more money, like 42,000 to divide out among our clerks. The, the, the clerks that are making, you know, not that much money. The clerks are making in the 30s ones we're wanting to give you know more money to um, and then the other thing that we're looking for is that about three or four years ago y'all gave us three clerks and that, that made us total ten but at the time y'all said I could see that y'all need maybe five clerks and all and so y'all thought that in, in a few years y'all could give us two more clerks we still, if you have the money, we would like to get those other two clerks or at least one other, but we just need more help because the, the huge caseload per clerk, it was, you know, it was a tremendous amount of cases handled by, you know, the small volume clerks we got. The other thing we, uh, that I'd like to ask for this year is magistrate court is the only court with, without a law clerk or a staff clerk on the payroll. And that's people that have been to law school and um, we don't have anybody. So what I was thinking is even, I, and some people say this is not gonna work, it may not, it may not be able to find anybody. But I was thinking maybe if I had a, a part-time uh, law clerk, then um, I, went, I don't need somebody all the time, it's just that I'm in court all day. So it would be helpful when I, research needs to be done. If I'm in court all day long, every single day, there's no time to do the research. And so I don't need somebody researching all the time. To tell you the truth, I've been there so long and been doing the job is, I know I've researched all, a lot of the law before because a lot of times it's very similar cases. But sometimes you do need, if there's some new issues and I need somebody to look it up or I need to look it up, <coughs> and there's just no time to do that when you're in court all day. So this is my thing is, what I'd like to do, but a lot of people say you're not going to be able to find anybody to do this, is I'd like to have somebody that just did it part-time and maybe even, I don't know if they do this, but on like a contract basis where when I need somebody, that they would probably either work, I was thinking somebody maybe that worked for somebody else or maybe somebody is home with children or about to have children, whatever, because a lot of legal research, they can just do it at home and on the computer. And so I was thinking if I could pay by the hour somebody to do legal research. Now, a lot of people I've talked to said that's not going to work because people that go through law school now have borrowed so much money that they can only really afford to work full time. And so, you know, that, that part of the thing may not work at all for a law clerk, but I'd at least try to see you know, if I could, if I could do that. And, um, and you know, it may be that I have to pay somebody a salary like every, you know, every few weeks and then use them when I can. Um, actually, I've always been lucky because my first, you know, y'all remember my secretary, Deborah Ogle, well, she was sitting there as long as me, but she recently retired. She was not an attorney, but I kind of taught her how to do legal research, and she was pretty good, you know, not a good lawyer, but she was real good, you know. And then um, my, I've got my secretary now, helping me go through what's called the defaults and you know she's going through the file and making notes of when this happened and that happened that helps you a lot too but she'll retire pretty soon and so it, you know most people have their law clerks that have been through law school actually kind of handle those default cases a lot and that would help me a lot in the long run 
So that's just the three things I'm asking for. They're on these, these papers I gave you just now. And I, one thing I, that I think is interesting, I always like to tell y'all some of the type of cases that we've been seeing, the kind of trends. Uh, the trends that I've seen, and I know there's still people here from the Sheriff's Department, they probably say, say the same thing is, um, and this is all over the whole United States, but people are, like they said earlier, they're mad. And so whenever they, um, especially young people, whenever they get mad at each other now, they pull their guns out. So it's a big thing. Of, everybody's pulling guns, you know, shooting people. Uh, that, that is a big thing. And we're seeing women doing that. You know, <coughs> women getting mad at each other pulling guns. Of course, on the drug deals, we're seeing a lot of people. You, I mean, people kill people over marijuana. I just cannot fathom that. But, you know, it's just a, it's a kind of thing where they get mad over a little marijuana. Uh, or they try to rip somebody off. And they just kill you or shoot you or something, you know. And then, so that's, that's a big thing. People coming from other, uh, count, uh, other counties uh, to come here or states to come here and, and you know, commit crimes. Another thing, another trend that we're seeing, and it's just what Sheriff was talking about earlier, is um, we get so many cases where people are driving down Interstate 20 going 111, 129, 149. It's just, it's constantly. And you know, every time we all get on the freeway, you know, you, people come flying by you and cut right in front of you. That's an everyday thing. So the sheriff's department, police department are really, you know, working on that state patrol. Um, but we're seeing that a lot. And you know, then not only do you see people going that fast past you, but then, you know, sheriff's deputies, troopers, whatever, they're having to go behind them. People don't care, they're just, you know, they're just driving like crazy. Another thing we're seeing a lot of is, um, I call it street racing type things. Uh -huh. And what they're doing, what people are doing is there'll be like 200 uh, cars. They, they travel around from county to county to county and sort of like a racing club or something. And so they go down, I think it's called Douglas Hill Road, and um, they get there in the parking lots, and they spinning around, doing their spinning and all that stuff. Well, when the Sheriff's Department or the Police Department comes up there, they try to run over them. I mean, we had one case before, it was the Sheriff's Department, where the same young person, he was in somebody else, in, in a lot of cases, they're in somebody else's car when they're doing this. And they, um, they ended up hitting that officer, uh, ramming their car into it, and trying to hurt him. And then, the, you know, a week later, same car, ram into the same police and again, so the sheriff's hit it again. And then we had another one just recently doing something like that. So people, what they'll do is they'll go from one county and they'll be doing, you know, racing their cars, and mm -hmm, all that loud noise. And then they come to our county, go over there and do it, and then they go down apparently Thornton Road. That's what Kenneth like tells us about it. And then they go to Cobb County doing it. So that, it, you see it in Atlanta, you know, where they're doing it, they go around and around and around at the intersection. They're doing that everywhere. So that's the kind of trends we see. And we always have the trend of more and more people that are defendants with uh, mental health problems. And, you know, we've all talked about that a lot. And so we see that's a, and we always try to help people. Anytime somebody, uh, if we see that um, people have um, alcohol or drug problems, we always try to put body conditions on there to make them, force them to go get some help. Because we've been doing that for a long time. Ken, can you tell me anything about the racing? <laughs> we made 19 arrests last week. And uh, one of them, when Lee had tried to run over one of our deputies, mm -hmm. and um, they said near there were 150 to 200 cars, and the ones that they got stopped and dealt with, uh, nearly every one of them had weapons. Yeah. The guy that tried to run over the law enforcement officer had a pistol and a uh, semi-automatic 223 pistol. Yeah. So it's a cool thing. We run out of handcuffs and patrol cars. <laughs> wow. So I appreciate all y'all have done, and uh, if you can afford to give some more money for clerks, we appreciate it. If you can give us some more clerks, we really need them. Yeah. And uh, and.
look at it maybe to that uh, law clerk for me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I said thanks for meeting with us and me specifically. Um, get, again, back to um, this notion of, of clerks and support. <coughs> again, guys, we've gotten beyond just you know, our system is too big for us to just do it by our hand on ourselves. And you've only got so much capacity. We can say whatever we want to. But we only do just enough of our eight hours as an individual. We're doing a disservice to the broader community says, okay, guys, this thing is that big. This, now, how you lower your office is how you lower your office. And there's need to scale. We're, we're beyond that need. And so I'm just, I'm listening to this, like, okay, I'm probably going to walk for it. I don't want to rationalize that, but don't you see how big our system is? But it's not just about crime with it, about people coming in. I like to know, I like to see a study out of Master as well. Say, okay, but what about the consistency? Where's the crime really originating from? Look at the address of the people who are doing it. Where's the real trend at? Is it people coming in who are migrating that y'all deal with? Or the people who live here? Who well, a, lot of, a lot of the, I think, what do you think? The mucks me that a lot of the big crimes seem to be people maybe that don't even live here. Yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I didn't get into it because that was one yeah, reason. Don't I, go there. I don't want to make the clip with so TV. Don't do it. That was my point. Don't, don't step into that because it'll, it'll take you somewhere you don't want to go. My, my only point was that you don't know. You have no data to come to, to, come to the narrative. Now, we're going to do this right. Bring data and, and prove the fact that where it comes from. But I'm listening to this like, okay, what? Everybody got guns. Everybody got created, the atmosphere has been created, which everybody got a gun. I ain't even got to get a permit no more. I ain't got to get a permit. I'm going to complain about whether I did one or not. Because I'm lying. No, we had that. I'll show you one. I got a permit. Uh, anyway. <laughs> but y'all get my point? So, I mean, we're listening like the guy's already on. So my point is, okay, so crime is on. It's, up. it's more intense. Yeah, it's more violent. I mean, young generation just shut each other, cut each other off on Facebook and Instagram, and then it's, that's a violent action. That's violence online. And so now it's replicating itself out to the public. But again, back to your need to be able to do your job. And so, again, I get it, the board will figure out. Again, I don't know how to price this. Uh, again, Madam HR, look at this. We got all these different support people with different needs and qualifications. It's inconsistent. And really, it's going to be the will of the board. Like, whoever, whoever gets three votes gets to get what they want. That's what it's going to come down to. Because we don't have a systemic way to do it, so our, hopefully our HR director will come back with recommendation. We know it takes time to work through this so we can do, do a better job and that we don't harm the undermining very closely we try to build up by, by helping people. But all right, the last thing is magistrate. So is Judge Caldwell here? No, she's not here. Okay. She's on court with Okay, she's in court and stuff. So but again the volume that you're looking at, dispositions and all those things. Like, again, um, what about night court? We if, we, if we had more judges, we, we could do that. But the problem is, if we had not, we didn't get all the courts. Well, we have to think, judgment, can we have high court? Sure, if we have the resources to do it. Yeah, I mean, like you tell, 24 7 for the courthouse. I ain't got no problem. If you go again back to the 6 and the 8, the 6 minute, I got people sitting in that jail probably longer than they need to. Right, so now I'm on the other side, it's like, okay, but what about the family and stuff that want to see this? The end of this? Let's get on with it. Let's get the trial, get on with what I got to get to. So I'm trying to listen to all this and balance. Right. And my position, oh, I'm going to look at law and order. It said that y'all was going to run the law and order. So it's like, okay, how are we going to do this? Like, again, it is up to the board to say, okay, how fast we want this system to go? You got people that sit there loaded and they need to. So what are we going to do? Um, and I, again, I, I recognize I'm, I'm listening for solutions as staff, this new administration of, of executives. Guys, we got to solve some problems. It can't be just the same old every year we go through this exercise. Um, can we come up with a more structured way in which um, how to govern, how to appropriate? So I'm, I'm just messaging for the record. So that's it. I appreciate that. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Next, we have coming to our district. Attorney, Valerie yeah, Racine, our district attorney, you have the floor. And thank you for being here. Thank you again, uh, Judge King. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Give me one second. Good morning, board. Dahlia Racine, District Attorney here in Douglas County. Thank you for this opportunity to present before you. Um, obviously, you've heard from a lot of the other departments as to the work that they do and why they do the work that they do, and we know this is no mystery to you all. But I wanna start off with uh, why it matters. Recently, a 13-year-old girl was walking by Six Flags Park. She had run away from home for a myriad of reasons. And when an individual saw a vulnerable child on the street, he offered her a ride. He then picked her up and took her to his Douglas County home where he raped her repeatedly. He provided her with drugs. And then he texted his friend to see if he wanted her to. He then dropped that 13 year old child off to the friend where he in turn also sexually assaulted her, provided her with narcotics. And for months on end, they traded this girl back and forth between them, as well as other men. Unfortunately, this story is not unique to Douglas County. We had a phenomenal investigation by both our Sheriff's Department and our Police Department because it was a joint jurisdiction issue. But when we talk about why the work that we do matters, this is the reality of what we deal with on a daily basis. I wanna show you, since the last we met, a sampling of the stories that our office has handled that's been covered by our local paper. And that is not even probably 50%. When we talk about the reality of what we do, we handle cases like Derek Hobbs that not only killed his mother, burned his niece alive. We talk about the case that I just explained to you of a 13-year-old child that is traded between grown men. And I bring those up because when we talk about our serious violent felonies, which are defined legally for us as malice, murder, kidnapping, rape, aggravated sodomy, aggravated sex battery, aggravated child molestation, armed robbery, felony murder, murder in the second degree, what we see is it's growing in our community. Again, Douglas County is not unique to this issue. This is a national trend that we see. And so you can see from 2019 to 2020 to 2021, the cases we receive are increasing from our law enforcement partners. The cases that we are charging are continuing to increase. The cases that we are closing are increasing because of the workload, because of the individuals we have staffed. But what you can see is that this is a numbers war and the ones that are pending are continuing to grow. The reason why this is important and the reason why this discussion is not siloed is because we know that Douglas County has prioritized public safety. And we are very proud to partner with our law enforcement teams, whether it be the Sheriff's Department or the Police Department or the Georgia, Georgia Bureau of Investigation or whichever agency it is that is bringing these reports. 
But we are often erased from the conversation of public safety because unlike our first responders, we are the last responders. We are the ones holding the line to make sure that when you all want to have economic development, when we want to elevate Douglas, that people actually want to come here. That they feel safe. That their businesses can thrive. That their homes are safe. That their children are safe if they come here. And that is based on how we respond and we react to the crimes that take place in our community. You all have done tremendous things for our partners in the Sheriff's Department. They were bleeding out. They needed the help. The criminal justice system, though, is a truck. And if we don't equally inflate all of the tires, we will not run smoothly. And I'm not saying they don't need any more help. We all could use help. You've heard that all day long. But what I am saying is, if we continue to ignore the needs of the district attorney's office, the system will not run properly. So our goal, what we do at the district attorney's office, you'll see it on our walls, you'll see it on our materials. We seek justice with excellence and integrity. I said this last year and I'll say it again. Our resources are outpaced by our needs. This is a great place to live. You can see that evidenced by the volume of homes that are popping up, of apartment complexes, the growth of our community. People want to be here. But crime is a numbers game. The more people that come in, the more issues we are going to have. So our needs moving forward, we'll talk about both the operational cost request and the proposed addition to court. So first off, I wanted to address the operational cost requests. First, it's for professional services. You'll see an increase of 60,000. We actually are requesting a, a decrease in our office equipment maintenance. We also have an increase in our telephones, as well as in our training. And our auto maintenance and minor equipment, I want y'all to put a caveat, an asterisk by those two when we talk about those. So professional services. We are in September. I am glad that Judge McLean is here, Judge Warren is here. I saw Judge Adams just leave. They are doing a phenomenal job and they are keeping us very busy. We are trying cases, they are bringing in senior judges, they are keeping the wheels turning. We're already on our 16th trial so far this year. We have another one starting next week and seven more trial weeks remaining in this year. We also know, like we just heard Judge Camp talk about, gun culture is prevalent. Cultural norms are different. A lot of people don't understand the criminal mind, so our need for expert witnesses has increased so that jurors can understand what it is, the dynamics of the cases that happen. We don't get rubber stamped anymore, nor should we. It is our burden to prove people guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Part of meeting that burden, though, is providing expert testimony so they can understand the dynamics of the crimes. In addition, we also still have our victim witness lodging, transcripts, all those costs associated with what it takes to have a trial. You saw I said we're asking for a reduction in office equipment maintenance. We have less copiers, higher functioning copiers, so we have less maintenance needs. So that's why we're asking for a reduction there. Our cell phones, um, last year we talked about how all of our advocates, our ADAs and our investigators carry cell phones. That's why there's an increase in that line. We have more people, more phones for that service. And training. Crime's not stagnant. The sophistication of crime is not stagnant. We recently went to an FBI cast training where we learned on how to utilize cell tower evidence to help corroborate location in crimes. Uh, we're learning computer technology and how that's used to facilitate crimes. As these things are trending and changing, we have to stay ahead with the curve. And we've been very lucky to also be able to partner with our law enforcement agencies as well on some joint trainings when it comes to gang intel, when it comes to all these different types of crimes that we're seeing coming to our community. That needs not going to stop, it's going to increase, and we want to make sure that our people have the best training possible. And the gas oil maintenance costs, caveat that because we have an ask later on. So that's it for the operational costs. Next, the proposed addition to core. 
Uh, we're going to talk about this, but 11, 12, and 13, we possibly have alternative uh, funding sources for that. So we just wanted to talk about the rest. Our ARPA positions. Um, thanks again to Judge McLean. He led our efforts as a county uh, to secure ARPA funding for three ABAs and one investigator under our ARPA 1 grant. And I'm sorry, three ABAs under ARPA 1 and one ADA and one investigator under ARPA 2. We are hopeful that grant process uh, is due Friday. Is that correct, Judge McLean? Application is due tomorrow. So we don't know when we will hear back, but we're hopeful that we will get that funding again for those different positions. And that would be a total of 526. But what I can explain to you is that it is very hard to keep barred and licensed attorneys without any promise that they will have a job the following year. Grant funding is difficult to have the promise of longevity. So we are asking for that amount to be earmarked so that we are able to give that security to those individuals that are in that position to know that even if we have grant funding the next two years, which is what's left on this grant, or if it terminates early, that the BOC has their back to be sure that they can continue to do the important work that they are doing in our office. Next, this is a big one. I'm sure you've heard it echoed um, last year. It was huge with us being competitive in recruiting for our law enforcement agencies. I can tell you that the market for ABAs, for assistant district attorneys, has never been more competitive than what it is now. We saw a great reshuffling. Um, we know that in Metro Atlanta, there's different trends where there's equitable pay for the county law department and the DA's office and the public defenders because they're all considered government workers. We've also seen pay bumps across Metro Atlanta. Specifically, Fulton and DeKalb have recently been able to secure funding from their BOCs where some of the starting salaries for new ABAs is $100,000. Now, I'm realistic. I'm not going to ask y'all to start us at 100,000, but what I am going to say is that they are 30 miles away. And if we think that arbitrary boundaries are going to stop them from going to other jurisdictions, we are mistaken. And the surest way to deflate our tire in the process is for us to have staff shortages. We know the national average law school debt, I believe that Judge Camp was talking about that as well, coming out of law school about 108,000. And I think that's actually low, maybe because I went to Emory, <laughs> but I think that's probably uh, for those that will go to public law schools versus private law schools, of course. Average education debt after law school, 130,000. Private law, they've always been a competitor for us. Again, not saying, assuming that we're gonna match that, but 145,000 coming right out of law school, going to a private firm. When we look at the listings from the Fulton DA's office back in 21 before they received their pay bump, you could see that the listings for annual attorneys starting out was 84,000. We're at 70. We know that we were able to um, receive the generous bump from the BOC for the 5%, which it did help some. But meanwhile, the state was also having a reckoning because we have two funding sources, as y'all are familiar. Some of our staff is state funded. Over the last two years, our state paid attorneys have received anywhere from a 13 to 20% increase in their salary based off, the, off of the state's recognition that they have been grossly underpaid and recognizing that the pay had to be increased. So now what we see are disparities of two people doing the same exact job, but having different salaries based on whether they are state paid or county paid. So our ask is for a 12% pay increase across the board for our ADAs and the county supplement after the 5% ARPA supplement. That total is 150,000 for our office in order to have that increase across the board. Number four, unrestricted funds. Office culture is huge. We are just asking for 400 a month so that we can have those unrestricted funds similar to what other departments have for a total of 4,800. Vehicle replacement, we talked about this last year. Since last year, um, we are still asking for three cars. They are still deplorable. They are still unreliable. Um, we're actually requesting hybrid vehicles. 
Because remember that caveat I said on the auto oil maintenance fees? We think that will drastically decrease if we do have hybrid vehicles. Um, again, the purpose of these are so that we are able to transport our victims and witnesses. A trial we just had two weeks ago, we had two investigators that had to travel three and a half hours each way to go get a victim and her children to bring them here to court to testify for trial. So they're consistently using their vehicles for things along those lines as well as getting evidence and all those. So we are asking for our three vehicles to be replaced. We're estimating that at 51,000 each for a total of 153,000. And just to show you some of the vehicles that we are dealing with um, that are unable to utilize, and I will say that vehicle number three, which is not on here, but it wouldn't start. And so we're currently using a loaner vehicle. And at this point, it feels as if it's merging into a liability because if somebody had been in that car and they had broken down wherever they were in transporting a victim or a witness, this can't wait. We need to replace these vehicles. Number six is our PACE program. We have a PACE ADA um, who is doing phenomenal work, uh, but she needs help. She's created an amazing pretrial diversion program that's holistic, um, along with managing the caseloads that go to Judge McLean's drug court, uh, Judge Adams' hope court, the opioid court, the veterans court, the different accountability court programs that are happening. They also insist with community engagement, and we want to increase the capacity. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, to your point earlier, talking about if people are sitting in jail, we want to separate the people that we're scared of from the ones that we're mad at. If we're able to push certain individuals into diversion programs because we feel that with attachment to resources, we can break the recidivism and we can stop having them come into our system, then we are better and safer as a county. But right now we need more staffing to be able to do that to keep our streets safe. We are in dire need of an SVU advocate. Uh, currently, just in Judge Adams' courtroom alone, I believe there are 70 pending SVU cases. That's one courtroom. Special Victims Unit. These include crimes against women and children. Um, it also includes intimate partner violence. These are some of our most egregious and difficult cases to prove because of all the dynamics involved. We currently have one SVU advocate that only deals with child victims. And what we need is another one to deal with our adult victims. And so we desperately need that step that staffing in order to do the work that we do. Back again, asking for the paid internships. Um, our paid interns, we understand that socioeconomic factors prevent people from being able to work for us for free over the summer. We want them to have the equal opportunity to be able to do that. We want to thank Commissioner Goddard. She generously allowed us to um, use funding for one intern and it was an amazing experience for that young lady to have the opportunity to work in our office, but it shouldn't be limited to one. So we're asking for five paid interns at 2,000 each for the summer for a total of 10,000. Data entry coordinator, um, we definitely need this. Again, Commissioner Robinson, I feel like I fed you my lines before I came up here. You talked about data, you talked about us needing to know what is actually happening in our community, where the crimes are happening, how we're resolving them, um, all the different dynamics of what's going on, who's being victimized, getting all that information. And we actually received grant funding for a data project, but that is for the actual mechanism of the software. They are launching and piloting this program. We are very excited to be participating in it. But data entry is time consuming, and all of our individuals are stretched to the max. So we're asking for a data entry coordinator to be able to come in, and that is their exclusive role to help us to collect data for this exciting project that we have going on so that we can help to understand what are we missing? Where are the loopholes that we need to close? How can we perform better as a department, as an agency, as a system? A trial line ADA, we would like to pull our SVU DC out of a courtroom so that they can solely focus on those special victims crimes. Um, so there's a lot of trials going on. We have our caseloads that are heavy and decrease the backload. Just a reminder, our 5% funds, I know that this comes up sometimes each year, but basically our 5% funds are entitled to go to our office, to the solicitor's office, to nonprofits. We always just want to remind y'all that if it is taken from us, that we just need that money to be replaced in any budgetary um, allotments because we do pay for our staff with our 5% funds. So in conclusion, what we are asking for is 
Uh, the operating expense increase that we talked about at first for 83,150. We are hopeful that we'll get that 500 plus thousand in the ARPA grant funding. And then the proposed addition to core of 862, we think that we could possibly get funding for about 186 of that. So best case scenario, if we get this alternative funding on both the ARPA and some of those um, addition to core projects, our total ask is $759,025. And that will put us in a posture to continue to serve our community and seek justice with excellence and integrity. And that is all I have for you all. Any questions? Thank you, Madam D. Any questions for commissioners or Madam? Okay. All right, there. Oh, Vice Chair Carlson. <laughs> yeah, I just want just for staff real quick. Um, put the, the data map, uh, data project on my tab as well as the SP. The data project. Data project. Yep. Okay. And the SQ map. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. How much of this? How about that? Seven twenty fifty nine. I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, how much of that is, is, is come? I mean, it's going to be reoccurring, or is it just how much is one time only, or is it, or should I look at this as reoccurring? I can give you that answer. Hold on one second. Oh, you need some help with all that? No, I'm on the three. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, of the total, so the operating cost request would be recurring, so that eighty-three thousand would be recurring. Okay. Of the um, proposed addition to core, um, the vehicles would no longer be a cost, so that would be 153 less. Um, we would still be asking, obviously, for the salary, so it would be 150,000 less than what was asked as far as recurring costs, if that makes sense. So about 600,000. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay, but still though, even using the vehicles, it won't be a recurring cost, but it will come up again. It's not as though it'll, be, it'll go away because the question is how many, you don't put as many miles on your cars as the sheriff and their team. Correct. You know, so. Nor do we need the vehicle power that they do right. and what we do as well. So it's a lower cost, but I think by going with a hybrid vehicle option, we do have more durability and longevity for those vehicles. And we have used the vehicles we currently have for decades plus. So. I do assume all things, you know, considered normal, right. um, that we would have some longevity in that projection of being yes. able to keep those cars in operation. Okay, that's all I got. What is unrestricted funds? So unrestricted meaning it's not allotted to a certain line item and that our office is able to use those for what we deem necessary for our operations. So it's a line item in the budget? It would be in essence, yes, but it's not necessarily designated to a certain cost that we have to spend for. So we would have the freedom to spend those funds as we deem necessary for our office. Yeah. Except in the fund balance. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Madam DA, for your interesting, very good presentation. Next we have uh, the floor is our tax commissioner, Greg Baker. Do you have the floor to your mic? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, I like the presentation so far. I love it. Everybody needs something. Um, but here is my turn. I know everybody's short on pay. Um, I wanted to say I'm not looking for any raises for my staff. Uh, I know we get the 5% in January. I include stuff in my budget where I want to incentivize only employees that do exceptionally well and have a, they do things and come in on their own, they work late. So your, if your 5% and what I propose in my budget, I will incentivize those that I think go over and above um, what we need for my department. So I'm not asking for anything special. Um, I do know that Cobb County is going to, for the same position at $19 an hour. I'm not gonna try to compete with them. 
if my people are gonna leave, I just gotta train new people. Um, that's just part of the game right now. And if I was a young person, if I was getting $19 somewhere else, I'd probably leave too. But that's just the market and you know, what's gonna happen. I'll go over kind of what we've done since from 921-21 to 921-22, we've serviced 87,684 people in the tags office. That's from last year we had 79,415. So that's an increase of 8,269 people. The next year we are anticipating additional 14,426 14, with the plan projection of all the housing Apartment complexes, as all you, you know, that are coming on board. We met with the city of Douglasville, finance director, and we talked about their TAD program and all the building that they got going on, all the apartment complexes that are coming on board, which is gonna increase all of you, all the judges are gonna get increased because we got more people coming into Douglas County. So we're anticipating an additional 14,426 to come through that building, get tags, uh, property tax, and the whole thing. So we're gonna have an influx of people with the new building that's going on in Douglas County. So we all gotta get used to it. We're gonna uh, have an influx. Now, what that narrows down to, gotta go to my other paper here. <sighs> so basically we sold in 2021 339,426 tags. In 2022, we serviced 341,442, and projection for 2023 is 344,000. Titles in 2021, we did 21,000. 2022, 23,000, and we're projecting about 24 to 25,000 in 2023. So you can see everything's going up and uh, we don't expect it to slow down. What I do have in my budget is, my budget didn't really change. I'm asking for pretty much the same thing I had last year. I still have two people that I haven't uh, filled yet. So Roslyn, you know, Ramona, don't, don't be messing with my budget. Uh, I want those to roll over. And the reason I haven't filled those positions is what we found is that I used quite a bit of my money out of part-time because what we found is when we hired people, they would soon leave or they just didn't cut the mustard. So what we do now is we take that part-time budget money and we give them six months to prove themselves. And after six months, then we'll hire them. So that's why I'm rolling the two people over because we haven't found the right connection. We found some, but as we hire, like everybody else, some leave. So I still have the two people. I'm only asking for one addition other than the rollover. Uh, and that's to handle some of our delinquent stuff that we got that's increased a lot. So I'm asking for one person in the delinquent area. Uh, and other than that, we're good. So on my first line, we got 31,500, which you can see is overtime and clerk's costs. Other professional services, about 400,000. Uh, office equipment is about 28, let's say 29,000. Next slide, please. And then that goes to 103580 And then the postage, brochures, and all the things that go along with the tax bills are about 154000 Phone systems, about 4000 Advertisement, public relations, all that good stuff is about 25000 All of this stuff, none of it's really changed. I may have added 500 to $1,000 or something that have gone up in price, but pretty much my budget is almost like it was last year, except for a few areas where 
postage increase, I don't have any control over that. So areas where things increase, we had to increase for those uh, funds. I have a detailed list of everything we spend uh, that is attached and finance has it. A detailed list of everything we spend. All the equipment we have to pay renewals for, everything is on my budget. Uh, so you have a detailed list of bank fees, the whole thing. Bank fees may go up, so I add a little bit for bank fees. But we provided you a detailed list of everything we spend for. So everything in my budget has a detailed list, and it's mostly anything that we have recurring costs for each year. Uh, and I believe Rosalind and them have that, right? Uh, so you can look at my budget and you see, okay, he spent this for this. Uh, my budget, I'm saving the $800,000 we had in there yet last year. That's not in our budget this year. Uh, because we, I think we got, well, I know what we got, because we owe Tyler Technology 61208 and then the final payment will be 30516 so that's the, that'll complete our cost to Tyler. And the reason we haven't paid that is they still have some bugs to work out. I won't sign off on the project until those bugs are done. And that may roll over until January or February. And I sign off on those bugs that are in the, that we haven't been able to work out yet. So, and that's pretty much it. I don't have a long presentation. I haven't changed much and I'm not asking for much. There is a, Item down there for, uh, whoo. next slide, please. Supplement, tax commissioner supplement. I don't want you guys to miss that. And I want to make sure I mention it in, in this one. Uh, I did put a supplement in there for me. You are the board, you approve what you approve. Uh, but I did add it in there, you want to bring that up? Uh, and other than that, that's my budget. And I'll take any questions that you have. Any questions for just this one? Uh, uh, how is the uh, Tyler piece, the, the software, coming? First of all, and I think you mentioned it. And my other part to this is, what are the reoccurring costs, like maintenance, updates, and all the kind of? Are there any other costs that we should be preparing ourselves for, or? Once we're done with the bugs that you spoke of. Yes, and that's in the, that's in the budget here too. Uh, Tyler is running great. Um, matter of fact, it's, it's freed up some time for us a little bit too on our financial end a little bit because those reports come out, they're great and they save us time in calculating some stuff. Um, our first week in running Ty Tyler, as I told you guys before, it calculated that we were missing $163,000 from our, some of our constituents. And I can say to date, we've been collected about 129,000 of that. So it's really paying for itself. It does a better calculation than our old system did. So eventually it'll, this will pay for itself. Uh, I know we found another $83,000 that it calculated that we were missing from some other people too. So it does a wonderful job. It does everything we thought it would do. We have some glitches in it, but other than that, it's, it's uh, really good. And I think the maintenance okay. on that runs, the maintenance on that is 232,000 a year. Okay. That's for all three departments. So that's right. for the right. assessor's department, GIS, and the tax commissioner's department. Yeah. And, so, and do, do you separate that out so we won't all be kind of put on? Is it in your budget alone or is it, or is it allocated out? Actually, it's, so far it's in my budget. Oh, so you, you get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. But I, I, mean, I don't know if they know how to, to, I don't know if we can. Yeah, I don't know if we know how to take it out because I don't, they don't know what his would be or what. We can look at that if you want, but it, it, so far it's all comes out. Out of on, your, on your budget. Now he did when we were doing the implementation, he did have some in his budget 
was I wound up paying him and he had to pay me back. It was a, it was a mess. So, okay, okay. But all that is not my budget. Right. Just so you'll know, it's all three of our budgets. So it's just coming out of one box. I get to break it out, but that's okay. That's a whole other conversation. But outside of that, that okay. I that's mean, if you wanted to break it down, you get divided by three. Uh, it all gets paid to the same place. So. Mm -hmm. I got it. I'm not messing with you. I, I pretty okay. much just leave it to finance over there. Right. Okay. Vice Chair, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, uh, I want to touch the technology. Those guys have got that under the lock. I supported as is. Don't get them all in. And those things. Uh, but my question, I want to come back to a couple things. Um, you mentioned software. Now, three, now again, I get um, 1,100 um, employees that work properly for uh, 29 directors and 14 other local officials beyond us. Um, that helps you get to the top. Uh, and yeah, we, we do have an effect on the other electives compensation. Absolutely. And what will the board do? How do we normalize that? I'm looking to my new HR director to help, like, okay, that's why she's in the room, to help us think through things that we don't have to do behind the scenes, do this, though, who got plans to do this, like, I'm going to get political maybe. We got time for this. I know, I mean, we have to take the hit. No, you're not going to ask, but surely you're right. But we take the hit. Y'all don't carry this. So we got to have this conversation. So I have no problem with. You know, again, if I did, I said, okay, everybody gets something. Right? That, that would be my policy position. Period. It's not my problem that the prior administrations could not figure out how to approach something like this to make it more normalized. It's not my problem. I can't fix the past. But what I can do is, like, well, if I were, I'd say, hmm, I'd advocate for if she gets a supplement, he gets a supplement, and y'all all get the same amount, I'm done with y'all. Because at that point, it's like some of y'all paid by the state, and some like, okay, we know that, right? So it ain't that clean. But the supplement is the one area which the board commissions can directly affect. That means the coroner, the task commission, and everybody gets the same amount. Now, if the state comes in and doesn't do it, we ain't got nothing to do with them, take it up with the general supplement. But that would be my fault. So put that on my tab, look at a supplement if I consider this across the board. One. Second. It's wasted contingencies. Likewise, like you know, I, I get it. If there's some degree of rule that says, okay, Greg, here's two hundred thousand dollars for you. But why isn't every elected official got a bucket of two hundred thousand? Y'all forgot y'all pay performance because we don't have that much direct visibility to figure out this person versus that. Like I don't know these people. Wait that close? I I I, I have There's no way I can see performance. I can't even see to y'all performance. <coughs> so put on my tab. I like look at a contingency across all elected. One gets, he gets 200, everybody gets 200. Now y'all got your little fun for that little one off as the discretionary decision makers that y'all should be able to let them go over at the Jew about what you're spending on your own discretion. And then not now, we, not now we can normalize the things. So that's what we'll put that on my tab. So do deny it, um, contingency, and um, obviously the, the supplement is something that I just want to make a note of. I want to take that up. Uh, the board will ultimately um, determine what it's going to do, but uh, I tried this three years ago, and things turned sideways unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. Ain't nobody getting anything like this back in Washington. Uh huh. Oh, tis, tis, tis. But here we are, being that guy. And we're going to do it for the right reason. Use my power for good. I was like, no, I hear y'all. I get it. I don't have to, but I'm choosing to. You know, it takes three. So, uh, y'all got my two points, staff. I'm good. I'm sure you. Thank you. Appreciate you, Greg. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Spotting that for me. All right. Thank you. We're moving right along. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Tax Commissioner. All right. Um, so, great presentation again. We're going to move on to our uh, Chief Public Defender. Uh, Monica Miles, you have the floor. Would you like a microphone? Sure. Yes. Okay. Little clicker as well. It's here. Mm -hmm. 
Is all of me. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Monica Miles, the Chief Public Defender. I've been the Chief Public Defender, or I've been the Public Defender in Douglas County for over 28 years. Um, I've done many, many of these um, meetings every year. So I'll just kind of start <laughs> out with what do we do in the Public Defender's Office? We employ attorneys and support staff. And we work in Superior Court, we work in State Court, Magistrate Court, we represent clients in all those courts, we process applications for counsel, we meet with clients that are in the jail, we meet with clients in prisons, we meet with clients who are in jails in other states, we meet with clients, some video uh, virtual meetings on the computer, we meet with clients who are not in jail, they come into our office and we meet with them and interview them. We file legal documents, we review discovery, we meet uh, with other court personnel and to help represent our clients. We investigate cases for our clients. We have investigators who interview witnesses, go out and get information to help our clients when they go to court. We attend court for hearings, motions, pleas, and we go to jury trial. We represent clients at all those trials that Judge McLean told you that we've been having this year. And we have to be prepared for all of the above. Now, that's just, that's not a, an exhaustive list, but that's some of the stuff. We also represent people in accountability court. We have to do a lot of legal research. And our office administers a conflict list for all the conflict lawyers who help support our office. There have been a lot of changes, as Judge McLean told you earlier, with some with COVID, some non-COVID related, related reasons um, that have increased our workload. There's been, like you said, a lot of staff changes. There's a lot of new policies, a lot of new procedures. There's been the ARPA money, which has funded a lot of other departments. There's new programs, to name a few. And the increased caseload, the increased crime that has gone on in Douglas County. And it's caused us to be very busy and we're just beyond capacity to be able to continue to do the work that we've always been known to do in the past. Uh, in the past, I think Commissioner Robinson has asked me numerous times, how do you all do it? How do you do it in your office? How do you keep up? You know, you're under understaffed, you're, you know, you're outmanned, you're outgunned. And I've said, we were lean and mean. Well, we're not lean and mean anymore. We're, we're like, I don't know, a toothpick, whatever. Um, for real. And so um, we're asking for, to help keep up with some of this, we're asking for some new positions. Uh, we're asking for an assistant public defender. We're asking for a senior administrative assistant and an investigator. Starting next year, I believe all the courtrooms are going to be having trials at the same time. We only have two investigators in our office. And if three superior courtrooms are going on and two state courts are going on, we just don't have the capacity to be able to help the clients have their cases prepared for trial. We don't have, and also my understanding of the senior judges that are coming in, that increases even more trials for our people to have to be prepared for. We need another investigator. Uh, we need another administrative assistant. I would like to have an assistant. I do not have one. I do all my own work. Um, occasionally I will borrow one of the other attorneys in the office assistant to, to, to support me, and they all will, but I do a lot of my own administrative work in the office because we really just are very short staffed in that sense. Um, we need another administrative assistant not only to help me but to help all the other attorneys in the office as it is we have several attorneys that have to share one staff person and each of our staff people do more than just support attorneys they do extra work they do conflict work to help our conflict office they help do a lot of other administrative things our office manager for instance is not just an office manager she supports attorneys she helps do other things and supports everybody else in the office. So we are very, 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 very um, lean and mean, so to speak, short staff. I would desperately use another administrative assistant. We also need another attorney. There's a lot of cases going to trial. There have been cases going to trial, but it's going to continue to increase with the increased cases. We have so many murders. It used to be in Douglas County, if there was a murder case, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be trying to murder. Oh, you're trying that murder case, blah, blah, blah. And everybody knew the facts of it because there'd be one a year, maybe one every two years. Same thing with armed robbery. When I first started working here, 
there was an armed robbery case and you would have thought it was the worst serial murder in the world. Now, armed robberies are down a dozen. And there's so, I mean, there's just a lot of violence. There's shootings. Seems like every day we get a new shooting case in our office. So we need another attorney to help with, try the, to try all the cases that we have. And additionally, we have an accountability court attorney because we do support all the accountability courts and the accountability courts and state court as well. So we cover both uh, courts and our accountability court attorney, he's really spread thin because as new programs keep getting introduced, you know, he shows up to support those, but it's whenever there's a new program or a new position or anything, our office is always there to back up. But we don't ever get the additional staff that everyone else does. And that's gonna lead me into the ARPA. Judge McLean said it was like 900 and something thousand that he was able to get. He tried to get it for us, it's not his fault, but public defenders got excluded from that. So the state public defender system gave us $83,000 to use over three, period, three years. So that's about $27,000 a year. So basically we got 0 0.025 of what everybody else across the board got. So. And I, the DA that was able to get four prosecutors, the courts are able to get senior judges to come in and help out. And there's gonna be calendar clerks and such that, that were hired, I believe, in state court. We didn't get anything. We didn't get any lawyers to help out. Um, so we're expected to show up and, and, and be there and try these cases with the same staff that we've always had. Now, I use my $83,000, my 83,333 $83, $83, $83, $83, $83, $83, $83, $83, and you guys agreed that I could hire a legal staff assistant. And that will last about a year and a half. And we hired someone who worked for about a month and decided that it's just too much, too much work. So they've given me notice. Um, so now I'm gonna have to try to find somebody else. And so that's a problem that we're having in our office. I've gone through probably four legal staff assistants in the past year, and what I'm being told is this is really hard work. And I don't know, I'm not asking for an increase in salary in that position, I'm just telling you it's a problem that we're having and the problem is the existing staff is getting very tired of having to train the new employees that keep coming into the office. When this last person quit, the person who has the training broke down in tears. She's like, I just can't keep doing this. So I don't know what to do. Across the board, salary study, raise, raise all the salaries would probably help, maybe people would want to stick around, or maybe we'd get a better quality of candidate for a higher salary, but it, it's a problem. Um, and, I'm sorry? Not just these, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> You're the only one she's blessed. So I'm I thought you said something. Sorry, I thought you said a comment. <laughs> So what I am asking though for is some salary increases. Um, for some of the um, attorneys in the office, the reasons being they're underpaid as it is, their education is very expensive, there's the student loans being canceled and higher paying jobs. So basically, to talk about attorneys go into the, well, actually, I actually want to jump forward. Okay. To become an attorney, and I know some of this is pretty obvious to most people, but I just kind of want to emphasize, you have to have a college degree, you have to have a bachelor, bachelor's degree. Then you got to study if you want to go to law school, so you take the LSAT, it's a test, to get accepted into law school. Most people, I would say 99.9%, .9 have to take a course, which is very expensive, to help them prepare to study to take this exam. So they take it, they get their results, they use that, they apply to a law school. If you're accepted into law school, that's three more years. It's extremely expensive. Most people don't have families that are able to help them out, so they have to take out loans for living expenses for the three years that they're in law school. They get their law degree, but when they have to take the bar exam before they can practice. But before you take the bar exam, you've got to apply, and you've got to pass a fitness and integrity uh, character application, and that's a very lengthy process. Some people don't even pass it after they go to law school. You also, when you study for the bar, you take a bar review course, which I have a daughter who's in law school, we just signed her up, it's over $3,000. And that's how much it costs, and you study every day for three months. And you, this is in the summer after you graduate, and then you take the bar, two days. 
you don't get your results back for another three months. So you sit on pins and needles waiting, hoping that you pass, and you hope that you have a job while you are waiting. So it's a very expensive, lengthy process. And there's not that many lawyers out there. So my turnover is very high right now, especially with the entry level lawyers. And I will say with the lawyers, that's a courtroom, it's not our courtroom. But only a lawyer can stand in a courtroom. And when you walk into most courtrooms, you kind of, there's like a little gate or there's a certain area you go, because they call it the bar. And historically, only attorneys could go beyond the bar. Now people can represent themselves, but you are not allowed to represent anybody else unless you are a licensed lawyer in a courtroom. You cannot stand up and represent somebody to a jury if you are not a licensed lawyer. And even a lot of licensed lawyers don't have the ability to stand up in front of a group of people and present a case. They don't want to do it, they can't do it, they're afraid to do it. So it takes a special skill set to be able to go into a courtroom in front of a judge and argue, or to go in front of a jury and argue. So we know that they have an expensive education, that they're rare to find, and at this point in time, our attorneys are underpaid, especially our um, entry level ones. I know you're tired of hearing about Fulton County, but that's where everybody goes. And this summer, they increased the salaries, and I believe y'all have been permitted, given that information in the past, but their starting salary for the public defenders is 105,000. Starting salary is more than I have attorneys in my office who've been practicing 20 years representing people charged with murder, armed robbery, aggravated child molestation. Don't even make what an entry level public defender in Fulton County makes. And everybody knows about these salaries. Um, and then once you've been there a few years in Fulton County, because I've talked to several people, they're making 140, 150,000. That's twice what people in my office who've been working there close to 10 years are making. At some point, I fear, I fear I'm gonna lose folks. But the problem is I'm not gonna be able to replace them. The new people coming in are burdened with student loans, just like uh, our DA Racine told you. And it's a lot, and I know, I mean, I, some of the lawyers that come in my office have an excess of $200,000 in student loans. So it's hard to hire new people with the entry levels that we're paying, and we're paying entry level 61,000. And that's what the ask is for a clerk. And I'm paying lawyers 61,000 who have loan with. So that it's a deterrent, and it's hard to get people to come in the door. The second thing is the student loan forgiveness. So we've heard about it a lot. You do public interest work, and you can have your student loans forgiven. And a lot of people in my office, I mean, that's what's kept on, that's what's kept on there, with the hope that someday my student loans are going to be forgiven. I've had five, maybe six people this year get their student loans forgiven. And the significance of that is they're done. And they're all like, you know what? Maybe we'll go somewhere else, like Fulton County. Look at their salaries. And it's just hard to compete. I cannot compete with them. And I don't expect, as other people have said, that you're gonna pay the same that Fulton County does. But I've had a lot of phone calls from judges, court administrators, public defender's offices in other counties calling me saying, what are you all paying your people because we're, you know, we're trying to think about raising salaries because we're losing people. And I, Gwinnett County just called me a couple days ago. And I'm thinking, I don't wanna tell you what we pay people because you're just gonna, you know, you're gonna bump up and then that's gonna make it hard on us. On our conflict list, we've lost a lot of people because they can go be on conflict list elsewhere and make more money. So, I don't know what's gonna happen if everybody leaves because I'm not having a hard time. I've had a vacancy for over six months for a lawyer position and maybe two, two people have applied, we schedule appointments and they call within a day or two of coming in for an interview and they say, I'm sorry, I just took a position elsewhere. So, we did hire somebody, fortunately, made an offer yesterday, so I'm hoping that person Everything goes through with that application, the contract, and no one leaves for a while. It will be staff with their attorneys. But I am, I'm very fearful that I've got a good number of people who are probably gonna be thinking about going out the door. Um,
much for one I can give it to. So that's just the, the request for salary increases. And again, I'm not asking for what Fulton County asks. I'm just asking for something that will hopefully keep the attorneys in our office doing their work. Um, then on a lighter note, I would like to get another copy machine. Um, I mean, not necessarily that one, but a copy machine. Um, we do use that and our copier is, is going bad. I do have in there the information about what they are paying in Fulton County that was provided to me, as well as what they're paying the conflict attorneys. And, and this, that's not just Fulton County, but it's happening all around Metro Atlanta. I had a, I was gonna play this, but I'm not going to, because um, I don't think maybe it'd be appropriate. I know this is being recorded, so I don't know if this is gonna be shown to the public later. But the attorneys that started, they come to work for us, not for the money. They come because they really do wanna help people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do the work. Um, but at some point, I mean, they got to get paid. They got to get. They got to be able to live and eat. And and they're t and it's tiring work. And the class of clients lately, it's it's a violent class, and they're very angry, as someone has already said. And this, if I would play it for you, you would probably be very shocked. There's a voicemail that one client called and left, basically threatening to shoot one of my attorneys after he cussed her out over and over again. And that's that's what you know she comes to me and i'm like well i don't know what we can do we can't we if you call any other office in the courthouse and did, said what that was you'd be arrested and you'd be charged well you're already arrested you're already charged we represent you i can't give it to another attorney because i'm doing the same thing i've always been taught at least when i start became a lawyer with public defenders we're the bottom line we're it we're what stands between you and going off to prison forever and so we have to take it now, I don't believe that anymore. I don't think you just have to take everything that's thrown your way, but we still have to take some things. And when our clients call and threaten us, or they call and cuss us out, and call and are just horrible, it gets tiring after a while. And lawyers are like, okay, why am I still doing this? I can't do this anymore. And that's a concern that I have, um, especially when you're overworked, underpaid, and just totally stressed out. Um, so I would ask, you please consider the request on the position and the salaries um, to help retain our folks so they can go to court and be in Judge McLean's courtroom and try all those cases he's <laughs> got coming up. Do you have any questions? I just have one question for you, Chief. Okay. I appreciate the document. Do you have a total that you need so we can make sure our finance team total amount? Yeah, I wrote it down. It's I submitted it in my, you can have it. Okay. I mean, I can get it to you. Okay. I think it's like before benefits or before, um, maybe about 275 for those. Okay. So the three positions, three positions are about 275, including benefits. And then what I gave you is in addition to that. Yeah, these benefits. Okay. Any questions for commissions? Yeah, I mean, I was going to put that to have 275 hours. Um, to that point, think about this. This is important, and thank you, Chief of the Division. That's personal. So, she's got to support defend against five superior and state courts, five secondary accountability courts. That's 10 courts, not including these special counsel. They say magistrate, they say magistrate half the day. Do we know it? I'll, I'll compound that with a special benefit. That's 15 courts, perhaps, simultaneously at the same time. And, all right, so how big is your law firm compared to the DA? Like, I mean, how many? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Like, because again, if you're going pound for pound, and you got multiple courts to show up into, so I don't know if Madam DA is still here, but how many are DAs that she had? 50, last time I remember Fort was there, he had like, it was like 41, and you at that time had 17. I'm, I'm sure those numbers have changed. What are they? Yes, Commissioner Ross, we have 23 ADAs. Okay. 23 ADAs in total. I will also say, I'm sure Monica has more information on this, but there's the disparity in some of the representation numbers is that there are also private counsel that handles some of those cases, but the vast majority does go to the public defender's office. And I, I appreciate your point. There's a difference between the private um, defendants and the public. Still, this is if you don't have a 
you can't afford one, you'll be given one. I'm a big U.S. Constitution guy. So, we gotta provide it. And it, it, it's so down the, the food chain and how it's being supported. We listened to her statement, they just said, okay, we're not gonna give her no money, we'll give everybody else some money out of this park. Like, wow. And it, it, the system is stacked in such a way that the prosecution got it. You, it's whatever, like, that's how unfair. It's so unstruck, like, wow. It's systemic, it is what it is, the way this structure is. But it mean I have to uh, support it and agree with that. It says, okay, let me try to do a little equilibrium on this. We gotta rebalance this. Because again, you just let this go, but yeah, you're gonna burn them out. You got some high power judge saying, okay, y'all gotta have y'all acting, let's go, let's go, let's go. You got these solicitors, you got a, a DA, they come in now, she gotta sit there and defend against all that power. And yet you got people who like barely, so I get it, and so what you're asking for is not unreasonable. That's the thing, I'll join you, we'll put that on the tab and give her what she needs, because again, we need to talk, everybody should get a plate. Everybody's not equal in the sense, but there should be equitable in that. Okay, come on, we at least shore this up uh, and tighten this up, because again, listen to what she's saying. Um, and everybody has the right to be defended, uh, whether it's private or public, I can't afford one, so. That's all I have to say. I'm in. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chief. Okay, all right, next. Uh, early, do you all want to take a five minute break? Yes. Okay. Five minutes, um, just being stopped the clock. <laughs> You say five minutes. Okay. All right. Five. Mm -hmm. Defender's Office. We are separate from the Public Defender's Office. 
And so um, right now we have two attorneys and one part-time legal assistant uh, supporting both attorneys. Um, both attorneys do support both judges in our juvenile court, uh, Judge Harrison and Judge Nurse. We do provide representation of children in both delinquent and dependency matters. Dependency is our foster care cases and delinquent are our delinquent acts committed by youth. Um, our work does uh, extend beyond the courtroom. We are in the courtroom quite a bit, um, but we do extend beyond that. Um, our job comprises, us, uh, comprises of us visiting children in the community. Uh, we are in hospitals. We are in foster care placements. We are in uh, homes. We are in the school setting. Uh, we are everywhere children may be, uh, wherever we may find our clients. Uh, at the time we go into our detention centers, into jails, and also residential treatment centers. So our jobs don't end at five o'clock. Um, we are up every day. And so it, it doesn't matter what time of day, sometimes we have clients call us. And just to give you an idea uh, of what that looks like, uh, we've had clients to contact us who may have run away from home, a youth uh, contacted me, uh, had run away from home, it was nighttime, and they were in the middle of Fowler Field, no lights and waiting on an adult male to pick them up and they were uh, afraid and called me and, and this was on a friday evening called me to say uh, miss gordon please help me and so at that point uh, because i am a resident of douglas and it's easy to get to Fowler field i was able to leave and get to my client uh, and get her uh, to safety and so uh, we get lots of calls like that after hours parents call law enforcement is on the way to the home because the child has been, become aggressive and they want our help or the child is requesting attorney representation because the child is aware that law enforcement is coming to the home and so we are contacted for those reasons. Um, so it doesn't matter what time of day or night. I got a call just the other day early in the morning. Uh, foster care placement, a group home staff member called to say, hey, we have a school refusal issue. Can you please talk to your client? encourage that client to come to school. What it actually resulted in is my sitting uh, in a county uh, with that child um, and working through issues, legal issues included, uh, for an entire day. So we, we do these things, uh, and that's between two attorneys. Um, I will say what we are seeing uh, now in our court uh, are the trends for our office. Uh, children in need of services cases are on the rise. Of course, we started in 2020, and so that was the, the uh, early pandemic year. So our cases looked a little bit different then, but cases are on the rise. Um, our children in need of services, those are our truancy, runaway cases, ungovernable children. Those cases are on the rise in our office. Um, so are the simple battery and family violence at cases, as well as criminal damage to property cases. We do see a lot of those, amongst other things. Unfortunately, aggravated assault cases are on the rise as well among our youth. Um, our office does serve on uh, multidisciplinary teams, as you heard earlier, Judge Harrison, uh, and uh, our chance court. This is our mental health court that we are all very excited about as we do represent youth with significant mental health disorders. Many of our clients do uh, have those diagnoses, and they are able to, with um, being medium and high-risk youth, are able to get another opportunity um, that is a non-traditional opportunity um, to uh, have treatment and services in our court absent the probation side. So we are appreciative of the efforts of our juvenile court to give our children another chance in a non-traditional way. Um, we do lots of training in our office. Uh, we do attend accountability courts trainings. We attend youth uh, defense trainings, youth defense leadership trainings, and child welfare attorney trainings. Um, now, what you will find out about our office is that we are different from a lot of our, our counties. You've heard a lot about Folsom County. Well, I will tell you that Douglas County, which I am very proud of, is doing something different. Um, we have an in-house juvenile public defender's uh, uh, office. What that means is in other counties, the juvenile public defender only handles in juvenile court delinquent matters. Uh, and then the dependency cases are usually contracted through an office or there's a separate office, such as in Fulton County, the office of the child's attorney. Well, here you have both housed in one office. And this was something that Judge Peggy Walker wanted to do. Uh, and we see that unfolding and it is very successful. Um, we're able to support the court on both ends. And I think that's phenomenal because you also have two attorneys who are able to practice on both sides of the court. Um, 
Also with that, um, we um, are going to, as you heard Judge Harrison say, now bring in several other attorneys. These are our contract attorneys. Um, they handle dependency cases primarily. Some of them do handle delinquent matters, but we also have conflict attorneys so that when our office conflicts out, they can handle cases. Well, what my office will do now is house those attorneys, not physically, but their contracts and manage the cases and assign those cases to those attorneys. Um, that is going to increase the workload in our office. And so with that, we did have two requests that we wanted to make. Um, so far, our budget is fine. We just had the two requests. Um, the one being the contract attorneys coming off of the juvenile courts um, administration or out of their budget onto our budget. And then the second, increasing pay for um, everyone in my office. Our legal assistant will now have to become full-time. Uh, that is because she needs to be able to do case management and now billing when it comes to our um, contract attorneys. Um, also, I am asking for an increase for my assistant public defender um, because what I have noticed is whatever the highest paid contract attorney is in, in juvenile court, our in-house attorney needs to be paid more than that. She has a much higher caseload. She has a longer work schedule for this county. Uh, and so we're asking for her um, to be paid comparable to others um, in her situation in other counties. Uh, and she is also practicing on both sides of the court as well. We also cover whenever a conflict attorney, or excuse me, a contract attorney cannot handle a case because it is an emergency situation, our office handles those. Also, we have detention hearings where our contract attorneys cannot be here. They may be in another jurisdiction. They may be on vacation. We're covering those as well. And so we are doing uh, our jobs and, uh, and more uh, to support our juvenile court. Um, with that being said, I don't have a lot uh, to offer you except that we are busy. We stay busy every single day. Uh, we're either in the office or out of the office, but we're working all day long. We enjoy what we do. Our job is to make sure our children are not falling into the adult system. Unfortunately, lately we have seen every week one of the children that we may have represented on this adult calendar. It breaks our heart to see that. Um, but we are pushing for a chance court because I think if we can have services like our chance program and then early intervention like our stand program, we will see our children uh, do better and kind of get out of this um, uh, this current uh, trend that we're seeing. And so with that, any questions? Any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. The, the amount for the full-time legal assistance, so what would that add to, to that person's salary? Um, it would add, let me tell you. A total of fifteen thousand eight hundred seventy-two dollars. And you said you needed to pay increase for the attorney because the contract attorneys are outpacing the attorney. The assistant family. public defender, the assistant. yes. The highest paid contract attorney is outpacing um, the assistant public defender, juvenile public defender, excuse me. And the increase is a seven thousand um, dollar ask and then um, for my position because i will have to not only manage those contracts i will um, also have to kind of stand in with the attorneys if they cannot be there or try to find attorneys and, and get them here to court um, i am asking for that that's additional management um, responsibilities that i do not have and so i will be asking for a seven thousand dollar increase as well or if you review what other directors or leaders are making uh, in the leadership role. I don't have the title of chief, but I operate as that. It should be comparable to what other um, leaders are making in the county. So about $32,000 extra is your request? Yes, altogether. All right, good. thank you. Any other questions? Uh, any other questions for commissioners? Board of commissioners, uh, certainly I can commend our juvenile uh, public defender Gordon for being here today, but certainly I would like for us to take a look at her salary in comparison to others. She's very um, kind and generous, and she's not being, well, she, I can't say she's not being honest with the, with the market, but the market is not being honest with her. So if we could just take a peek at that, I ask as we go into our budget meetings and budget appropriation meetings, if we just take a look at her salary. It just is concerning. Okay, thank you. All right.
we have next coming before us board of commissioners we have Dennis Stenbridge our local court and I'll see the corner here so I don't see anybody from the corner's office either so it's just this is our last last presentation come on up come on down, down. There you go. My name is Annetta Daly Stingridge, and I'm the clerk of Superior Court here. Um, my voice may give out, and I can't really see today, so bear with me. Um, my background is I worked as a paralegal at Georgia Legal Services and worked as a teacher at Dutch County High School and I worked as a legal advocate at Danley's and Associates. Danley and Associates, <laughs> it's in my last name. Um, and when I ran for this position, I wanted to really know what it was about. So I researched and according to history, back in the day, when the founders created the position, they created it because they said that the judges were being corrupt and the clerks were created so that, you know, they would have to file the documents with the, with the clerk rather than you know, if their friends came along, they may go back and change the document. Or, you know, with the jury system, do some different things. So, and of course, you know, we don't have that in Dallas County. We, think we got some good judges. We know they wouldn't do that. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you're worried for that. <laughs> you know what? But um, that is why the, uh, the clerk's position was created. In fact, back in the day, when they started the clerk, um, they were all ministers. And the word clerk comes from clergy. So, <clears throat> I do have a degree in Christian ministries. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say that to say because it keeps coming up about calendar clerks versus judicial case managers. And we, the calendar clerks, according to the statute, have to stay with the clerk's office. The calendar clerks and the jury system. And again, that goes back because of back in the day, sometimes they would bribe the jury. So, and again, we don't have that. <laughs> um, so any judge can create, have a case manager, but the uh, calendar clerk stays with us and we do have the control of them. I know that's what aggravates them, <laughs> that you know, they don't have control over their schedule. Um, but it's been a journey. I've enjoyed the journey. And my intent in the position was always to empower my staff. And that's what I've tried to do. Last year when we gave them, they got a total of 15% across the board increase. And it helped a lot because the it helped the atmosphere in the office as well as excuse me. Now we can hire quality people. And I mean, even though it's not that much, you know, most of the people that apply for the jobs are women. And we used to make it a little less. So some of them come in with that salary and they are happy. And we've been able to get a full staff. We're running out of room. Um, but we have a pretty good staff right now, and they're doing 
fairly well. And if you have any problems, please let me know, and we'll try to fix it. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm asking is for a 3% increase. And I want, I'm asking it, again, because I want to empower my staff and I want to keep them happy. But also, I was thinking, we did, 4,413 passports last year. We don't do pictures. And most places cost around $15. So what I'm thinking, now I don't know if it works this way, but if we get pictures, that would bring in close to $70,000. And we need $70,000 for a 3% increase. <laughs> so, and I don't know what it works that way, but that's what I was thinking. Um, <clears throat> my voice is about to go, so I'm going to bring in um, my right hand, Janissa Miller. She's our operational director, and she's awesome. And she knows everything. She's been here about 40 years. <laughs> Since 19, well, 1920. <laughs> I am Janissa Miller. I have been here. I just celebrated 21 years with County. Right. Uh, my mama grew up here in Douglas County, and from her bedroom window, she watched the old courthouse burn in 1956. So she's thrilled that I work in the courthouse. This is the best thing ever. She heard this was being recorded, so hey, Mom. <laughs> I promise I would do that. Um, she would love to see you here today. You here today. She, she watches all of the commissioners' meetings. She watches all of the things that she can online and says she grew up in Douglas County. I grew up in Douglas County, and has she has taught me that love for Douglas County. So everything I do, everything we do, is for the citizens of Douglas County. And one thing I always tell all the people that work for me is every piece of paper we handle is not just a piece of paper; it's a life behind every single piece of paper we handle, um, it's important. It's a lot. If we put something in wrong, someone could get arrested. Or if we don't put something in wrong, someone stays in jail overnight and they shouldn't. So everything we do is very important. So one of the things we're asking for is um, that our training budget be bumped up. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing things correctly. We want to get um, time with people who know more than we do. I think there are a few people who know more than we do. Okay, everybody. Um, but our numbers are Monica's numbers. Our numbers are Judge McLean's numbers. Our numbers are Ms. Racine's numbers. We support the clerk. We, the clerk support the judges, the public defenders, the sheriff's office, magistrate court. It all flows. We all work together. So all those numbers that you're hearing about, how backlogged we are, we all are. Um, and so just a little couple of numbers for you. Um, I said every document is a life. We enter about 7,000 of those per day between both offices. 7,000 documents a day. Um, every dollar that we take in is not ours. Every penny we take in gets paid back out to another government agency, to the county, to all the different funds. Um, we average $20,000 a day and we balance the penny every day. Think about that. That's a lot of money. And it's not ours. We know it's not ours. We don't get to keep it. I didn't, none of it, none of it. Can't keep any of it, right? She told me I couldn't keep any of it. Um, another um, bump that we're asking for is in postage. The stamp went up two cents. Not a big deal, but we mail out about 500 notices a day. So that two cents adds up. So um, jury is another area where we've asked for an increase. Obviously, courts are gonna be ramping back up and we're gonna be calling in all the jurors. So. We expect um, to have more jurors this year than we have, obviously, in previous years. Um, we la I looked, I found my notes today, and last year's backlog for state court alone, sorry, state court's my baby, I love you, Judge McClain, but state court's my baby. Uh, last year's backlog was 2,534 cases waiting for a jury trial. This year, we're at 1,398. That means we've gone down 1,100 cases. We've gotten through cleared out 1100 cases while still dealing with the current caseload that we have. 
So um, the courts are moving. Sometimes it feels like the gears, gears are moving very slowly. But they are moving, and it takes every person working together. And the judges, the calendar clerks, the public defender's office, everybody, the DAs, the solicitors, we all work well together. We have to because it keeps everything flowing, keeps everything moving. Um, I just wanted to say to, Judge, to uh, Commissioner Robinson, I almost called you Judge Robinson, a little bump for you. Um, you talked a lot about autonomy and how um, the clerk's offices, well, all the offices should take their budget and take control of it, and that's what we've done this year. And so a lot of the changes that you'll see, um, we had in the past things on the wrong line item. So we had a lot of stuff in other professional services. Well, it turns out it was really supposed to go in training or supposed to go in travel or supposed to go. So we were moving a lot of money around, which is fine. We're allowed to do that. But what we've done with this year's budget is clean that up and put things where they're supposed to go. So we won't have to move as much around and harass Miss Miller over there. We like her. Um, no relation, but great okay. name. Um, so that's the main thing you'll see is this line item is up, this line item is down. Everything kind of balances itself out. We are asking for an additional position in state court, which would be an accounting position, and that will pay for itself in um, the cash bond money that's able to be forfeited. I've talked about that before. Um, we haven't had time to touch it this year. Um, so that hundred thousand dollars that I had identified through last year is still sitting out there. And there's probably another at least that much more that can be forfeited legally directly to the county. I just have to have somebody who can do that. <laughs> so I can't do it all and all the other things. Um, but we appreciate y'all. You guys have always supported the, the clerk's office, and um, I thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for me, or Nada has more things to say? Madam Clerk. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Any? I just want to say, uh, when I said that, um, I didn't say actually what I want to say in the end, but the, we work as a unit, and we don't have that division that was created at the beginning. Our staff worked with the judges, and I want to especially thank Judge McClain, because if we were divided, I couldn't call him and ask him the questions that I do. And I appreciate that he always has a quick answer. He always gets back to me very quickly. Same so time. We appreciate him, and I definitely appreciate y'all commissioners. Thank y'all so much. Okay. Any, questions? Any questions for commissioners? No questions. You don't answer all the questions. Oh, I gotta ask for Commissioner Biden has a question. Okay. okay, you're saying you've got 15% last year increase? Yes. Because we didn't give the 5%. No, she took. We gave 10%. And they got 10% over the 5%. And you're asking for 3% this year over the 5%? Okay. I want to clarify that. Well, because we can't keep. People. Yeah, that's what everybody says. Yeah, we've been good this year. You are happy to smile. You want to keep it down. All right. Vice Chair Brown. Yeah, I mean, again, we get pitted against each other. We get each other's staff. Uh, I get it. It's, it's how, do you, how do you balance this? And again, you've got $15 of me, and uh, you've got $10. And I, I appreciate everybody's comments here. And it's, it's, it's challenging. It's very complicated, very dynamic. You guys all need what you need. And here we are sitting here with personal to the point. We got one dollar. And this is it's, it's tough. I don't know. Last time I heard, we got to cut 20 million. Y'all that far over. Uh-huh. So that, that's why I, I, I meet with you to figure out okay, what my prayer is going to be because everybody ain't going to get a musical chair. This is serious, y'all. These are great. We only got a dollar. And so that's why we, we got to keep it honest and keep it real based on what's already in play. 
and obviously we have to balance that with the, with the citizens. So this, this FYI, I appreciate the ask, since we're all being honest uh, and being forthright in, our, in this exchange, like, look, right, we have to work through it. So I mean, so everything, manager has to present a balanced budget to the public, and specifically the board, a balanced budget. The board wants to, you know, sponsor whatever they want to at the very end and shave off that one penny, as we always argue about, 1%. That's where we are, guys. That's what we're so we'll see how this plays out here. So I just want to be honest and set expectations. We'll see how it goes. Madam Chair, you know, thank oh, you. A balanced budget. I hear that. We're working very hard to get there. Uh, any other comments from any of our participants this evening? Is the corner here yet? Oh, there you are. Okay, come on up. And certainly, um, you're here to represent the corner. That's what I was asking earlier. I see the representation. So you just walk in. All right. We have the floor. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. My name is Rufus Hunley. I'm one of the deputy coroners um, under the uh, coroner's office uh, with Coroner Renee Godwin. She could not be here today. She's actually in training, um, but asked me to, um, to be here in her stead. And I've got a PowerPoint. I'm actually waiting for it to come up, but. I'll go ahead and get talking. I know you all have been here all day. Um, but one, one thing I wanted to make sure that I talked about is um, the coroner's office is responsible for death investigations. Not only is that important in the criminal justice arena, it's also important um, in the vital statistics arena. Um, what we do is we make the best determination in many cases of what a decedent has died of. And that, goes with, that requires education. That requires um, our investigators to Constantly, um, constantly obtain different forms of education in the field of death, um, which can be cumbersome. Yeah. Still working. I'll keep on moving now. All right. Corner Godwin has come up with five purpose areas that she wants to concentrate on this year. Uh, the first one is the consumer-focused objectives. And I'll go reach one of these. She also wants to attract and retain quality personnel. Accreditation, I know she's talked about that for a few years. That goes hand in hand, in hand with the county's infrastructure. Uh, better coordination with our other partners, criminal justice partners, state partners. And also, we have talked about an enhanced facility um, that is open to the public um, to where people can actually see their loved ones um, that may have been um, unusually receive a timely debt. All right, the biggest thing I talked about first, the first purpose area. Let's talk about optics. When someone deceases, optics is most important in the coroner's office. Because when people see the loved one being taken away, and previously they had an old van, that optics was not going very well for the coroner's office. We received a lot of complaints that they took my, they took my loved one, placed them in a bag, threw them in the back of a van. That didn't provide them the dignity I felt that they deserved. Um, so that's, again, why, again, she wants to focus really on optics, customer service. Um, our facility right now is not conducive for customer service, as well as uh, just making sure that our optics are always there. Um, how we present their loved ones, especially when we're taking them out of the home. And she thought it would be important for me as one of the uh, frontline employees to come present today, because I can attest that many times that we go into what, some of these narrow homes, our citizens are not getting smaller, unfortunately. It requires a lot of effort to, res to remove a 300-pound person um, from one of these rooms um, with pretty, pretty old equipment in many cases. Um, we, we receive the blessing of new vehicles. Um, so when we pull up, you know, we, we have taken care of that piece of the optics. Um, so at least they're, they're, they're being placed into a vehicle that's not unworthy of digging. However, the gurneys and other equipment, we still have to work on. And also the presentation of even our corners. We want to make sure that they can have a reasonable conversation with the decedent. Because the decedent has a lot of questions at the time of uh, it's something especially if it's unexpected. All right. So of course we feel that the county has an important role in making sure options is there. Human assets, we talked about our deputy corners. Retention, retention, retention is a problem. Um, we are the only part-time office, but we're only compensated on each call. Um, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. <coughs> All right. Uh, if I recall, because last year the uh, Board of Commissioners made a commitment that they would pay out $15 per hour 
um, minimum for every part-time employee. This is the only department that is not paid <laughs> by the hour. <laughs> All right, next one. All right, corners are on 24 hours a day. Right now, if, if I'm sorry, give me away, excuse me. If we were paid at 24 hours, that'd be $360. She's just asking if, if the coroner receives no call that day to at least receive a stipend of $200. And that allows them to be on call for that 24 hours. Um, and also very responsive to the other public safety personnel that are out there in the field. Because many times there's a detective, um, there are other officers that have to remain there until a coroner responds. But it's hard to tell someone to stay in county at the office for 24 hours without being compensated. So generally, if they live in other jurisdictions, they've got to make it from wherever that, you know, uh, that where their home is to that, to that scene, thereby um, causing the, all those personnel, especially the highway accident, they have, to retain on that, they have to remain on that highway until that body is removed until the corner arrives. So that's a very important um, factor. And the county continues to grow, continues to grow. So exponentially, the more people we have, the more deaths we have. All right, next slide. Accreditation. Accreditation goes hand in hand with everything I've talked about so far. We have to have the proper personnel. We have to have the proper facilities. Um, just about everything that we do is, when it comes to accreditation is pretty much a minimum standard just to make sure that we can achieve all those purpose goals I mentioned earlier. Next slide. Better coordination with partners. Our goal is not to be successful because we have a debt. It's also great to provide these numbers in partnership with some of our other divisions. Um, so what I mean by that is when we talk about death, what causes death? What age frame are we talking about with death? That's the next line, please. If you look at the graph here, you'll see that we are, this pretty much was from the census, and you'll see that we have people pretty much pretty even in every age bracket. But where the difference is, next slide, we have more deaths in the 60 range, especially among men. All right, so that's an important factor because when we look at the cause of death for many of them, it's heart disease. Um, heart disease continues to, re to remain a factor in our, our mortality rates here in uh, Douglas County. Next slide. As you can look, uh, from in all of 2021, we had 421 deaths. As of yesterday, we had 421 deaths. That was at 9 a.m., and I think there are three cases that came in after I had completed the slide. So as you can see, that number's not getting smaller. So I know we were talking about that dollar dimension, um, but this, that is a concern for us as well, in, of being able to keep up with the growth of the county. Next slide. This talks about the facility um, that also is important for accreditation. The facility is important because, again, if someone had an accident on the highway, Right now, we have a shed with a cooler inside that we have to present, we have to pull out and present the body to the family. And that's just not a good way of doing that um, for, for a county this size now. Um, so we definitely need someone where someone can come in and see their loved one. And not in all cases do, do they wait to the funeral home. Sometimes they want to see them immediately. And you know we can't do it in all cases depending on the circumstances. If it was a criminal act, then they definitely can't see them until they return from the medical examiner's office. However, there are many times that families have driven in from other states to come see their loved one. And it's, it's terrible to tell them you have to wait until you can make your funeral arrangements. Um, so it's, it wouldn't be inappropriate to, for, to have a facility where they can actually view the loved one um, prior to being carried off into, to another facility. And the same thing, we, you know, we want a building with a glass um, in some cases. Um, the coroner also is responsible for uh, a state mandate if someone deceases, especially if their organs can be harvested. Um, we have to provide them a facility where those organs can be, be harvested. And that means if, um, if someone is, was an organ donor, that we have a facility where the, the doctor surgeon can come in and, provide, and perform those services. And sometimes this is a, a timely matter um, where we can't get back into a hospital, organize a surgical room, because again, the case may have happened on the highway and the person didn't go to the hospital. Next slide, please. So that was pretty much, the, she gave me kind of a summation of what she's looking for. Um, she's got 75,000, uh, which was her current part-time staff. 
Um, she's got the deputy coordinator salaries, other professional service, uh, such as shredding, cleaning, all those things, um, normal maintenance. So all in all, she's looking for about $456,000. She said that's pretty much in accordance with what she asked for last year. And I think it may have been cut for um, whatever, whatever the purposes. However, she would like to see that um, number restored just so we can make the enhancements to the office um, that would be appropriate for a county our size. I think the next slide is a question. All right. Yes, ma'am. I just talked to the donor organization. Yes, ma'am. They said all organs removed have to be done in a sterile place and it's done in the hospital. They're not done in the coroner's office. That's actually not always the case. Except for the eyes. A absolutely. Absolutely. Except for the eyes. Absolutely. But organs have to be in there. Yes, How many deputies do y'all have? Um, at present, we have, the, and no one's full time, so we have, I uh, think there are 11 that are on her roll. Um, however, we only have about six that are regularly active. The other ones are basically filling because it is a part time role. It is hard to set a, a firm schedule. Um, so we have to make sure we can always insert and someone's always on the call for 24 hours. And uh, where do you live? Where, are you I'm right there at the Cobb Douglas line, right there at uh, Thornton okay. Road. But how close are most? Um, there's some that live in Decatur, but they sleep here. They, they will take bed up at the uh, facility that we have uh, over there, Club Drive. But you have the rotation of who's on call. Yes, ma'am. Because, of course, 24 hours would be a lot to ask someone to do competitive be every day, unless you look close. But you, do you sleep in the office? You were saying that you had to get in the office or something. Yes, ma'am. At, at times, they may have to sleep on the couch. So we don't have a facility that's uh, conducive for someone sleeping every night. So there's some, again, there's some of us that live in county or right, right here at the line. Well, um, one thing that we receive complaints about is the deputy having to stay there for so long and it takes two or three, four hours before a coroner gets there. Now, I am not, I'm not actually, I don't know those numbers to be true because actually I'm auditing all files now. But these, these are pretty... <laughs> Sure. Well, well, sometimes it depends on when the call was made to us um, because 911 have to call us first and there's always a time step of when that time is made and um, you know and usually the coroner will receive a call also if it's not timely and I would come uh, come back to, to the same. But you do know that we're going to be building a new facility yes, and a lot of the things that you've asked for are going to be incorporated in that. And, so and, and that is the hope, yes ma'am. Okay. She did make me aware of course they said they were shutting down that facility we're in. Well, we sold it. <laughs> 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 we'll have to move. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And that's why we hope um, that even the presentation today kind of give you more insight of exactly why we need those type of facilities, especially with the county's growth. But the salaries are set by state law. Actually, that's the standard. So the many, uh, many corners office um, actually have other uh, pay systems. And I can speak us, uh, specifically because I work in multiple jurisdictions. You got six deputies. Well, you wouldn't necessarily have the coverage at that point because, again, the calls aren't guaranteed. Um, death is not guaranteed, so you can't uh, predict that someone's going to make a certain salary within a, within a week's time or a month's time. And the 421 deaths, those are the ones you investigated? That is correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Question, Robson, you have the floor. I got a few. I got a few. Um, Commissioner Carpenter, not here. All right, so real quick, but I, I do appreciate this, this conversation. Um, I'm going to be consistent in my fourth right and it seems okay. So you got the sheriff who gets support for arresting um, um, people to get injured and lose their lives. It is a supply chain. It is. We are all related. Um, I've been in the Amlands uh, when I twisted my, tore my MCL at um, um, Sweetwater State Park. And to be in that ambulance at that time, I said, oh, this is, this is, oh, this is, oh, absolutely not. And so while I hear him saying that, okay, yeah, we've upgraded the transport, wait a minute, but the garden? Some things you need basic utensils, basic tools that is not debatable. Like, like a copier. Like, I don't even talk, why why some electrons gotta come talk to you about a copier? I, I don't, I mean, that's, that's, I, I can't, it's not, I can't think about it, but certain things that, okay, give them what they need to do, the basic <coughs> um, And I think some of that stuff should be, I mean, I'm just emphasizing that some of our decisions should not be about basic services, basic stuff they need to do their jobs like you. Teachers like, you know, you need utensils. 
I mean, you know, it's almost like, okay, guys, you know, it's like the parents have to get provide for teachers. Like, well, we, we, it's not school system. There's basic stuff that y'all really need to deliver services and stuff. So, um, as relates to the Gary now, as far as the pay is concerned, do we know? But listen, they're living on couches, but look, look, look we, we spot everybody else. Tahoes and the sheriff, all the, I mean, the deputies and the firemen. I'm like, look at, look at the lifestyle, very, very inconsistent. But they're all part of the And the narrative, they're like, uh uh, we, we got to treat people with dignity. That, that's important when you roll up, right? That, that's important. But we got a Taj Mahal, and I'm going to let it go. And we'll show you that we got, look at the puppies. Look at this. We spent $5 million on that, but we complain about $3 million for a quarter million. And so I'm glad you're advocating for your budget, because it doesn't mean that we, the board will actually be in a position to do this. You got you to advocate for your current budget as is, versus um, I'm glad y'all didn't compromise and say, well, we're going to go get this building that you can put this for. Very wise of you. I'd like to say, we'll carry you on. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, thank you for your presentation. Very good. And sunrise and sunset. We'll take care of our citizens here in Douglas County. So we really appreciate you coming in this morning. Thank you. Good evening. I'm sorry. Anything else from the board? Any questions or any applicants, judges, executive team? Any questions? Madam Chair, when, all right, so can y'all read the Madam CFO for the record, because we'll record this. What's next? When will you guys come before the full board, um, and when will we decide this year on the budget? What's the schedule? Uh, Uh, sure, yes. Um, so according to the budget calendar, the proposed 2023 budget is presented to the Board of Commissioners at the budget retreat to be held on November 2nd and November 3rd. And the public hearing to review the budget um, is November 29th. And we have December 13th as the date to adopt the 2023 budget. December 13th? Yes, sir. <laughs> We got three meetings in November. That didn't add up right, but okay, I got you. So we're making our decision on the Lisa. Can you confirm that calendar? I thought we thought we we weren't gonna have such a late meeting to make a decision in December. Y'all make sure y'all line that calendar up. So it'll, 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 the point to everybody else is that it will be accelerated. We'll get at it. Um, so all right, Madam Chair, that was all I wanted to see it. December thirteenth is the second Tuesday. We have a special call meeting. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, Please publish no, that. Oh, she's not the election. Could you have a Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. 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 Thank you